Kitty. Symbols of Love Series Book 4 Written by Leah Connolly and published by Starfall Publications Available on our website and on Amazon Chapter 1 The house that the Cluettes had occupied while in London had always enjoyed a reputation for a kind of dignified stoicism. The Cluettes were an old family, one of the oldest in the land, and this had given them a sort of calm perspective whenever a calamity unfolded before them. They had endured before, they would continue to endure now. Family legend even had it that an ancestress during the Great London Fire had calmly and coolly stood in the doorway of her home as it burned down about her, her husband away fighting for the newly restored king, a switch in her hand to deter would-be looters. There was naught of this trademark composure to be seen on this particular November day. The house was undoubtedly and unreservedly in what could only be described as an uproar. It had started with the arrival of the Morning Post, a letter from the Viscount Cluet written in a shaking hand setting off alarm throughout the household. He was either very ill or the victim of highway robbery, or perhaps both. The maids whispered with wide, excited eyes about the possibility of pirates. This was the first that Seth Cluett heard of it, snatches of whispers from housemaids and footmen who immediately stopped speaking when he entered the room. It was easy for those that did not know him well to assume that Seth was slow or dull-witted. The reality was that he did not particularly enjoy speaking, but he had a quick mind that absorbed all that he saw. There were a multitude of little things that tipped him off, that things were not well, from the whispers to the way that the servants would not meet his eye. He had just sat down to breakfast when a cry of distress went up from the upper floors of the house. Without a thought, Seth was up like a shot, for it could only have been Lady Cluette that had shown such distress. He took the stairs two at a time easily with his long legs, arriving just outside his mother's door. He could hear her speaking within, issuing orders in distressed tones to her lady's maid, O'Toole. Seth had just lifted his hand to knock on the door when the maid in question opened the door, squealing and leaping backward at the surprise of seeing him. Did not mean to startle, he apologised, looking past her to his mother, who was sitting at her dressing table. Her hair was still half in curling papers, a banyan haphazardly wrapped about her. In one hand, she held a letter, small and looking well-travelled. Her other hand was about the base of her neck, her expression one of intense worry. Seeing Lady Cluett in anything less than immaculate form was enough to cause Seth's own mouth to go dry. Mother? Seth asked, brushing past the maid. What is it? What's happened? Lady Cluett's throat worked for a moment before she answered. It's your father, she answered, her voice strained. It seems that some calamity has befallen him, but I cannot read his writing, she said, lifting the letter and squinting. You know what his hand is like at the best of times, and now I fear... Look, the letter has become so smudged, I have been trying for an hour to read it, and all I can see is the word attack. Lady Cluett stopped, lifting the letter to the light and attempting to read more of the words. Even from his position near the door, Seth could see that what she said was true. The letter was clearly blotched, the ink running down the page. Here, Lady Cluett said, waving the letter in Seth's direction. See if you can't get further than I can with your young eyes. Wordlessly, Seth stepped forward and gently took the letter from his mother, afraid that he might accidentally tear it. The paper was badly warped and buckling, as if it had been thoroughly soaked, he turned toward the window, tilting the letter to try and catch what words he could. Lady Cluett was right. The Viscount had always had abysmal handwriting, and it seemed that some unseen distress was causing his hand to shake. My dear Veronica, Seth began reading slowly and carefully. I am in dine, dire straits, and find that I have. The next line is entirely illegible. With favourable winds but not before collecting what is owed. Brought a fever, apron, 
No, upon me. Seth stopped reading, his eyes narrowing. Well, Lady Cluett prompted, turned sideways in the chair before her dressing table. Her right hand gripped the back of the chair fiercely, her knuckles turning white. Don't leave me in agonies of suspense. I'm sorry, Mother, it is not intentionally done. His hand becomes worse from this point, and with the blots and smudges... Seth trailed off, tilting the letter toward the light again. Wait, he said, bringing it closer to his face. I can see more. I have little expectation of laying my living eyes on my home again if relief is not found soon. Seth stopped reading, not really hearing the words as he spoke them. He looked up sharply, staring at his mother. You don't think... Should we go to him? Where even is he? Lady Cluett turned away, speaking crisply. Egypt, though whether he is really there is anyone's guess. You don't know for certain? Seth asked, putting his back to the window. I never know for certain, Lady Cluett said, applying a cream of some description to her neck with vigorous motions, barely concealed anger simmering just below her carefully controlled facade. What was he even doing in Egypt, Seth asked, the letter in his hand growing heavier by the minute. Lady Cluett made a face of disdain at herself in the mirror for just a moment. What he always does, I would imagine, investing our fortune in some fool scheme or another, contriving how to drag more pieces of rocks and statues home. Seth said nothing, but pressed his mouth into a tight line. It was no secret that his parents' marriage had not been a love match, but one of strategic alliance. He knew realistically that this was the pragmatic choice that many made. Love was frequently seen as an impediment to a successful marriage, at least at first. It was assumed that fondness would bloom from time and familiarity, but this had not been so for the Cluettes. It was not really anyone's fault, Seth supposed. They were simply two very different people with little enough in common. The Viscount Cluette was an adventurer by nature, rarely content to sit still. He was one of the most widely travelled men in England, seemingly only home long enough to pack his trunk and be off again. The Viscountess, by contrast, firmly held that her place and duties were at home and should be the highest priority. It did not help that Lady Veronica had brought a sugar plantation of considerable wealth to the marriage in the Caribbean as her as a dowry. To her great consternation, the Viscount had sold its sight unseen, reasoning that the scandal and strife surrounding the sugar's industry would only be a taint on the family name. Lady Veronica felt that she had been slighted in some manner, particularly when the fortune that the sale brought in was used to fund the Viscount's capers across the sea. This slight turned into a gulf that only widened between them as the years passed by. Much like his mother, Seth had never shared his father's predilection for travel. He much preferred spending his time at his family's estate, with the occasional sojourn to London. In truth, Seth was happiest when he was left to his own devices, able to tinker with the tenant's farm machinery, or the large clock in the hall. The estate manager had once taken Seth as a boy to see the mill in action, which had been an almost religious experience for him. His tutors may have despaired at his ability to recite Ovid or Plato, but Seth never faltered when it came to working with his hands. I suppose we shan't know more until the afternoon post, Lady Cluett said, breaking into Seth's reflecting. Seth watched her for a few moments, her movements still agitated, her face lined. She caught him looking at her in the mirror, and she waved him off. Don't linger, Seth. My earlier outburst was only due to... I am fine now. Go and find some useful occupation. Seth said nothing, merely continuing to stare at his mother. He could tell that she was irritated, angry even, but this was a cover for another emotion. It seeped through the cracks of her annoyance when she wasn't aware that anyone was watching her. Fear and perhaps even a twinge of sadness. Her eyes met Seth's again, and she made a shooing motion at him. Sighing, Seth made his way back downstairs. His breakfast was long forgotten, gone cold by now. He made his way down through the hall to the library, stopping to stare up at one of the portraits on the wall. It was his grandfather, larger than life, 
astride a grey stallion with rolling eyes that pawed the ground. His grandfather stared out confidently, one hand on the reins, another pointing far in the distance to a battlefield foggy with distance. He had led troops for Queen Anne as a young man before he was married. Like other cluets of old, he was bold and brilliant, a man of deeds. Seth couldn't help but feel his wide shoulders slump a little. His father, his grandfather, all the men of Clan Cluet going back to the time of the Conqueror had been men of decisive action. By comparison, Seth was contemplative, cautious even. He had no lust for battle, no urge to plant a flag in some wild and unknown land. His ancestors stared down at him from the walls, and to Seth it seemed they judged him and found him wanting. Where do I fit in among these giants, he thought sadly. Who would ever see me in their company? I am invisible compared to them. Well, that wasn't entirely true. There was one person that saw him, truly and without guile. Chapter 2 Miss Kitty Johnson's position in society could never be described as spectacular. Her father was a merchant, and no matter his successes, this association would forever taint their family. Society was willing to overlook most in the face of piles of money, but it was generally acknowledged that the Johnson family should not attempt to reach too high. Despite her innate position, Kitty had always enjoyed the association of those with rank and title in the town. This was due partly to her good nature, having a reputation for both wit and kindness in equal turns. Those lucky enough to be numbered among her friends found her to be a most loyal companion. It was also true that she received more than her fair share of invitations because she was, in a word, adorable. Her face was a picture of angelic mirth with a little nose and round green eyes. Kitty had always known that she possessed these good qualities and had assumed that she was also in possession of a generous dowry. She had no reason to suspect otherwise. There was not a shred of arrogance within her. It was merely the way of her world. When she had first laid eyes on Seth Cluet, son and heir to Viscount Cluet, she had known that he was the one for her in much the same way. Like herself, he was inclined to good humour, though he spoke little. He was tall and broad of shoulder, a veritable mountain of a man that Kitty was quite pleased to shelter in the shadow of. She was generally the sort of young woman that appreciated the aesthetic of a strapping male specimen, and Mr. Cluet was certainly that. The fact that he was as kind and quietly amusing as he was handsome was enough to send butterflies from the top of Kitty's head to the tips of her toes. Much as Kitty had always understood her own position and better qualities, she had simply understood that she and Mr. Cluett were for one another. Never mind that he had originally been in a rather questionable entanglement with her very dearest friend, Lady Eva Galpin recently married and on her own wedding tour. There was no reason for Kitty to suspect that her own engagement would be announced in short order, particularly as Mr. Cluet had been inclined to find excuses to accompany her about London. A few weeks passed after the ordeal with Eva with no proposal forthcoming, which did not bother Kitty. It was only right and proper, after all, to allow the dust to settle from that whole affair which London was still buzzing about like a colony of bees. These weeks were spent in the throes and thrills of a spring romance, new and budding. Walks in the park, walks to the lending library, laughter and shy looks were their lot. Weeks turned into months, spring melting agreeably into summer's arms. Now, Seth and Kitty enjoyed a friendly familiarity, they knew that they would dance at least twice with each other, possibly more if their mothers were suitably distracted. Flushed cheeks, shared ices in Vauxhall Gardens, impulsive gifts of flowers that Kitty dutifully pressed between the pages of thick books, a warm summer dream that she never wanted to end. Their attachment was patent to all who saw them, 
and the ton generally agreed that a match was well underway. In fact, by the time the leaves were beginning to show the first kisses of autumn colour, hostesses had taken to inviting the pair of them as a matter of course. The more sentimental of the ton hostesses enjoyed the romantic air that they added to any ball or dinner, sighing and reminiscing about their own youth. The more pragmatic of the ton invited them because they were an ornamental addition to any party, inclined to keep conversation light and moving along nicely. Kitty's own mother had begun to discreetly make preparations for the presumed nuptials, adding household linens and lengths of lace to a cedar chest. Mr Johnson had taken to locking himself into his study for long hours. Whenever the idea of an impending wedding was broached, he said nothing but would frown with ever-deepening creases on his forehead. Kitty, in her bliss, paid his worried expression no mind. With all of this in mind, it was inconceivable on a November morning that there was no letter in the afternoon post for Kitty, and she made her opinion known on the subject to an unflappable footman. There can't be nothing, Kitty insisted, her little nose wrinkling a little in consternation. I saw you pull several letters out from the pouch not ten minutes ago. Yes, miss, but those were intended for Mr Johnson, the footman explained, his tone intractable. Kitty lifted her hand, then lowered it, resisting the urge to bite anxiously on her nails, something her mother detested. Are you quite sure there was nothing for me? She asked again, hope causing her voice to lift. Perhaps a letter was caught on the pouch, stuck on the flap, or... No, miss, the footman said. Though he generally had the mannerisms of a wooden post, there was a note of contrition in his words and expression. Kitty sighed, her shoulders slumped a little. Feeling a little dejected, she mooched her way sullenly into the sitting room where her mother was busy at work with her embroidery hoop. Mrs Johnson was clearly the mould from which Kitty sprung, sharing the same green-brown eyes and pert nose. However, whereas Kitty's hair was a voluminous mass of black curls, Mrs Johnson's was a rich auburn. Mrs Johnson did not even look up, as Kitty, with a touch of melodrama, threw herself dramatically onto a chaise lounge. Feeling as if her troubles were not being given enough due attention, Kitty added in a wistful sigh. Kitty, dear heart, Mrs Johnson said blithely, never looking up from her needlework. Your dramatics are noted, but somewhat underscored by the fact that you are still in your morning dress. Kitty glanced down at herself, then lolled her head backward a little. I didn't see much point in getting dressed, she said, gesturing to the wrapper of indigo paisley and diaphanous dress beneath. I've nowhere to go today. Is Ava still not returned from her tour? Mrs Johnson asked as her needle continued to make perfectly choreographed passes. No, Kitty grumped, her characteristic good humour failing her. She was pleased that her very dearest friend in the entire world had managed to wed on her own terms. Really, she was, but she was missing Eva terribly. There was no one else that she could confide in, and the postal service on the continent wasn't exactly reliable at this moment. She and Mr Gulping decided to extend their stay in Italy for another month, leaving me quite alone in London. La, Mrs Johnson chided Kitty, that is not so, not for a girl with as many charms as you. What about Lady Chester? I thought you were becoming fast friends as well. Departed for Bath two weeks ago, Kitty sighed. All of London has emptied, leaving just us. She turned to give a pitiful look at her mother. Why haven't we gone? Usually the house is quite shut up by now. Mrs Johnson's rhythmic stitching hesitated for a moment, her hands pausing. We've decided it is more prudent to remain in London this year, she said, her voice a little tight. She resumed her stitching with renewed vigour, stabbing at the taut fabric in the hoop. Beside which, if we were to leave, you might not see Mr. Cluett again for some time. Kitty's face darkened. So, not much change then, she grumped. At least if we were in Bath, I might be ignored in the vicinity of other amusements. Kitty, I do not think he is ignoring you, Mrs. Johnson sighed. 
What do you call it when you have not had a letter, not a sign, for upwards of two weeks now? Kitty demanded, leaning forward a little. I call that being ignored. Perhaps he is simply preoccupied, Mrs Johnson suggested. He is a young man of good expectations. It stands to reason he would have responsibilities. I suppose, Kitty allowed. It is very unlike him, though. Well, I doubt that you shall get any answers as to why sulking around the house, Mrs Johnson said, glancing at Kitty. It is quite unlike you and not altogether appealing. What would you do then? Kitty asked, not expecting an answer. I've not even been properly introduced to his mother, so it's not as if I can pay a call on her. I think you should take a trip to Newton's, Mrs Johnson replied easily. You could do it with a walk. Newton's? Kitty repeated, sitting up, her nose wrinkling a little again. Why on earth would I go there? If I wished to visit a lending library, I'd rather go to Brown's or anywhere else. Newton's only has the most ghastly travel diaries and pamphlets on farming. Yes, but Newton's is a much better walk, Mrs Johnson insisted. How do you figure that? It's all the way on the other side of the park, near... Oh, oh, I see, Kitty said, clasping her hands together. I believe Newton's is in very close proximity to the Cluett's townhouse, no? Mrs Johnson said nothing, but gave Kitty a significant look. Why, mother, are you suggesting that I loiter about on the sidewalk in the hopes that I might meet Mr. Cluett? I'm suggesting you take a leisurely stroll with your maid, as is good and proper. Whomever you might meet on the way is entirely your own affair, Mrs. Johnson replied coolly. Despite her determination to make her misery known, Kitty's better nature quickly won out and her face broke into a gleeful smile. With bouncing energy, she leapt to her feet, already mentally ransacking her wardrobe for the perfect ensemble. She was nearly out into the hall when she abruptly stopped, whirled around and scurried back into the sitting room to press a quick kiss to her mother's cheek. In the next moment, she was out in the hall, yelling for her maid in a manner that caused her mother to sigh loudly. Any worries that Kitty had been harbouring were banished in the face of a plan. Kitty was naturally a creature of action and always felt better when she was in motion. I will see Mr. Cluett and I will remind him precisely why he is smitten with me, Kitty thought confidently as she mounted the stairs to her room. There was no doubt in her mind that he was in fact smitten. Why should she think otherwise? Already, the prospect of seeing him had put a rosy glow into her cheeks and a demure little smile on her face. Chapter 3 Given that it was considered highly improper for young ladies to simply loiter about, wandering the streets without a clear destination, it was a tricky enterprise for Kitty to do exactly that, without looking as if that was what she was doing. She had brought her maid along with her, but there were really only so many times that the pair could pass before the Cluet house, before it became obvious. The multiple trips down the sidewalk proved useful in an unexpected way, however. Kitty had become quite adept at noticing things, which served her well in the time. Young ladies had little power and assets at their disposal, and information, or gossip, if one were being less charitable, was about their only real bargaining chip, These powers of observation were setting off alarms in Kitty's head, but she could not figure out precisely why. The Cluett house was never exactly famed for its hospitality, but there was a new air of coldness about the grey stone edifice that was almost palpable. The shades were drawn tightly, though it was the middle of the day. The outer door was closed up securely, indicating that the family was not at home to unexpected visitors. The whole house almost had the look of abandonment, as if the family had quit London and retired to their estate. Kitty frowned. She had not considered that possibility, that perhaps Lady Cluett had simply pulled up stakes and followed the town to Bath and other points south. Seth would have been dragged along behind his mother, likely with little to no warning. It was entirely possible that Kitty was risking her reputation for no good reason. 
Bertha, her maid, seemed inclined to agree. "'It's getting on toward four o'clock soon, miss,' she said, her eyes darting about. "'You wouldn't want to be caught out of doors as evening falls.' "'Don't fret, Bertha,' Kitty said, reassuring her without much conviction. "'We'll be on our way shortly.' "'Best we were on our way, miss,' Bertha insisted, worry limbing her face. "'I've heard tell that the Bow Street runners have become enthusiastic in their efforts to arrest women of a... "'A certain profession,' Bertha said, her voice dropping to a scandalised whisper. "'Bertha, are you suggesting that I could be mistaken for...?' Kitty began. "'Oh, no, miss, no,' Bertha said, her face blanching a little. "'Not by any person with sense in their head, but the runners.' She gave a little shrug. "'I've heard that they're arresting any unaccompanied women found out on the streets when the lamplighters come out.' "'That's absurd, Bertha.' All of London would be locked up at the Brown Bear, Kitty said, dismissing her and craning her neck to survey the sidewalk as she made a great show of shuffling onward all the same. Bertha obediently bowed her head, her white cap hiding her forehead. All the same, miss, I've heard that they're picking ladies up far outside Covent Garden now. Some are being pinched just for leaving home without their bonnet or shawl. Kitty gave Bertha a level look. As I clearly have both, I imagine we'll be safe from the runners for a little longer, she said, gesturing up to her bonnet. It was a rather fabulous confection, creamy silk with a dark brown ribbon about the crown, tied beneath her chin to one side, silk flowers in complementing earth tones and dusty pinks nestled on one side, with a spray of curled feathers completing the look. It was a particular favourite of Kitty's, and she fancied it quite becoming. But Bertha was right. She'd wasted quite enough time making herself look ridiculous. In spite of her bravado, she drew her soft cashmere shawl tighter about her shoulders, determined to set off for home. She couldn't help but sigh. It was an inglorious end to a promising attachment, if the end it was. Kitty had just turned back to hurry Bertha along, heedless of where her feet were taking her, when she ran smack into something so solid that she stumbled back awkwardly, half a step. "'Miss Johnson?' Mr. Cluett asked, peering down at Kitty, who was a little dazed and not just from the impact. "'Please forgive me. Thought it might be you and... and... I wish to see you.' "'Think nothing of it,' Kitty said breezily, attempting to appear unconcerned. "'I'm always happy to run into you,' she added with a winning smile." She fancied that any man would be smitten with her in this moment, for she had not only been blessed with a smile that turned her cheeks into adorable little apples, but she had taken great care with her toilette. She had worn her favourite walking dress in a dark pink silesia that bordered on orange. The bodice was cut in a deep V, filled with a wine-coloured satin that was pleated. Matching buttons on the sleeves and back were complemented by sparse embroidery in the same shade. Her hair, though hidden by her bonnet, was curled and elegantly drawn back, with a braid crossing from ear to ear. Soft curls hung down by her face, highlighting her eyes that always sparkled with good humour. Her shawl was a paisley printed cashmere of surpassing softness which was draped elegantly through her elbows. Mr. Cluett smiled at her pun looking a little dazed himself. As much as Kitty would like to have taken credit for his befuddlement, something seemed amiss with him. Her eyes narrowed a little, roving over his face. There were lines near his mouth and his eyes were hooded and tired. "'What is it? Are you unwell?' Kitty asked, her teasing nature giving way to genuine concern. "'I am fine,' Seth said clearly. Kitty was unconvinced and stepped back, observing Mr. Cluett closely. This was always a welcome pastime for Kitty, who could by all accounts be considered something of an expert on the fashionable male form. Her eyes danced over him, noting the fine cut of his jacket, black in colour with a velvet collar that matched the black velvet band around his black hat. Oh, Mr. Cluett, you are in mourning! Kitty realised, placing one gloved hand to her mouth. Oh, gracious me, please do forgive my glibness. If I had known, I never would have... No, 
Mr. Cluett said firmly, shaking his head. Don't apologise. You are a welcome respite from... He trailed off, but indicated the house, dark and dreary as if it too were mourning. Might I be so bold as to ask whom you are in mourning for? Kitty inquired, stepping slightly closer again. My father, Mr. Cluett answered simply, his shoulders falling just a little. You're the Viscount? Dead? But how? He was the picture of health when we saw him last spring, Kitty exclaimed. She struggled with the urge to place a comforting hand on his arm. Not sure, Mr. Cluett said. Happened far away, Egypt. Hard to get information out of there just now. Having to get his affairs in order and trying to... to bring him home. He paused, swallowing hard. And all of this has fallen to you? Kitty asked. She did not bother to check her impulse to place one hand on his arm. You poor thing. What a dreadful time this is for you. Kitty had met some men who could not stand to be pitied, even when it was born from genuine empathy. Mr. Cluett was not that sort of man. In fact, he looked relieved. Rueful, perhaps, but relieved. Tentatively, he raised one of his large hands and placed it over Kitty's, his touch surprisingly tender for a man of his size. Kitty knew all too well what sort of burden had just been abruptly dropped onto him. He had no doubt assumed that he still had years of freedom before him, but now? Kitty's eyes flicked to the house. Is it just you and Lady Cluett in there? Mr. Cluett, now Lord Cluett, Viscount of Shropshire, nodded glumly. Butting heads just now. That isn't difficult to imagine, Kitty muttered. Perhaps you can help. Mr. Cluett said, brightening a little. Something of a moral quandary, and an outside perspective may help. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favour. Like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. Thank you again. Now back to our story. Kitty shifted a little, not wishing to intrude on such a familial conflict. I will, if I can, of course. Mother insists that I go to Egypt and return father home to the family crypt in Shropshire, he explained, his brown eyes sad. But they've already buried him there, in Egypt, and it seems a terrible thing to disturb him. Kitty was taken aback. This was not what she had expected, but she could see that the new Viscount was indeed greatly troubled. I suppose they'd have had to bury him quickly, with the climate she offered weakly. She could feel his eyes on her still, even as she looked down and away, out over the street. Your father, he was a great traveller, wasn't he? Mr. Cluett nodded. Never sat still for long. Kitty bit her lip, afraid that she was about to put her polished walking boot into her mouth if she wasn't careful. He was not particularly at peace at home then? When Mr. Cluett shook his head, she soldiered on. Then I would let him rest where he was happiest. If he wished to be in Shropshire, he would already be there, no? Immediately, Mr. Cluett's face brightened a little. It seemed as if a weight had been lifted from his shoulders. That is precisely what I thought as well. Not sure I'd want to be taken from the place I love either. In spite of the bleak conversation, Kitty found that she could not keep herself from smiling at Mr. Cluett. I know that this is not something you likely wish to hear just yet, but I think you will be a very good Viscount. Mr. Cluett, Lord Cluett, smiled in answer, his cheeks colouring slightly. I was going to write to you, he confessed, but wasn't sure what to say. Terrible at letter writing, you know. Yes, I know, Kitty replied gently. But then I thought I saw you passing by and... Thought I'd take a chance, Mr. Cluett said, his face smoothing into a kind expression that made Kitty's heart glad. We've been to Newton's, Kitty said by way of explanation, and Bertha, recognising her cue, obediently lifted her basket with a few books prominently stacked within. Glad you were here, Lord Cluett said quietly, but emphatically. It was only then that Kitty realised that her hand was still on his arm 
with his own bare paw of a hand covering it still. Her eyes shifted to their joined hands, and after a moment, Lord Cluett's gaze followed hers. Gingerly and with surprising gravity, he lifted her hand in his, clasping her fingers gently, as if he meant to bend and press a kiss to them. Kitty's breath hitched for a beat, for she truly thought that he meant to do so right there, in the midst of a London sidewalk. He did not, merely pressed her fingers that so perfectly curled around his hand. His other hand came up to gently cover her hand, so that her fingers were caught between his. Despite his superior size and strength, his touch was remarkably soft. At no point did Kitty feel like she would have to exert more than a butterfly's strength to withdraw. Wish I could invite you in, but... He trailed off, his eyes flicking to the house again. It's not the best time for you to introduce me to your lady mother, Kitty finished for him. Yes, I understand. Things will be chaotic for a while, and I don't know when I shall be able to see you again, Lord Cluett said unhappily. But I shall write to you, I promise, he added hurriedly a steely look passing over his face. I can't tell you how much I look forward to it, Kitty murmured, giving him another smile, her eyes shining, her cheeks lightly blushing. Can't tell you how much seeing you has cheered me, like seeing the sun from the bottom of a well, Lord Cluett said a little breathlessly, staring at her with all of his affection writ large on his face. Kitty laughed softly, airily, placing her free hand over top their joined hands. I shall await your letter with all eagerness. If Kitty had been anxious that the new Lord Cluett meant to kiss her hand on the street, she was equal parts thrilled and terrified when it looked as if he might actually kiss her lips. They stared into each other's eyes, pulled toward each other as if caught by gravity. Kitty knew it was improper. She was a respectable young lady, and respectable young ladies did not allow young men to kiss them on the street. Still, her breath came quicker and faster, her lips parted softly, waiting. Ah, uh hum, Bertha said, abruptly and noisily clearing her throat. The interruption brought Kitty back to reality, and she blinked up at Lord Cluett, who pulled back to a respectable distance. Kitty looked about, remembering where she was. She gave Lord Cluett's hands a last reassuring squeeze. I will wait for your letter, sir. She said, her words weighted significantly. Lord Cluett nodded slowly in reply, and Kitty knew that he understood exactly what she was actually saying. With great reluctance, Kitty withdrew her hands. The separation was stark and sharp. It took all of her willpower not to look back at him as she began her slow journey back home. She flexed her hands, fingers feeling oddly cold and light now. I hope he doesn't realise we're going back the direction he saw us coming from, Bertha muttered under her breath. Chapter 4 There were some that might assume Kitty was a flighty girl because of her lightness of being. It was true that she seemed to flit from one place to another with ease, unburdened, but this was an elaborate cover. The truth was that she was excessively sentimental, covering her tender heart with protective layers of joviality and ease. When she was troubled, she took great pains to appear at her most content. Such was the case in the days that she waited to hear from Lord Cluett. To the rest of the world, Kitty Johnson appeared as she always had, light, always ready with a smile and a gentle jape. Inwardly, she was suffering an agony of anticipation. At every delivery of post, she would trip eagerly through the hall or skip down the stairs, skipping the last step and landing on both feet as was her girlish habit. She tried to be patient, reminding herself that the new Lord Cluett would be preoccupied with much in these early days. Try to be still, Kitty, her mother admonished her with a sigh, again and again. The news of the previous Viscount's death had spread quickly and Mrs. Johnson had looked as if she'd swallowed a canary when she heard. It was no secret that the son was harbouring a tundra for her daughter. I can endure anything, Kitty thought to herself. I can smile and be the picture of patience, and no one will know that all the while I am in agonies. 
She was as good as her word. But then the days turned to weeks, and Lord Cluett sent no word to her. There was no invitation to his mother's house, no letters renewing his promise or affections. Kitty did her best not to waver, sure in this kind, gentle man that she had been fortunate enough to find. She wasn't a fatalist by heart, but she refused to believe that it could have been a simple coincidence that brought them together. The circumstances were too strange. At last, when Kitty thought that she might burst from waiting, there was a knock on the door. There had been a lot of them lately, men in dark jackets with creased faces parading in and out of her father's study. She ignored them, as they had little interest for her, much as his business interests had always been uninteresting. This time was different. A voice was in the hall, deep and speaking lowly. Kitty could not make out the words from her place in the sitting room, seated near her mother as they both worked on painting a delicate pattern of flowers on a table. At the sound of the man's voice, Kitty's heart quickened, her cheeks flushing. Is that the Count Cluet? Mrs Johnson hissed, but Kitty found that she could not speak. Taking a look at Kitty's face, this was all of the confirmation that Mrs Johnson needed. She was up like a shot, pulling Kitty to her feet and quickly removing the apron that had protected her calico day dress. Quickly, now, Mrs Johnson urged, at last getting Kitty to come to her senses. Together, they hoisted the small table, putting it to one side. With her heel, Mrs Johnson scooted their discarded safis under the chaise lounge. By the time the footman entered the sitting room to announce the guest, Kitty and Mrs Johnson were both seated serenely, small reading volumes in their hands. The newly minted Lord Cluet loomed behind the footman, filling the doorway. From the onset, it was clear that he was in a state of agitation, his dark brown hat in his hands, which he turned over and over again. Kitty looked down, attempting to compose herself as the requisite introductions were made between Lord Cluet and Mrs Johnson. It was only then that she realised that it was a fortunate thing indeed that the gentleman seemed so distracted, for the book that she was pretending to read was upside down in her hands. It is so good of you to call on us, Lord Cluett, Mrs Johnson was saying mildly. I am sure that you must have a great deal of things weighing on your time. Yes, Lord Cluett agreed, his face oddly stiff and troubled. To that end... I know this is very sudden, but might I request the privilege of speaking with Miss Johnson alone? Mrs Johnson made a kind of surprised fluttering motion with her hands, as if she had no idea what that could possibly entail. She looked to Kitty for acceptance of this, which Kitty was immediately grateful for. She nodded almost imperceptibly, and Mrs Johnson curtsied and departed, but not without giving Kitty a significant look. There was little doubt in Kitty's mind that Mrs Johnson was listening at the keyhole. Would you care to sit? Kitty asked as Lord Cluett continued to stand stiffly, his hands clasped behind his back. Yes, he said reluctantly. The moment he sat, however, he sprang back up, pacing the room in great strides. No, I should not. That is, it is hard to know what is proper in these situations. What situations might that be, my lord? Kitty asked, attempting to keep all excitement from her voice. This is... I did not want to do this in this manner, Lord Cluett said, stopping his pacing to stare out a window to the street for a moment. Deserve better, which... which, I suppose, is the whole point. A strange feeling was curling up in Kitty's stomach, like a snake of apprehension. Something was odd starting with the way that Lord Cluett was speaking, unnaturally clipped. Please do not make yourself uneasy for my sake, Kitty said, laying her book aside. To her surprise, Lord Cluett whirled about, and in three great steps was standing before her again. Thought of nothing but your comfort for days now. He sat again, this time quite near her on the lounge, their knees almost touching. He angled himself toward her, perched precariously on the edge of his seat, as if he meant to dash off at any moment. Miss Johnson, 
he began unbearably formal. My father's death has brought many things into sharp relief and shined a bright light on others that had been hidden for some time. Have every intention of leading my family honourably, performing my duties. He paused, looking a little worn out and troubled from reciting this speech. Kitty found herself naturally turning toward him as well. I have never doubted it, Lord Cluett. Your family should be grateful to have such an honourable man at its head. I'm only sorry that you lost your father so young. Honour! Yes, Lord Cluett said, seizing onto this word. It is a matter of honour, yes. Must tell you something in great confidence, but won't insult you by asking you to keep it secret. All of London will know soon enough. Of course, Kitty said, the feeling in her stomach growing and coiling tighter. Lord Cluett took a deep breath, his large torso expanding even more. Father was... No, that is not right. I do not even know what sort of man he was, not really. On his travels, it seemed that he made some... unwise investments. Oh, dear, Kitty said, sympathetic. She had heard her own mother pecking at her father on a similar score, questioning the manner in which their funds were invested. To put a fine point on it, my family is ruined, or nearly, Lord Cluett said bluntly. Ruined? But how? Your estate, Kitty said, dropping her voice out of consideration for the subject. Mortgage to the roof, he said, his face unhappy. Had wondered why we weren't there of late. And now I know. I shall have to lease it out to start paying for it. Possibly sell some of the land. Sell the land? Kitty repeated aghast. Oh, dear one, no. This is too awful for you. I am genuinely so very sorry for all of it. There's more, Lord Cluett continued. It seems that in all of this, Father did make one wise investment. A significant amount of capital was invested into Canadian timber. A mine, too, he added, almost as an afterthought. That's good, though, is it not? At least your holdings have a lifeline, then, Kitty said, trying as ever to put a cheery face onto things. Perhaps, Lord Cluett allowed, but hesitated again. They've been terribly mismanaged from what can be gleaned from the books. They need to be taken in hand, and quickly. He stopped speaking, turning to Kitty again, his eyes searching her face. Of course, Kitty understood at once. There was no one else that could be trusted with this task. The new Viscount meant to solve his own monetary woes with his own two hands, as the saying went. Kitty felt a terrible foreboding wash over her, but attempted to tamp it down. Lord Cluett had more than enough worries piled onto his broad shoulders. I'm not sure what weight my opinion on the matter carries, but I am very sure that you shall do splendidly, just so long as you don't get eaten by a bear, Kitty said with forced lightness. Perhaps father might have some guidance for you. Lord Cluett slowly shook his head, gripping his hat so tightly that Kitty could hear the brim creak. Not why I'm here, kind of you to offer, but you must understand that I... I'm not in a position to... To marry, he ground out. Thought you should be the first to know. It was hard, but of course Kitty understood. Well, it's not the most auspicious of beginnings, I grant you. But should you ask, I am willing to await your return from the wild frontier. She could feel Lord Cluett take a deep, shuddering breath. That's just it, he said, looking down at his hat. Can't won't ask you to wait. Don't know how long I'll be gone. Could be years. The crossing isn't reliable and anything could happen. Not fair for you. You must live your life. What? Do you think I couldn't bear the waiting? I'm made of sterner stuff than anyone credits me with. Why, I was the one... Kitty began indignant to cover her hurt. No! Lord Cluett said emphatically dropping his hat to take Kitty's hands in his. That's the trouble, not a doubt, that you could, that you would, wait. But you mustn't, he said, gently pressing her hands. 
can't bear the thought of leaving you, but thinking of you always waiting, letting life pass you by, that would kill me, truly. He dipped his head, trying to catch Kitty's eye. You must understand, yes? Can't leave with this on my conscience. Kitty found that her throat had closed over with unshed tears. She swallowed hard painfully and extracted one of her hands to swipe quickly at her eyes. Don't worry your head about me, Kitty said, patting Lord Cluett's arm, as if he were a fretting child. You go off and conquer the new world. I will be fine. Lord Cluett stared at her for long moments. Kitty flashed him a smile, wishing to send him off comforted. Whatever her feelings were, she would not dare to add to his worries. He stood slowly, retrieving his fallen hat as he did so. When he was nearly to the door, he turned back as if he were going to say something else to her, but thought better of it. Blindly, Kitty smiled at him again, her eyes clouded by tears that she refused to let fall. Only when she heard the front door open and then close again did she turn away, the proverbial dam bursting. The room was colder, everything a little greyer, Whatever her sadness, her resolve remained steadfast. I won't abandon him so lightly, she thought, wiping her eyes again. I've waited this long for him. What do a few more months, a year even, mean to me? Chapter 5 Something was amiss in the Johnson household. Kitty, so far gone in her own quiet misery, did not notice the warning signs of it. Truthfully, she had missed all indication of it first being so absorbed in the hopes she had pinned on Lord Cluet, and then having them dashed so suddenly. There were always men of business coming and going from her father's home, so that was not even particularly noteworthy. This inattentiveness was thoroughly out of character for Kitty. It was not until one evening after dinner that her father joined herself and Mrs Johnson in the sitting room that Kitty had any real notion of it. After dinner, Mr. Johnson typically retired to his study for a brandy and pipe, joining the ladies only when it was nearly time to retire for the night. The fact that Mr. Johnson was forgoing this nightly ritual to pointedly keep company with the ladies of the house was enough to rouse Kitty from her gloom. Curiously, she sent a querying glance to her mother, who looked away. After the footmen had been dismissed, Mr. Johnson took a position in front of the fireplace hands clasped behind his back. Family, he began, which immediately set off Kitty's wariness. We have come to an impasse of sorts. What do you mean, father? Kitty asked, looking askance at her mother again. Unusually, she gave nothing away to Kitty, when typically she could be relied on to act as a silent informant, sending significant looks and minute gestures. I have always endeavoured to protect both of you from the matters of business that have provided our family's income and standing, Mr Johnson said, speaking as if he were giving some kind of sermon. This is the right and proper thing to do, though Mother has always known little bits of the whole. He paused, his nose twitching a little. It is now prudent that I inform you both that these investments have not gone well of late. Instantly, Kitty's mind flashed to Lord Cluett. "'How not well do you mean?' Kitty asked. Mrs Johnson was busy looking away, and Kitty understood that this was a pantomime for her benefit. Whatever it was, clearly Mrs Johnson already knew. Mr Johnson cleared his throat, but lowered his voice, lest the servants overhear. "'Not to put too fine of a point on it, but if something does not change, we shall be destitute by the start of summer. Destitute? Destitute, Kitty repeated, unable to comprehend. Is it really as bad as all that? Surely you've put something aside for this occasion. It never occurred to me that I would not have a living son, Mr Johnson said crisply, biting off the ends of his words. Mrs Johnson looked pained briefly, then blinked furiously as if fighting back tears. Kitty knew this was a sore subject. She'd had a brother once, but, like so many other sons, he had never returned from France. It was not something they discussed, 
but Kitty had never suspected that her father's denial had grown to include denying the future that was marching toward them. That's hardly mother's fault, Kitty said, immediately defensive of her mother. Or mine, for that matter. I did not know that you had become such an expert, Mr Johnson snapped. So far as I knew, you excelled only at spending money, not making it. James, this is not helping, Mrs Johnson began. Well, it's a fine thing for her to sit there in judgment when she has contributed more than her fair share to this predicament. Every day, bills from the milliner, the mantua maker, the cobbler. Mantua maker? Kitty asked, arching an eye brow. Father, it's not 1750. The point, Kitty, Mrs Johnson said firmly before the argument could devolve further, is that we are facing financial ruin. Well, we shall simply have to adapt, I suppose, Kitty replied. There is another solution, Mr Johnson said, staring expectantly at Kitty. Why are you looking at me like that, father? What can I do? Kitty asked, looking between her parents. It's quite simple, Mr Johnson answered. You must marry quickly and well. Father, you cannot be serious, Kitty objected. I'm already spoken for. Are you? Mr Johnson asked pointedly, stepping closer. I do not recall any young men offering for you. Well, no, it's nothing official yet. But I have ever hoped that Lord Cluett... We cannot live off hope, Kitty, Mr Johnson interrupted. Especially as I understand that his situation is as dire as our own. I'm not giving him up, not yet, Kitty said, lifting her chin stubbornly. He'll return to England and... Mother, tell him, she implored, jerking her head toward her father. To her surprise, Mrs Johnson turned to Kitty, folded her hands in her lap, and adopted a tone that was somewhere between pleading and patronising. Be reasonable, Kitty, she said, almost wheedling. Even Lord Cluett requested that you not pin all of your hopes on him. This is something you can do now, not ten years from now, when the bloom is quite gone off the rose. I wish I could say that I was surprised you were eavesdropping, Mother, but that would taste of a falsehood. One of these days, you will hear something you do not like at a keyhole. Kitty sighed. Mrs Johnson gave Kitty a despairing look that seemed to indicate that she already had. It's as simple as this, Mr Johnson said, his tone becoming sharper. You have been asked to do very little in your gilded life to aid this family. Now is time for you to contribute, as is your duty. Why is this fallen to me? Surely I have some say in this matter, Kitty argued. Kitty, you are a charming enough girl. I will grant you that, but do you think any man of standing would be fool enough to offer for you without a proper dowry? As it is, we will have to scramble and pin all of our hopes on your new husband's generosity, Mr Johnson said, now standing directly before Kitty, forcing her to crane her neck upward to see him. Why bother hoping for generosity? Why not simply find the oldest possible suitor and wait for him to die and leave me a wealthy widow? Kitty said sardonically. When her parents said nothing, her eyes darted between them, her mouth falling open. Oh God, you've already picked out some shambling horror. Oh mother, you cannot really want me to go along with this. There's nothing further to discuss. You will do this, Kitty and I will not have any further histrionics about it, Mr Johnson snapped. I shan't do it. You can drag me to the altar if you wish, but I shall kick and scream the whole way, and when the vicar... Kitty cried, leaping to her feet in a rare flash of temper. Now, peace, Kitty, peace, Mrs Johnson said, also standing and interposing herself between father and daughter. You do not have to commit to anything just yet. All that we will ask you to do, for now, is to simply meet the man in question and see if you can't get along with him. 
Who knows, you may find that being a baroness is a prospect that agrees with you, she said soothingly. Kitty took a deep breath. I cannot prevent you from making whatever introductions you wish, but I will make no promises. This seemed to placate Mrs. Johnson, at least until Kitty turned her attention back to her father. But I shall also, in the meantime, be searching for alternatives. If I find some other means to contribute, as you so kindly put it, then I shall do so. And with that, Kitty turned on her heel and flounced from the sitting room. It was egregiously disrespectful, especially to her father, but Kitty had stomached about all of the high-handed talk that she could of an evening. She was sure to receive a lecture from her mother on the importance of honouring thy father, but for tonight, Kitty had a sense of pyrrhic victory. She was sorely tempted to slam the door to her apartment, but resisted the urge. It was rare for her to have a fit of peak, but... Uh, the past few days had been a great deal for her to bear. She had fully realised the depth of her attachment to Lord Cluett, only to have him unfairly snatched away from her. It was a good match, whatever his present or future circumstances, if only for the fact that they were exceedingly well suited. Still seething a little, she flopped face down onto her bed. It was tall, piled high with mattresses and pillows and bolsters, everything she could ever want for her comfort. Kitty turned her head to the side and took in the white lace bed curtains, the dressing table with pots of cream and powder, scented pomatum and bottles of scent. Beyond that, through a door in the far wall, was her dressing room. Even from here she could see the cedar wardrobes within, all filled with dresses, gowns, petticoats, shawls, spencers, and all of the other accoutrement a fashionable young lady could desire. Even the basic comforts were present, in the form of thick woolen rugs that covered the wood plank floors. She knew that all she had to do was ring for a servant, and she would be provided with warm water in her pitcher at the basin. Here, in her room, it was impossible for her to deny that her father was at least partially right. She had lived a privileged life, free from care, worry and want. His words had stung because there was a ring of truth to them, which only made Kitty all the more bitter with herself. Sighing, she rolled over, one arm above her head, the other on her stomach. If she were going to hold herself thoroughly accountable, that was not the only thing that had gotten under her skin. For the briefest of moments, no more than a split second, she had actually considered her father's words. The future, if she even had one, with Lord Cluett was far from certain. There was a great chance that it would be one of hardship, the kind of which she had never faced before. It was easy for her to swear her loyalty to him now, but when there was no more money for candles or a joint of meat or coals for the fire, would she still feel the same? It would be easy to be a baroness by comparison, even if her groom were to be hunchbacked with age. No, Kitty thought firmly, I am not so weak as this. Would I really put a few frilly petticoats above the affection I have for Lord Cluett? What a terrible trade that would be. Mirthlessly, she laughed a little, throwing her arm over her eyes. And father says that I have no head for business. Ha! Huh. Chapter 6 Tybalt? Featherston Hall, Baron Sheffield, was not the sort of man that would inspire anyone to matrimonial thoughts. Much as Kitty had predicted and feared, he was of an age with Methuselah, with mean little creases around his eyes and mouth. Kitty doubted that he had ever been handsome, though he was still in possession of the piercingly blue eyes that peeked out from beneath unruly brows. His back was not curved with age, but he required the use of a cane, citing a war wound sustained on the continent. Kitty resisted the urge to ask him if it was gotten chasing the heathens during the Crusades, but only just. All of this would have been tolerable if he had not been possessed of an equally odious temperament. Kitty was the sort of young lady who could find a point of beauty with nearly any specimen of the masculine sex, 
She fancied herself something of a connoisseur of their many different varieties. But she was flabbergasted at the notion that she should tie herself down to such a man. The Baron had arrived at their house in an equally ancient carriage, though the crest on the door was highly polished, and the horses pulling it were a pair of gleaming bays, their heads held high. Grumpily, he had waved off the help of a pair of hovering footmen, lurching his way unsteadily up the front steps. Kitty had watched his grand entrance from her bedroom window, which overlooked the street. He was escorted, haltingly, into the sitting room at the rear of the house, ostensibly to admire Mr Johnson's few hunting trophies. Idly, Kitty wondered if he would be informed that Mr Johnson had not hunted a single one of them, purchasing them instead at an estate sale as a younger man to smarten up their townhouse. Kitty watched his progress through the house from the upper floor of the house, leaning forward on hands planted wide on the railing. Her father and the Baron halted in the hall, trailed by Mrs Johnson, pointing out a painting on the wall. "'There you are, Kitty!' Mrs Johnson said with an expression that was likely an attempt at a smile. "'Won't you come down and join us for some tea?' Kitty was of a mind to outright refuse but she had promised to at least meet the beast. She stretched her own mouth in a gross pantomime of a smile and flounced down the stairs. The Baron turned and watched dispassionately, revealing his nearsightedness by squinting fiercely up at Kitty as she descended. When she hopped down from the second stair, skipping the last step and landing firmly on her feet, the Baron frowned. Kitty was idly fascinated that the furrows around his eyes and mouth were able to deepen further. Mrs Johnson, meanwhile, was busy giving Kitty a look from behind his back that was equal parts pleading and disapproving. Baron, may I present my daughter? Miss Kitty Johnson, Mr Johnson ground out, his own face slightly florid. Kitty, this is Lord Featherstonehill, Baron Sheffield. Resisting the urge to sigh, Kitty dropped a curtsy as was expected of her. She stared into the Baron's face, who was busy scrutinising her. Daughter, hmm? The Baron asked in a gravelly voice. He fished about in the inner pocket of his jacket and produced a lorgnette which he held up to his left eye. Pretty enough, I suppose, he commented, as if Kitty were not standing right there in front of him. How many summers has she? She is not yet four and twenty, my lord, Mrs Johnson answered hastily. Strictly speaking, this was true, for the next two weeks. The Baron grunted a little. Well, at least she is not likely to be as silly as a girl in her first flush, he allowed. Is she educated? She has been well taught in all of the gentler arts, Mrs Johnson replied warily, unsure which way the Baron's tastes were inclined. She is quite handy with a needle and has been trained in the running of a household. She knows well how to handle servants. I require someone that knows how to take a firm hand with the servants, the Baron replied, his left eye comically enlarged by the thick glass. I shan't tolerate any shilly-shallying from them. These lower orders need clear instructing, else they might take all sorts of notions into their heads. How right you are, my lord, Mr Johnson jumped in, nodding sagely. That is how all of that unpleasantness began in France. Far too many liberties given to those who cannot bear them properly. The Baron jerked his head in a sharp nod. Precisely. I am glad to see we are of a mind about that. His gaze sharpened on Kitty. She hasn't been polluted by any tutelage, unsuitable for the gentler sex, has she? It's no good for them, overheats the brain. Kitty stared at him agog. It was a fortunate thing indeed that she was too outraged to speak, lest she say something that would truly shock and offend him. Thankfully, her father was there to once again interject with the correct answer. Oh, no, Mr Johnson said hastily. We don't entertain any blue-stocking notions in this household. The Baron grunted again, a sound about which Kitty was uncertain if it meant approval or disapproval. She was of a mind to ask if he would like her to open her mouth 
so that he might inspect her teeth as if she were a horse he were considering purchasing. Very well, he allowed at last. No one was entirely sure what this grudging acceptance meant, and there was an awkward moment where the Johnson family all glanced at one another by turns. Mrs Johnson was the first to recover. She stepped forward, gesturing elegantly with one arm to the sitting room. Would you care for some tea, my lord? she asked, favouring him with a demure smile. The baron grunted again, but turned to follow Mrs Johnson. When his back was turned, Kitty exhaled through her nose, deflating a bit. Her father gave her a baleful look, which Kitty responded to with one of her trademark sparkly, eyed winning smiles. Well, this has been the height of delight, she said briskly, clasping her hands together. I think it best if I just perhaps retire now, she continued, turning to the stairs. Ah, ta-ta, Mr Johnson said, catching her by the shoulders and steering her back in the direction of the sitting room. I think not, young lady. Have you any idea what it took to get the Baron even through our door? I shan't have you mucking this up, he chided. Kitty sighed, even indulging in a hearty roll of her eyes, but her father's tone was hard and implacable. She knew that he would brook no nonsense. Resignedly, she marched to the sitting room, feeling a keen sense of sympathy for all of those Frenchmen that were herded to the guillotine. There followed an afternoon of such ill humour that one would have thought it a funeral wake rather than a sociable afternoon tea. Kitty could feel herself shrinking into her chair more and more, willing herself to simply disappear. She knew that the family were in dire straits. She was not so naive as to pretend otherwise. But the thought of tying herself down to such a man was worse than any poverty she might be forced to endure. When an agonising two hours had finally passed, the Baron rose with a great crackling of his knees and proclaimed it time for him to be off. Without waiting for comment, he proceeded to shuffle and creak his way back out to his carriage, where the poor driver was huddled up in blankets, awaiting his pleasure. The Baron had not allowed him to come in out of the cold into the servants' quarters, as most other masters might have. He had forbidden even to allow the man to be taken any refreshment, which had made Kitty's face go pinched in disapproval. As the Baron was clambering up into his carriage, he had paused, both hands on the doorway. Without turning back around, he said, I shall contact my solicitor about drawing up those contracts. Everything seems to be in order here, he threw over his shoulder as casually as if he were discarding a bit of rind. He did not bother waiting for a response, but climbed into his carriage and wrapped the roof with the head of his cane. As the carriage and the Baron both rattled off, Kitty turned to her father. You cannot really be serious, she said. Can't I? Mr Johnson asked, still watching the carriage as it grew smaller as it made its way down the street. You cannot really expect me to marry that man, Kitty said flatly. We are so poorly suited, it is almost comical. No, I mean it, father. In the hands of a good playwright, this would make for quite the onstage farcical. There is nothing humorous about making a respectable match, and you will treat this situation with all of the gravity it is due, Mr Johnson ordered. Kitty, feeling a bit reckless, audibly snorted in derision. As you say, father, I shall treat this with all of the gravity it is due, which none, less than none. Kitty, Mrs Johnson warned clearly wishing to head off an argument while they were all assembled on the sidewalk. Mother, you cannot possibly wish for your daughter, your only living child, to entertain such match, Kitty rounded on her. It was a low blow, and when Mrs Johnson winced, Kitty felt a matching pang of guilt. Catherine Johnson, you will remember your place, Mr Johnson said, jabbing a finger in Kitty's direction. You need this match, we need this match. You shall be on the shelf in a matter of only a couple of years if we do not act hastily, and then there will be nothing to be done. Kitty narrowed her eyes, a suspicion growing. Father, why do I suspect that it was not only marriage contracts that the Baron was referring to? 
What other contracts will his solicitor be drawing up? That is none of your concern at this moment, Mr Johnson said hotly, turning and entering the house. There was no hiding the way that his cheeks reddened. I beg to differ, Kitty cried, stalking after him. If I am to be sold, I should at least know what the price is. Have I not the right to know what I am worth at least? She followed him right into his study, usually forbidden terrain. The room was small, dominated mostly by a large desk, stacks of papers and folios covering it. There was a small hearth to one side, and it was to hear that Mr Johnson retreated. He jabbed at the sullenly burning my embers with an iron poker. You are acting as if marriage were not a contractual business, Mr Johnson huffed. There's scarcely been a marriage performed that hasn't been accompanied by an exchange of property. Fair enough, father, and I do not object to that notion as such. But to the baron, Kitty demanded, hands on her hips, he is old enough to be your father. Yes, which means that his position is secure. You shan't want for anything, Mrs Johnson said soothingly, trying again to play the part of peacemaker. Except love, companionship, the friendship of my husband, Kitty retorted sardonically. Tell me right now, father, did you feel none of those things for mother when you offered for her? Mr Johnson paused in his stirring of the weak fire, clearly feeling not only Kitty's eyes on him, but Mrs Johnson's as well. He stared into the fire for a couple of beats, blinking slowly. At length, he took a deep breath. That was a long time ago, he answered at last. Kitty made a derisive, scoffing sound, folding her arms over herself. Mrs Johnson stepped forward, putting her hands on her daughter's arms and looking at her gently. Kitty, of course we wish for you to have those things, she said, her gaze flicking to Mr Johnson. But the time for your carefree, wild days is over. I should have liked for you to make a suitable match before this time, to find someone on your own who suited, but... But you did not, Mr Johnson finished, his voice and face hardening. Now, we must make the best of this situation. By all means, if you find an agreeable alternative, feel free to present him. Bear in mind that it must be someone willing to take you on with no promise of a dowry. I wish you good luck, he added, jabbing the fire viciously one last time. Mrs Johnson frowned. Her eyes... Chapter 7 As it was November, there were not very many social occasions of note in London. Much of the city had departed, either for their estates in the country or Bath, even Bristol. The city that was left in their wake was notably subdued. There were a few intrepid souls who hosted dinners, and of course there were the public assembly rooms. It was the first real concrete sign that things were not as they should be in the Johnson household that they, too, did not migrate with the fashionable crowd. Kitty could not remember a time when they had remained thusly in London. Those that remained in London did their best to put a brave face on things, forcing smiles when they encountered one another and insisting that it was their choice not to travel. This would have made anyone dreary, but Kitty was particularly in the doldrums because of the continued absence of her dear friend Eva. She sighed much, finding her good spirits diminishing rapidly under the weight of her situation and the lack of anyone to confide in. If anyone were to understand being trapped under a parent scheme for an advantageous marriage, it would be her. Each passing day only highlighted just how thoroughly Kitty was trapped too. Her father had graciously allowed that if Kitty could find an alternative, suitable match on her own, then he would be amenable to it. The trouble was there were scant few eligible men, young or otherwise, in London currently. As if that were not all bad enough, even should Kitty receive an invitation, she was unsure if she should accept it on the grounds that her dress allowance had completely evaporated. It wasn't that she had unacceptable ensembles or that they were hideously out of fashion. Quite the opposite, actually. And it wasn't that she hesitated to wear them more than once. That 
was the standard procedure for even the wealthiest of ladies. However, it was expected that young ladies in particular should smarten up their dresses and gowns between wearings, adding lace here, a ribbon there. Kitty had no pin money at all now, and the very idea of going out and damaging her reputation as one of the N mode of London was anathema to her. Nevertheless, she found herself being dragged, more or less unwillingly, to an evening party given by a Colonel Smythe and his wife. The Colonel was lately returned from North America, and thus was eager to reintegrate himself into London society, no matter the state of it. It was not a ball, but like all parties held toward the latter end of the day, there was likely to be some impromptu dancing. Kitty dressed in defiance of the season, donning a mint green silk gown so light it was almost white. This was accented with ribbon embroidered flowers in a cascading pattern down the skirt in silken shades of pink. In deference to the temperature, she donned long gloves in palest blush pink, with a delicate row of buttons at the wrist. She opted for a fur-lined tippet overtop, burying her hands into a silk-lined muff that matched the tippet exactly. She looked like a primrose, fresh of face and a wistful reminder of spring. Perhaps this will not be so terrible, she consoled herself as their carriage pulled up to the Colonel's townhouse. It had lately been given a new facade inspired by the architectural tastemaker John Nash. Through the new, larger windows at the ground floor, Kitty could see that the rooms were already quite full, with the guests milling about and chatting amiably. My, what a crush this is, Mrs Johnson murmured when they entered. Kitty was inclined to agree, finding that there was barely room for her to slip out of her tippet with the assistance of a harried-looking maid. Once her outerwear was suitably dispensed with, Kitty looked about, trying to ascertain if there was anyone there that she knew. It soon became abundantly clear that Kitty had no real acquaintances, though she did recognise the parents, aunts and uncles of some of her contemporaries. In fact, it seemed that there was scarcely a person there younger than 40 years. Well, that is typical, of course. Kitty sighed inwardly. Still, she was inclined to make the best of the situation. Mrs Smythe, the colonel's wife, was a kind and gregarious host, inclined toward laughter. She also clearly kept an able cook, for though the food may not have been as decorative as some of the finer houses of the tun, it was excellent seasoned and plenty of it. It was over a table piled high with jellies, and aspects that glittered like jewels in the candlelight that Kitty came face to face with the hostess first. It did not matter that they had not been introduced, for Mrs Smythe began to speak to her as if they were old friends. Well, aren't you a sprightly young thing, Mrs Smythe said brightly, smiling at Kitty. Such a delightful breath of spring on such a dreary day. Kitty could not help but smile in return. If it pleases you then I am glad that I wore it. Mrs Smith let out a chortling laugh, her soft, fleshy face tilting upward as she did so. Oh, la you, such pretty manners from such a pretty girl. Tell me, are you here with your parents? I am, Kitty said, gesturing toward her mother. Her father, as was his custom, had disappeared to some inner chamber or another, likely to stand over a card table, and tut sagely, with a brandy in hand. Ah, I see, and have you been a guest in our home before? Mrs Smythe inquired, shuffling along the table as she selected dainties for her plate. I have not previously had the privilege, Kitty replied politely. Well, then I feel it only fair to warn you that you must not ask the Colonel about his travels, or you shan't be able to get away for the next several hours. Mrs. Smythe advised good-naturedly. Kitty could not help but smile. He is lucky, then, to have so many interesting things to say. I can't say the same for all of society. Oh, you cheeky thing, Mrs. Smythe laughed. Is the colonel very well travelled, then? Kitty asked, pulling a candied plum from a dish for herself. Oh, yes, he does not get to many exotic ports of call, 
But he has lately been in Canada, Mrs. Smythe said with a proud look at her husband across the room. Canada? Kitty asked, her interest peaking. He has lately been in Canada? He has, Mrs. Smythe confirmed. Have you an interest in that part of the world? I, yes, Kitty said, feeling her cheeks grow warm. That is, someone I am acquainted with has departed for that provincial outpost. Oh, I see, Mrs. Smith said with a knowing smile and a nod. Kitty did not mind the presumption, as she was sure that, as a colonel's wife, Mrs. Smythe had seen more than her share of sweethearts separated by sea and land. It may comfort you to know that the colonel found it an exceedingly lovely country, full of natural beauty. Well, that is not particularly reassuring in terms of wanting to ensure that he desires to return home at all, Kitty quipped. Mrs. Smythe laughed. Oh, no, dear one. There is nothing to compare to London society. I do not think you will have to fear on that score. There was a parting in the crowd then, which curtailed any further conversation. Both Kitty and Mrs. Smythe turned to see what the disruption was, and found that it was due to someone pushing insistently through the crowd. Kitty felt a sort of shriveling sensation in her stomach, suspecting that she knew precisely whom it was causing such a kerfuffle. Out of my way, blast ye, a cantankerous voice called out, and the crowd obligingly pulled back though not without a significant amount of lips curled in distaste and yelps of distress regarding toes and hems. Like the Red Sea, the crowd was split open, and shuffling crookedly down the lane came the Baron Sheffield. He leaned heavily on his cane, his face etched into what Kitty suspected was a now permanent scowl. To her great mortification, conversation had stilled, with all of the guests present craning their heads to see what the disruption was. He made his way directly toward her, his eyes fixed on her so that it was impossible for her to slip away. When he was within speaking distance of Kitty, he stopped and straightened his posture. Awkwardly and without comment, he thrust forward a small posy of flowers. Kitty simply stared at him, uncomprehending. It was traditional for gentlemen suitors to pay their compliments to young ladies by presenting them with small nosegays. However, this was typically done before they departed for the party, with messengers arriving to deliver the dainty bouquets so that the ladies might select which they would like to carry for the evening. Gentlemen frequently took this as an opportunity to posture and demonstrate their means competing with each other to see who could provide the most exotic hothouse blooms and the most luxurious silk ribbons. It was unheard of for a hopeful suitor to present a gift in such a public manner. Kitty felt that she was rooted to the spot. Her legs turned to lead. Likewise, her tongue felt heavy in her mouth, and she did not know what to say. Helplessly, she looked about, wishing desperately that someone would swoop in and save her from this dreadful situation. Oh, Mrs. Smythe said at last, her voice warbling uncertainly. Why, what a... a handsome gesture. Are those orange blossoms? How perfectly... seasonal, she attempted. Kitty swallowed hard, willing herself to speak, but she merely continued to stare. At Mrs. Smythe's urging, Kitty woodenly reached forward and mutely took the posy. I understand it is the sort of thing young ladies expect, the Baron stated. He looked expectantly at Kitty, as if awaiting an effusion of gratitude. Obligingly, she buried her nose in the flowers, hoping that it would suffice. For emphasis, she added what she hoped passed for a smile, peeking up over the bouquet. Mollified, the Baron gave another stiff nod, his expression smug. Without further comment, he turned and shuffled away again. Slowly, the crowd closed behind him. In another room, a piano began tinkling in the background. Conversation resumed, though it was impossible to miss the multitude of glances and whispers pointed in Kitty's direction. Kitty was still stuck to the spot, staring down at the flowers. Whatever hope she had entertained of keeping all of this quiet were well and truly dashed. While London was not as full as it would be when the season commenced, she had no doubt 
that a flurry of letters would be dispatched the next morning, detailing the whole scene in excruciating detail. In a strange twist of irony, she found herself grateful that Lord Cluett was far afield, and hopefully outside of the scope of any gossips. I believe the gardens are quiet just now. Should you wish a moment to reflect, Mrs Smythe said quietly, giving Kitty's arm a sympathetic squeeze. Kitty gave her a look of gratitude and quietly slipped away. It was easily done, for Mrs Smythe had quickly recruited the colonel and some other men in uniform to take up positions near the pianoforte, and they were noisily engaged in belting out marching songs in quick order. It was a rousing, heartening display, and under normal circumstances, Kitty would be admiring it right at the forefront, fluttering her fan and perhaps bestowing bits of ribbon or lace as favours on some of the young bucks. Instead, she was reduced to slinking away, Though the night was chilly, she did not begrudge the chance to be alone with her thoughts. With a sigh, she found herself plonking heavily on a cement bench. It was a particular cruelty that there was a statue of Cupid and Psyche in the centre of the circular garden path just before her. Still, at least the noise and merriment of the party were somewhat muted, though the windows afforded her an unwanted view inside, light spilling out across the garden. Sighing, Kitty lifted the posy of flowers. With one forefinger, she found the silk ribbon wrapped about the stems. It was a muted, dusty pink, which in fairness did match somewhat with her dress. It appeared to be of a reasonable quality, the edges hot cut to prevent any fraying. Kitty was tempted to begin thinking more reasonably of the Baron. He couldn't be all bad if he was thoughtful enough to provide such a gift, even if somewhat ill-timed when her fingers strayed to the ribbon tail that hung from the posy. Curiously, Kitty lifted it between her thumb and forefinger, tilting it toward the light to see it better. As was custom, there was something printed on it. Kitty half expected one of the usual sentiments. To a girl of charm, a posy for a posy, even a simple, with my compliments. She squinted, hoping to see anything that would better her opinion of the Baron. She tilted it this way and that, and... Miss Catty? Kitty said aloud. She was certain that she must be mistaken, but no. The very simplest of addresses that one could put on the ribbon, and he had gotten it wrong. Moreover, it showed a startling familiarity if he believed that he could address her by her forename. Oh, phew, she said fed up. She tossed the posy down beside her, folding her arms over herself. I assume then that the aged Romeo's love gift was not all that you had hoped it would be. Kitty started upright. Standing before her was an elegantly dressed matron, a single streak of grey at the front of her light brown hair. Though it was dark, there was no mistaking her. Lady Veronica, Viscountess Cluet. Kitty paled wondering if she had been recognised. Chapter 8 Straight from the frying pan and into the fire, Kitty muttered to herself, swallowing hard and trying not to panic. She blinked up at the Viscountess. I am not surprised, the Viscountess continued, tossing her head in the direction of the party. The Baron has never been one for nuanced social interactions. You are acquainted with him, then? Kitty asked, her throat feeling dry. Well, as much as anyone can be, I suppose. We've been on the fringes of the same circles for, well, longer than I care to admit. The Viscountess stepped closer, a thoughtful mien to her face. I would like to tell you that he was a charming man in his youth, but I suspect that would smell of a rank lie. It would, though mostly because I cannot imagine that you knew him in his youth. Kitty said, falling back on the tried and true ease of conversation that she had always enjoyed, even with strangers. Oh, and why is that? the Viscountess asked. The light from the rear windows of the Colonel's house landed on Viscountess Cluet's face, just enough that Kitty could see her archer brow aristocratically. You are, well, far too young, for one thing, Kitty replied succinctly. The Viscountess's lips quirked. 
as if she were considering smiling. Does shameless flattery get you very far? Usually, Kitty answered without hesitation. The Viscountess absorbed this, lifting her chin and contemplating Kitty. May I? she asked, indicating the space next to Kitty, currently occupied by the discarded, hated Posy. Kitty nodded her assent, clearing the way. Carefully, the Viscountess settled herself, spreading the skirt of her black crepe gown so that it would not crease. Clearly feeling Kitty's eyes upon her, the Viscountess said, Do you think me terribly fast for coming out in my morning weeds? No, Kitty said immediately. She did not wish the Viscountess to form a purr impression of her, for no matter how much Kitty told herself that it was no longer a realistic prospect, she still harboured some hope of a connection with Lord Cluett. That is, Kitty amended, I have never particularly understood why it is that we expect those most in need of company and cheering to remain locked up in their homes like nuns in a convent. Because that is the way that things are done, the Viscountess replied firmly. Kitty did not reply aloud, merely tilted her head and gave the Viscountess a significant look from head to toe. This made the Viscountess huff out a sound vaguely like a laugh. That is entirely too chittish of you, she said. In my own defence, I am not really here at the party proper. I have come here to counsel with Colonel Smythe. My son, you see, has lately departed for Canada. Yes, Kitty said, her voice a little strangled. She swallowed again. At least I had heard that he was leaving London. Ah, I knew that I recognised you, the Viscountess said, turning more fully toward Kitty. Her brown eyes scrutinised Kitty's face, and Kitty felt her hands grow cold with nerves. I have seen you in the company of that Eva Stanton, haven't I? Yes, you helped to orchestrate that business at the theatre. Well, I... Kitty began, attempting to shrug modestly. Come, come now, the Viscountess admonished her. That was a clever bit of work. I did not approve of the public nature of the whole affair, but I acknowledge that it was likely the only way to get Lady Stanton to capitulate. I am just glad that things turned out so well, Kitty said. The Viscountess scoffed. I am not sure I would call the marriage of a genteel young lady, no matter her reputation, to a dancing master things turning out well. But at least my son was clear of it. Kitty had nothing to say to that, nothing polite, at least. She tightened her jaw and willed herself to stay silent. It had ever been a problem for her, this compunction to defend her friends out loud and vehemently. She still hoped to make a good impression on the Viscountess, so she bit back her words and choked them down. It was also clear that the rumours of Kitty's own presumed attachment to Lord Cluett had somehow not reached his mother's ears. Well, it would seem that you too have an opportunity for things to turn out well, Lady Cluett said, reaching over and picking up the posy from Kitty's limp hands. At least it's a handsome bouquet. I'll grant him that. Oh, she said, catching sight of the ribbon. Oh, that is... unfortunate. It does seem entirely in his character, for I have never known him to keep track of anyone's name that was not his hounds or his horses. It is an entirely practical match, or so I have been told, Kitty offered. Despite her best efforts, there was no way to prevent her tone from betraying her feelings. The Viscountess turned to regard Kitty again, and you've no other options, hmm? It was a very direct and forward question, verging on the rude, but Kitty found that she liked Viscountess Cluet's direct approach in comparison to the rest of polite society. There was no dissimulation, no double speak. I thought I had, not so very long ago, Kitty admitted, but he is no longer available. Ah, Lady Cluet said, nodding her head sagely. I expect there has been rather a lot of that in the past several years. Young men 
full of love and the fancies of spring before being shipped off to whichever port of call to defend the empire. Kitty did not bother to correct her. It was a plausible cover story, one that would shield her from the truth. You speak well enough. Are you educated as well? How is your reading? The Viscountess inquired. Well enough, I imagine. Mother likes it when I read poetry to her, Kitty replied, unsure of where this particular line of questioning was going. The lines around the Viscountess's mouth deepened, and Kitty was under the impression that she had not answered entirely correctly. And how are you with a needle? Kitty considered for a moment before answering. I haven't my mother's talent for embroidery, but she says that she has not seen anyone with a daintier hand for darning than myself, she answered honestly. That will do, the Viscountess murmured, almost inaudible. Suddenly she rose, leaving Kitty a little bewildered at the startling nature of her departure. It seems to me that there is a rather obvious choice before you, one that faces many girls. Shall you marry practically, without a thought to your own feelings? Please forgive me if I speak bluntly, but I find myself in a situation with diminishing options of making a good marriage, Kitty said, casting her eyes downward. Yes, I'd heard some interesting rumours regarding Mr Johnson and the East India Trading Company, the Viscountess said. Kitty felt her eyes widen. Father, embroiled with bloody Jack? Perhaps, the Viscountess said. So, his means, and consequently yours, diminished by the day then? I shall have to marry a fishmonger next week if I do not marry the Baron this week, Kitty replied dryly. Then I shall make an entirely different proposal. Viscountess Cluett said, drawing herself up. I find that I am not at ease being on my own in London. I am sure that you have heard my own circumstances are greatly reduced, but I am able to live comfortably on the interest from my own settlement, if I am careful and modest with it. I have never been good at being on my own, and find myself wanting companionship. I'm not entirely sure I understand. Kitty said cautiously. I am in need of a lady's companion, someone that will accompany me when I am to venture out into society. You will also be responsible for more genteel needs when at home, the Viscountess continued. I must warn you that I cannot pay you a great salary, but you shall have a small allowance and a small stipend for appropriate dresses. This last statement was made with an eye toward Kitty's pastel confection that she was currently wearing. In time, you may save enough to invest and live on your own modest means, or even to entice a vicar into marriage. Kitty simply stared for a moment, sure that she could not possibly be hearing properly. Lady Veronica, the Viscountess Cluett, was offering her employment in her household. It was too absurd for words. The very notion of working in the home that Lord Cluett had lived in, eating where he had eaten, being among his things. That brought Kitty up short. She had no illusions that it would be a trying thing indeed to work for the Viscountess, doubly so because something in the colour of her eyes was so like Lord Cluett's that it made Kitty's heart a little sore. Still, could she really pass up such an opportunity not only to escape a loveless, miserable marriage to a loveless, miserable man, but also to be somehow nearer to her dear Seth. Slowly, she stood as well, her heart pounding in her ears. It was a very big decision that she was faced with, one that would be irrevocable once made. If she cast her lot in with the Viscountess, she would henceforth be known as a lady's companion, she would not be a servant, but she would be considered as having taken quite a tumble down the social ladder. Would it be worth it? Kitty asked herself, biting her lip just a little as she thought. Casting her eyes about herself as if something would provide a clear answer for her, she caught sight of the Baron through one of the large windows. Even from this distance, the scowl on his face was visible. As a footman passed, Kitty could see the Baron rapping on the floor with his cane to summon the servant, jabbing one bony finger at the poor young man. Involuntarily, her face became pinched. 
She could not imagine spending five minutes with the odious man, never mind the whole of her life. Without flinching, she met the Viscountess's gaze, nodding her head. I would be happy to accept, she said, her voice firm and resolute. The Viscountess stared down at her, not quite smiling, but something very like. Very well. I shall give you to the end of the week to farewell your parents. Should you have any appropriate dresses, you may bring them with you. I shall expect you no later than nine o'clock on Saturday morning. After drawing out a card from her reticule and passing it to Kitty, the Viscountess withdrew without another word. In the dull light in the garden, Kitty held the card gingerly between the fingers of one gloved hand. She tilted it toward the light, catching the embossed letters. Oh, good Lord, what have I just done? Kitty asked herself, the full implication of what she had agreed to settling on her shoulders like a stony mantle. Her parents would, without question, be furious with her. Glancing up, Kitty caught sight of the Baron again. This time, her parents were standing with him, her father leaning close and listening to something the Baron was saying. Mrs Johnson, no doubt trying to spot Kitty, looked about herself. By chance, she caught Kitty's gaze and tried to subtly beckon her inside. Kitty found herself almost obeying automatically, but checked herself, her free hand clenching into a fist so tight that she could feel her fingernails biting into her palm, even through the pink silk of her glove. No, mother, she softly apologised to herself, but I shall soon be my own woman. If she could not have the happy ending that she had hoped for, dreamed of, then, at the very least, Kitty Johnson would be responsible for her own fate. Chapter 9 Kitty had never been one for novel reading, so she had very little in the way of romantic notions regarding her new position. She'd seen her fair share of ladies' companions, after all, always at the fringes of this party or that ball, she had assumed that it would not be any more difficult than anything else she had done in her life. After all, how hard could it be to keep a widow entertained? As Kitty quickly learned, it could be very, very difficult indeed. Though the Viscountess had spoken to her openly and with a degree of kindness at the party, Kitty was woefully unprepared for the reality of her situation. She had already endured the lecturing of her father, the histronics of her mother, and farewelled the comeliest of her gowns. She had, perhaps naively, believed that this would be the worst of it. The Cluett House was still officially in mourning, and was a dark and dreary place when Kitty arrived. The drapes were pulled firmly against the light of day, the door shut tight against unannounced visitors. There was scant sign of life when Kitty walked hesitatingly up to the front door, even the quiet tapping of her boots on the front steps, sounding obtrusively loud. She had nearly turned around and fled, her hand halting as she reached for the bell pull. No, she said to herself firmly, I have come this far. Boldness is the only way forward. And so she had been admitted by a butler, with a butler's innate suspicion of new members of the household. The house was silent within as well, tomb-like. There were scant few servants, with a footman and a maid hauling Kitty's trunk up the stairs for her. On that very first morning in the Cluette house, Kitty had no time to take in her surroundings properly. She knew that if she began to look around, she would be overwhelmed by memories of Seth, and then it would be all over for her. She focused all of her attention on the butler's back as he glided in front of her, showing her the way to the drawing room where the Viscountess awaited her. Ah, at last, the Viscountess said after Kitty had been announced. I was beginning to despair of you. Kitty glanced to the clock over the mantel, a gilded affair that ticked away steadily. It is only a quarter past nine, Kitty pointed out in her own defence. That is correct, the Viscountess said, her eyes sharpening on Kitty. Punctuality is of the greatest import. To be late shows is to be disrespectful and slothful. I cannot abide either. I assume that this shall be the last time I will need to instruct you on your point. Yes, my lady, Kitty replied. 
she was beginning to suspect that this would be the safest mode of answer while she resided under the Viscountess's roof. The Viscountess produced a pair of spectacles in a silver frame, mounted on a silver filigreed stick. Come closer, Miss Johnson. Let us have a closer look at you. Kitty obliged, stepping forward and straightening her posture, turning her eyes heavenward as was expected. The Viscountess rose, circling Kitty like a vulture, or a hound that has cornered a fox. She still wore black crepe, which rustled as she stalked slowly about Kitty, who swallowed a little nervously. I see that you entertain a fondness for ribbons and trimmings, the Viscountess said, pursing her lips at Kitty's bonnet. Self-consciously, Kitty reached up to pat her bonnet, worried for a moment that she had automatically selected one of her more modish ones. She was a little perplexed then, to find that it was one of plain felted wool, a dove grey colour. True enough, it was lined in a soft pink satin, but it sported only the one ribbon about the crown and a matching cockade at one ear. It was shockingly understated, for Kitty at least. Your police is serviceable enough, the Viscountess continued, though I am not sure if I approve of such a quantity of decoration on it either. If you must entertain Sutash in such an amount in the future, you will ensure that it is black or another muted colour. I shan't have any gold braiding in this house unless it is on an officer. Kitty glanced down, having worn her dark mauve pelisse, the soutache looping around the double row of buttons on her bust and down the front, split of the skirt portion. The notion that it could be considered overmuch was beyond Kitty, who lived for all manner of ruffles and frippery. The Viscountess instructed Kitty to remove her pelisse, which she did, and laid it on a satin-striped settee. When she straightened back up, the Viscountess was gazing at her with lips pursed in disapproval. Self-consciously, Kitty pulled herself up, lifting her chin proudly. It was true that her dress was a cheerful printed cotton, but the pattern was small and subtle, and there were only three flounces at the hem. Her chemisette was an effusion of lace and pintucks, it was true, but the collar was respectably high. As I am sure you recall, we are a house in mourning, the Viscountess said, standing before Kitty, with her hands level with her waist, her fingers steepled. I do not object if you have no wish to join us in full mourning, she continued, making it clear from her expression that she considered this a great condescension in deference to Kitty's own feelings. I, myself, still have some months to go before half mourning, but I do fault you if you wish to don greys and lavender. The Viscountess began to pace slowly about the room, stately and firm in a way that was incongruous with her soft hands and floral scent that trailed behind her in a cloud. Kitty could feel her exhilaration at finding some sort of independence waning. She was not sure what she had expected, but she had hoped that she might be able to find some sort of common ground with the Viscountess. Kitty was a firm believer of the special kinship between women and took her friendships with her lady friends seriously. It was her hope that, Accounting for the Viscountess's loss of her husband and departure of her son, that she would find a kind soul that she could commiserate with. However, it is imperative that you understand the sort of household that we are. We do not engage in needless ornamentation. When called upon, the quality and elegance of our gowns will speak to our position on their own, the Viscountess said, pausing before a window. The heavy drapes were pulled to the outside world, but a shaft of sunlight lanced through the gap between them, highlighting a strip of the Viscountess's face. She must have been a great beauty once, Kitty thought, and now she haunts this house all on her own. A rueful smile crossed Kitty's face. Well, not on her own any longer. Despite her misgivings, Kitty couldn't help but feel a measure of pity for the Viscountess. I presume that I shan't need to repeat this particular homily in the future, yes? The Viscountess asked, her head turning sharply and unexpectedly to catch Kitty's gaze. It was a little startling, like watching a falcon's head whip around when it heard the squeak of a mouse. Yes, my lady, Kitty replied quickly. Good. 
You should know that I begin my day early, sleeping no later than six o'clock when not entertaining. Remaining abed when there is much to be done points to slothfulness and reeks of Parisian excess. Kitty suppressed a groan, for there was little that she hated more than having to rise with the rooster's crow. It seemed particularly nonsensical, given that the Viscountess couldn't exactly entertain, nor would she be expecting callers. Your duties will be minimal, but I do expect you to be available whenever I may have need of you. We shall take our meals together, save breakfast, which I take in my private room. As is my right, the Viscountess finished succinctly. Her journey around the room had brought her back face to face with Kitty, who stared at her with what she hoped was a benign expression. There was something unreadable in the Viscountess's face, almost a kind of wistfulness, nostalgia even, that was frankly befuddling to Kitty. Is all of this perfectly understood? The Viscountess inquired, one dark brow rising. Yes, my lady, Kitty answered automatically. This is becoming easier than I thought, she added privately. No, that is entirely too formal. You are not a servant, after all. Here, in private, you may address me as Lady Veronica. I will naturally introduce you as Miss Johnson, but at home you shall be uh, the Viscountess, Lady Veronica, if you please, trailed off, clearly waiting for Kitty to fill in the blank. Kitty, she supplied quickly. The Viscountess's face became pinched, her nostrils flaring a little as if she had smelled something unpalatable. Oh, heavens, no, that will never do. You are not some barnyard feline, for goodness sake. Lady Veronica paused. I presume that is short for Catherine, yes? Kitty nodded. Yes, though I don't think anyone has addressed me as Catherine since I left the baptismal font. All of my friends and family have always called me Kitty. Lady Veronica gave her a withering look. What a charming anecdote, Catherine she said nonplussed. For about the dozenth time that morning, Kitty resisted the urge to sigh. Very good, Lady Veronica. Was there anything else, or might I be dismissed so that I can unpack? I am not sure of what use that shall be. We'll have to take you to a seamstress to have some more suitable dresses made, Lady Veronica said, her expression souring a little. But I have no need of you just yet. She turned to leave the drawing room, leaving Kitty to her own devices. The Viscountess paused at the doorway and spoke again without bothering to turn and face Kitty properly. You shall also be responsible for seeing to Quincy's needs. His dainty needs, even. Quincy? Who is Quincy, if I might ask? Kitty could feel her eyebrows shooting up her forehead. John? You may bring Quincy in now, Lady Veronica called out into the hall. A footman appeared at the doorway, doing his level best to uphold the dignity of his position and his person, as he bore into the room a velvet padded cushion. On this cushion was a massive tuft of flaxen fur with two shining black eyes, staring out of it and a round dainty nose. When the creature spotted Lady Veronica, he opened his mouth and a little pink tongue lolled out as he panted happily at his mistress. This is my dear Quincy, Lady Veronica said, laying a gentle hand on the dog's head. Kitty could only stare, for she had never seen such an effusion of hair on any living creature. She half doubted that there were any legs to be seen on it, presuming that it merely scooted along like an excitable mop. My son gifted him to me before he left for the Americas she continued, a flicker of emotion quickly passing over her face. Kitty, of course, knew that it was quite fashionable, expected even, for ladies to have little dogs to help keep them company. Kitty had never personally seen the allure of them, finding them generally to be an excitable, yappy lot, prone to sniffing and gambling about one's ankles. Much like young bucks freshly down from school and out on the town for the first time, Kitty had said more than once upon observing the wee beasties. John here has been looking after Quincy, haven't you? Lady Veronica asked, smiling up at the footman. Yes, my lady, the footman answered, looking a little pained beneath his handsome green livery. 
you'll be pleased to know, John, that Miss Catherine here shall be attending to Quincy from this point onward. You will be good enough to explain to her the particulars of his care and keeping, yes? Yes, my lady, the footman answered again, though this time there was a slightly more gleeful cast to his face, a certain lightning as if a terrible burden had been lifted. But you will miss dear Quincy, won't you, John? You've grown rather close these last weeks, the Viscountess said, patting the dog's head again. Yes, my lady, the footman responded a third time, though Kitty could hear the hesitation this time. Well, I shall leave the two of you to become better acquainted. Quincy, be kind to Miss Catherine. She will hopefully be with us for some time, Lady Veronica admonished the pup gently. Having thus apparently met her quota for affection, the Viscountess departed. When she was out of earshot, Kitty took a chance, stepping closer to the footman. It can't really be as bad as all that, can it? He's such a little dog, after all, Kitty whispered. The footman, breaking his professional servant's stare, looked down balefully at Kitty. If you say so, miss. With that, he thrust the dog, cushion and all, at Kitty, who narrowly avoided dropping both. By the time she had recovered, John the footman had also tactfully vanished. Well, we're off to a grand start, aren't we, Quincy? Kitty muttered. The dog twisted his unseen neck around, staring at Kitty. I suppose we shall have to hope that we get along better than um, a, a typical dog and Kitty, yes. Quincy contemplated that for a moment, then issued forth a tiny snarling bark. Kitty finally allowed herself the sigh that she had been repressing for the entire meeting. Well, at least it cannot possibly get any worse than this, Kitty thought grimly. Chapter 10 By Kitty's second day at the Viscountess's house, it had become quite clear that what Lady Veronica craved was not so much someone to speak with, but rather someone to speak to. Kitty could empathise with this to a degree. It must have been frightfully lonely, alone in the house with only a few servants to provide any kind of human contact. But she also could not help but think that Lady Veronica was also the author of her own misery, at least in part. Though she could not receive callers, no pay calls when she was this deep in mourning, there were still no cards sent no little gifts or tokens of those who wished to pay their compliments. It was clear that she was well and truly isolated, and it was not even a little bit of a mystery to Kitty as to why. Lady Veronica was the sort of accomplished woman of the ton who knew exactly the correct thing to say and do at all times, and expected everyone to follow her advice. It did not matter what the subject was, nor whether or not Lady Veronica could boast of any experience in that particular area. If she felt that she had the correct way of doing things in her pocket, then everyone present would be informed accordingly. It was hardly surprising then that Lady Veronica's loneliness began to infect Kitty. It was not simply the withdrawal from society, though that was hard enough for a bright young thing like Kitty. It was also that she had absolutely no one in her new place to speak with. Lady Veronica was heartily disinterested, preferring it when Kitty offered only flattering comments or simple agreement, which could scarcely be called a conversation. Kitty could not converse with the servants either, not in a real way. She was not as snobbish as some members of the ton, who scarcely considered the staff better than animals, but she had absolutely nothing relevant to say to them. It was not helped by the fact that she slept in a room upstairs among the family's apartments. She did not eat with them, either. On the rare occasions that she had to venture downstairs into their domain, such as when she was going to walk Quincy in the garden, conversation would pointedly cease whenever her presence was noted. They would keep their heads down, bent over their respective tasks, but Kitty occasionally caught them giving her sidelong looks. The usual routine of the day was that, after an excruciatingly early breakfast, Kitty would quietly tiptoe upstairs and attempt to coax Quincy out of Lady Veronica's bed as the lady's maid brought her tray in. After seeing to Quincy's morning necessities, Kitty would return him, whereupon he would take up position at the side of Lady Veronica's bed. 
No earthly force could move him then, for it was a prime opportunity for him to beg for pieces of toast and ham. As Lady Veronica ate, it was Kitty's task to help her sort through her mail, opening envelopes and reading the missives. There were very few of a social nature, more often being demands for payment. This was Kitty's favourite and most dreaded task of the day. It was a fun indulgence of her love of gossip to be privy to the private workings of another, but she also found herself hoping against hope that there would be a letter from Seth. Each time one arrived, Kitty silently despaired. This particular morning was predictably grey and damp, given that it was nearly December. There was scarcely a sign of impending Christmas cheer in the Cluette house, which did not help with Kitty's feelings of impending despair. She longed to simply return to her bed and burrow into the blankets until spring. This was impossible, however, so she kept her perch on a straight back chair at the foot of Lady Veronica's bed. And this one is from the Dowager Duchess of Brandon, Kitty said, passing over a letter for Lady Veronica to inspect. The Dowager, the Viscountess said, sitting a little more upright, pulling her bed jacket a little tighter about herself. She accepted the envelope, holding it closer so that she might inspect the seal. Kitty had no idea why this was such an integral part of the mail opening ritual, but there was no getting around it. It wasn't as if she was simply inventing the letter senders. Well, we had best find out what she wants, Lady Veronica continued, passing the letter back to Kitty. With a pearl-handled letter opener, Kitty sliced neatly past the seal. She scanned the page quickly, knowing that Lady Veronica would only wish to know the most pertinent lines. The Dowager wishes to convey her well wishes, and also her sympathies, as she knows what it is to be aggrieved by widowhood. Lady Veronica snorted, a harsh exhalation through her nose. Of course she does. She made an entire career out of mourning a dead husband, she scoffed. Reaching for a crust of toast, she dangled it over the side of the bed. Obligingly, Quincy danced about on his hind legs the moment that food came into view. It must have been doubly hard on the dowager, though, Kitty mused. Oh, and why is that? Lady Veronica inquired. Because she and the Duke were so very fond of each other, hmm? There was an unmistakable edge of warning in her voice. Instantly, Kitty knew that she was in dangerous territory. It was not exactly a secret that the late Viscount Clouette and his lady wife were not particularly well suited. No, Kitty said carefully, because the dowager's colouring is all wrong for black. She can't carry it off. Lady Veronica stared at Kitty for a moment. Quincy temporarily forgotten. As if cornered by a predator, Kitty knew that it was of the utmost importance that she not flinch or show any hesitation at this moment. Nonchalantly, she began idly flipping through the rest of the unopened letters, attempting to put them in some kind of order of importance. Quincy, tired of all the dithering, turned in a quick circle and gamely leapt upward as far as his stubby little legs would allow. His teeth closed around the toast crust, and triumphantly he pulled it from Lady Veronica's hand. This was all that was needed to break the tension, and she glanced down to not actually scold him. Kitty let out a breath she was not aware that she had been holding. I cannot decide if you are a very stupidly clever girl or a very cleverly stupid girl sometimes. Lady Veronica sighed, stroking the fuzz on Quincy's back. Kitty clenched her teeth to stop herself from saying anything further. The wind picked up in the silence, a draught coming down the chimney and nearly smothering the small fire in the grate. Kitty leapt up, taking the poker and trying to stir some life back into the embers. I despise days like today, Lady Veronica said. Kitty glanced at her and saw that the Viscountess was staring out the window, her eyes distant. It always puts such fear into me for my son. I pray hourly for calm seas for him. Kitty's efforts with the fire slowed, her own heart squeezing, her mouth going dry. It was hard for her to remember sometimes, frequently, that Lady Veronica was Seth's mother. They were so different in personality and looks that it was easy to forget. 
where Lady Veronica was exact, precise, and given to talking at any opportunity. Seth was quieter, more thoughtful, introspective even. It would have been easy for someone who did not know him to assume that he was simple, but Kitty had instantly recognised that it was more that he observed too much. Regardless, Kitty was once again moved to empathy for Lady Veronica. It was hard to hold a grudge against her when it was clear that much of her churlishness was born of her worry for her darling boy. If anyone in the world could understand what it was like to lose Seth, it was Kitty. For the dozenth time, Kitty lamented the fact that she could not openly commiserate with the Viscountess. I asked Colonel Smythe how long the crossing took, Lady Veronica continued, reaching up to idly fiddle with the satin ribbon that kept her cap on her head. He said that it might be done inside of a month if the weather favours them. A month, Kitty repeated silently, an entire month in the middle of the sea, at the whims of the sea and sky. An acute fear prickled in her stomach. A glance to Lady Veronica showed that her own thoughts were turned in this direction, judging by the te te tense set of her profile. Kitty took a deep, shaking breath. She had a duty now, a place that she must earn. She could not afford to be a lovesick girl any longer. Then I will be grateful for these strong winds, she said at last. Lady Veronica's head snapped toward Kitty, who stood before the fire, not having resumed her seat. Such was the fiery scrutiny in Lady Veronica's eyes that Kitty nearly backed away from her point. She took a deep breath and soldiered on. It is possible, likely even, that they will push your son's ship onward faster. The sooner he is landed in Canada, the sooner he might return to you. Lady Veronica continued to stare at Kitty, as if she were weighing her words. Kitty did not flinch, but met the Viscountess's gaze levelly. She suspected that this would be the first of many tests in her time with Lady Veronica. At last, the Viscountess relented, turning her attention back down to Quincy, who was still awkwardly chewing the toast crust. The sound of his tiny jaws working, punctuated by intermittent little snorts of greed, somewhat underscored the gravity of the moment. While I appreciate the sentiment, I do hope that this does not indicate that you are prone to flights of fancy, Lady Veronica said. I cannot abide an overactive imagination. Not at all, Kitty said, shifting the poker to her right hand and giving one last, final jab to the fire, perhaps more vigorously than was strictly required. It was merely an attempt to alleviate some of your suffering. Well, Lady Veronica shifted a little, adjusting a shawl about her shoulders, brushing invisible crumbs from her bed jacket. That is enough shilly-shallying for one day, I think. Make yourself ready post-haste. We must do something about your wardrobe. I am going to develop a headache if I must look at those garish prints of yours any longer. Kitty, as was becoming an all-too-familiar custom, glanced down at her dress. It was a lavender cotton day dress, the bust pleated becomingly, and the skirt festooned with a block print that grew more concentrated nearer the hem. The sleeves were long, as was proper, but had fun little puffs at the shoulders. And stop attempting to skewer the fire, the Viscountess admonished irritably. If it needs to be made up again, ring for the scullery to do it properly. As you say, Lady Veronica, Kitty said, turning toward the fire. She replaced the poker in its proper place, feeling a bit like she had been disarmed and lost her Excalibur. Quietly, she withdrew from the Viscountess's room so that her lady's maid might attend to the mistress. Despite the Viscountess's prohibition against any sort of creative imaginings, and despite the fact that Kitty had never been prone to flights of fancy, it was a little impossible for her not to envision herself as a knight engaged in some long protracted battle against a gnarled old dragon. Chapter 11 you cannot just call yourself a modiste if you are not prepared to take on the duties of a modiste, Matilda, Lady Veronica huffed. 
the questionable modiste in question, Matilda, was looking flustered, her hands pulling the measuring tape tight between them. Kitty, who was shivering in her chemise, stays and petticoat, had a brief moment where she thought that the modiste, driven to madness by the Viscountess's impossible demands, was going to garrote Lady Veronica with the tape measure. Don't do it, Kitty almost said. It is most difficult to get repeat business if one's clients are all strangled. The modiste relaxed her hands finally, though her jaw remained clenched. Perhaps, my lady, if you might explain more clearly what it is that is lacking in the plates I have shown you. Lady Veronica sighed from her seat in the fitting area. Kitty eyed her warm spencer and the steaming cup of tea next to her with envy. She had been stripped down for nearly an hour now, as the modiste took her measurements, and then had nearly emptied her shelves, showing toilers of different sleeves and bodices that she could make. As she slid each piece onto Kitty, their eyes met, and they shared a silent prayer that this one would finally be the one that satisfied. It really is very simple, Lady Veronica said, enunciating each word clearly. My companion requires a few new dresses, something more appropriate to wear for her new position, and in a house that is still mourning. Well, I can assure you that all of the designs that I have shown you are... Matilda began. Please save your sales patter, Lady Veronica interrupted. We know precisely what it is that we are here for, and if you cannot provide precisely that, then we shall simply take our business elsewhere. Kitty, who was concentrating on wrapping her arms about herself without being obtrusive, could see the modiste stiffen. If you would be so kind as to explain, then what is wrong with this sleeve block then? Matilda said, a smile on her face, but her words somewhat muffled by gritted teeth. She held up another sleeve, sliding it up onto Kitty's arm. As you can see, the head is generously cut, which is then gathered to a jaunty puff, which will be... I believe I already said I do not require the shop girl routine, Lady Veronica interjected once again. She spoke calmly, the sharpness of her words only enhanced by her level tone. We also do not require any frills, ruffles or other such nonsense. Lady Veronica paused, her lip curling upward slightly. And we especially do not require any jauntiness, in puffed sleeves or otherwise. You must understand, my lady, Matilda ground out, there is a coming fashion for puffed sleeves. Indeed, it is nigh impossible to find a fashionable lady who will entertain any other sort. If the plates coming from France are any indication, I believe it likely they shall only be expanding not shrinking. It is a fortunate thing, then, Lady Veronica responded, nonplussed by Matilde's evident irritation, that I am not a feather-brained debutante in my first season, eager to follow the latest fashions. No, I shan't be moved to engage in such a nonsensical scam. It is merely a way to be forced into buying more fabric. Despite Mr Johnson's reassurances to the Baron, that memory alone was enough to set Kitty to shuddering again. Kitty had been given more than a cursory education. As such, she had a small understanding of the natural world. In one intriguing volume, written in a language she could not begin to understand, there was an illustration of a fish that, when provoked, inflated itself in the most remarkable manner. This is precisely the action that Matilda appeared to undertake. Somehow, the rather daintily built modiste seemed to be puffing up. It did not take a genius, scientific or otherwise, to understand that she was boiling up for a row. Kitty could feel what little warmth there was in her face draining away. She didn't think she could stand another fitting, left standing in the cold air of a shop's back room, as Lady Veronica argued. Perhaps, Kitty said quickly, hoping to head off the worst of it, you might be able to locate some of your... Kitty paused, her tongue catching on the word old. She had no wish to needlessly poke at the Viscountess's vanity, which she knew was considerable. Some of your classic designs, the ones that offer a sleeker, more practical silhouette, she suggested. Matilde, who had been glaring with poorly disguised irritation at the Viscountess, glanced to Kitty. 
At this opening, Kitty sent her a pleading look. She was quickly reaching the point where she frankly didn't care what she would be wearing. A most dire sign, indeed. She simply wanted to be able to put her own dress back on. As it was, she had to wiggle her stocking toes just to ensure that they were still there, as they were in danger of going quite numb. I shall see what I have at the bottom of our catalogue, Matilda said at last. She vanished through a velvet curtain into a further back room, likely where the cutting was done. There was a distinct sound of a glass bottle hitting something, and Kitty could easily envision the poor, abused Matilda pouring herself a quick sniff of gin. Honestly, I do not understand why it is so hard for these people to understand what it is that is being asked of them. Lady Veronica sniffed, picking a bit of lint from her brushed wool pelisse. Of course, we haven't had a seamstress of any competence in London since the Golden Butterfly closed down. Kitty looked up sharply. You mean the Duchess of Brandon's shop? Lady Veronica made a face as if she had bit into a pickled onion when she had expected it to be a strawberry. Well, her adopted mother at least. The Duchess always had too much of a flair for the fantastical. She made the most charming veil and gloves for her sister when she was wed, Kitty offered. Lady Patience? Yes, little wisp of a thing. The Dowager made such a great fuss over giving the girl her freedom, letting her be her own woman, so... You would think she had invented motherhood. Honestly, she did right in keeping that girl tightly in check. Now that she's married and been loosed on London, she's sponsoring more theatre troops and dancers than a petticoat-chasing lord down for the season. Kitty could only stare. She knew that it would not only be pointless, but also likely to endanger her position if she were to point out that her dearest friend in the world was the new female lead of one such dance troupe. She bit her tongue and swallowed the words, rubbing her arms briskly. At the conclusion of the fitting, after a somewhat more red-cheeked Matilda returned with the requested sleeve block, Kitty had three new dresses of such a plain make as to be depressing. She couldn't understand why the Viscountess went to such trouble, considering that her own means were quite restricted these days, it was nonsensical, and Kitty simply chalked it up to the whims of a wealthy and powerful woman who had no other means of exerting control. Several days later, the first dress was delivered. It was a polished cotton day dress in slate grey that tended toward the cool end of the spectrum. As requested, the sleeves were closely fitted, with nary an embellishment to be seen. The skirt was likewise plain, though cut full to allow for easy movement. Lady Veronica had generously allowed that many of Kitty's chemisettes and partlets were acceptable, provided that they were not distractingly frilly. It was not required that she wear one at all times, but it had taken only a single withering look at her décolletage from Lady Veronica for Kitty to make them a permanent fixture. Gone too were Kitty's romantic and carefree hair coiffures as well. Lady Veronica had no patience for the loose piles of hair on top of the head, the curls that fell becomingly down the neck and across the forehead. I shan't have you going about looking like a Parisian artist model that has just tumbled out of bed, Lady Veronica had admonished. She did not even approve of ribbons being used, but allowed them for Kitty, given the thickness and natural curl. So, there was Kitty, lover of fashion, coveter of elegant shoes in silks and satins, who believed firmly that her wardrobe should resemble a cake as much as possible, standing before the mirror in her own tiny dressing room. She did not recognise this strange girl who stood in the reflection. Tentatively, she touched the plain skirt that hung from the high waist of her dress. No colourful ribbon served as a belt to accentuate her curves. Instead, there was only a strip of the same fabric, which was now knotted practically at her back. No, bow. Her face looked pale and vaguely sallow in this colour, and her hair was scraped back oddly from her face, with only a few tiny curls allowed at her forehead, the rest being pinned back. It changed her bone structure somehow, undermining her naturally round cheeks that were made for smiling and giggling. Lady Veronica knocked once, and then admitted herself. 
When she saw Kitty standing before the mirror, her transformation complete, she smiled. Kitty was very nearly more disturbed by that than her own altered appearance. She could not remember seeing the Viscountess smile with such genuine happiness before. Clearly pleased, she came to stand just beside Kitty, one hand across her back to her right shoulder, her other hand gripping Kitty's left shoulder. There, Lady Veronica said, her voice thick with satisfaction. Don't you look the picture of propriety. Do you not find this more becoming than looking like some kind of piped cream pastry? She demanded. Kitty turned her attention back to her reflection. Her pale green eyes were shining, and Kitty stubbornly willed herself to not be overwrought over something so silly. She watched herself swallow hard, the motion of her throat lost behind the high neck of her chemisette. Her first thought was to answer that, with her dark hair and dark dress, she looked like nothing so much as an inverted exclamation mark. Kitty resisted the impulse and took in a wider view of herself. It was impossible to ignore the Viscountess in the reflection now, and Kitty's eyes flicked back and forth between them. Though Lady Veronica's dress was black, the cut was nearly identical. Her hair, too, was similarly severe, though the effect was somewhat softened by her white cap. Looking between them, it was impossible to miss the new similarities. Oh, Kitty thought, realisation dawning. She did not need just a companion. She needs someone to remake in her own image. She's searching for a child to replace the one that is far away. Though the make of the dress was simple, there was no denying that it was made of fine fabric, a thick silesia that hung beautifully. Kitty frowned just a little, a small line appearing between her eyebrows as she brushed a hand over the skirt again. The clue at household was meant to be economising. Resources were limited. There was no telling what had to be sacrificed in order for Kitty to be outfitted. She looked again to the Viscountess, noting that the ribbon at her cap was fading a little, showing wear and age. She sacrificed her own dress allowance for me, Kitty realised suddenly. Understanding hit her like a thunderbolt. The Viscountess could not be such a hard-hearted autocrat as she liked to pretend to be, if she were willing to forego her own vanity in order to clothe Kitty. Kitty swallowed her own misgivings and looked outside of herself with new perspective. This was the first time that Lady Veronica had been induced to showing Kitty anything remotely resembling physical affection. Her face, too, showed a contented sort of pleasure, a satisfaction in a job well done by her reckoning. I confess that I do not recognise this new Ki Catherine, Kitty began, but I am curious to know her better. Perhaps she has something new to offer the world that the old one did not. Lady Veronica nodded her approval before slowly withdrawing. Kitty waited until the door to her room had softly closed behind the Viscountess to sigh a little. She had not lied, not precisely. Kitty examined her reflection again, clasping her hands below her waist, as she had seen the Viscountess do from time to time, elbows lightly flexed. It was a posture that marked one out as, from an older generation, when skirts were wider and held aloft with great panniers. It was a striking moment of mortality for Kitty, who had never really given consideration to the fact that she too would one day no longer be fresh-faced and young, out of step with the current fashions, her manners antiquated. As the Viscountess had no specific tasks for Kitty for the rest of the evening, she was left to her own devices after dinner. This suited Kitty just fine, as she was still reeling from the overwhelming weight of such profound introspection. Life had ever been simple for her, and her desires had likewise been simple. Beautiful dresses, beautiful men, beautiful little cakes. Her only truly defining features had been her propensity for humour and a streak of fierce loyalty, particularly where her friends were concerned. Though the evening was quickly sinking into a cold winter's night, Kitty found herself wandering out to the garden. It was rather bare at this time of year, and the plants that were left were looking ragged and scraggly, escaping their bounds one twig at a time. The gardener had been quietly dismissed, sacrificed to the shrinking budget. 
it was not exactly a primeval forest, but Kitty could not help but wonder about Seth, so far away in a wild land. Her breath came out in little foggy clouds, and a strange fear went through. She prayed that Seth had been warm enough on his Atlantic crossing. She could scarcely bear the thought of him cold and shivering on some miserable hulk of a ship. She had not bothered with a Spencer or police, merely pulling a thick shawl about her shoulders. Despite her misgivings about the Viscountess's taste, she had to credit her. Kitty was not overly chilled in her new, thicker, more practical dress. With the addition of a quilted petticoat, she would be able to endure even cooler temperatures. She glanced about the neglected garden again. Oh, good Lord, Kitty groaned inwardly, her eyes fluttering closed. She was not worried about me outshining her, or only that I would look inappropriate alongside her. She did not want me to be cold. Kitty's eyes opened, and she looked to the house. It was a point of pride among the wealthy of London to put a candlestick in each window, showing that they could afford to light rooms that they were not even in. The windows were all dark at the Cluett house, save the Viscountess's bedroom, and the low windows of the kitchens and servants' hall that barely peeked above the ground. The price of wood and coal was not going to get any cheaper, and it was entirely possible that the house would be quite chilly this winter. She supposed that the Viscountess was very used to ordering the world about her, including her son. This was not done out of some desire to be a tyrant, but merely because she cared too much rather than too little. It was Kitty's lot to fill this place now. She could not even begin to contemplate what it had been like for Lady Veronica to be left without anyone to care for. Tilting her head back, Kitty saw the first stars blinking to light in the growing night that spread overhead like spilled ink. Kitty's ad hoc education had included a bit about the celestial bodies. She knew some of the constellations, and that they moved about the sky in specific patterns. Most of all, she knew what the northern star was and its significance to those who had to navigate uncharted waters or lands. It was easy to spot even through the haze of London air, shining brightly. With her eyes never leaving the star for the first time since his departure, Kitty wished fervently for Seth's swift and safe return, but not for herself. She willed him back to more familiar shores for the Viscountess. Chapter 12 Shun, shun, all a man, tist and shun. Seth's body was awake and moving before his mind even registered the fact that he was actually awake. He apparently had attempted to sit up, but found himself pressed back, falling back down roughly, his head hitting something with a painful thunk. He blinked against the pain, cautiously reaching up to rub at the sore spot. As he came more fully to wakefulness, he remembered more of where he was. He had been dreaming, and the dream still lingered in bits and pieces, which did not help his befuddled state. His eyes cleared, and he saw the reason why he had not been successful at sitting upright. There was canvas stretched taut a scant few inches from his face, sunlight filtering through weakly. Of course, he thought groggily, working one fist up to rub in his eyes. He had been so bone-tired the night before that he had simply crawled into the back of one of the wagons in the travelling party he had joined, and apparently fallen asleep as easily as a babe. It was not a difficult thing to imagine, as the wagon had rocked him in a most pleasing manner as it travelled down the back country trail, his person pressed in comfortingly on all sides by all manner of cargo. The canvas tarp had provided not only a shield from the sunlight, but also a small amount of insulation. Unfortunately, he also shared his sleeping space with a crate of chickens. The moment they heard voices, this set them off to clucking and cawing, directly next to Seth's right ear. He turned to stare at them balefully, and was rewarded by one of the hens taking umbrage with his pertness and pecking him directly on the nose. Youch, he said, rubbing at his sore nose his fingers finding the little dent the vicious beast's beak had made. You, Bjornsson, time to rise, it is Trick Vorwarts. 
the voice called again, nearer. With a last withering glance at the hen, Seth began the delicate task of extricating himself as quickly as possible. He shimmied and slid his way down the wooden planks of the wagon until his feet emerged and he slipped out, landing awkwardly on his boot heels like a newborn calf. The bright light made him squint and he put a hand to his forehead until his vision adjusted. As always, it was a shock to his system to open his eyes on a landscape that was so completely foreign to anything he had ever seen before. The road they travelled was scarcely more than an animal or old trading trail, hemmed in on all sides by pine trees. Beyond the trees was all shadow, with nary a beam of sun penetrating through to the forest floor. It was unnerving, and Seth spent more than a little amount of time contemplating how someone could just walk into the trees and vanish. He had no time to contemplate such fancies just now, however. The party he was travelling with had come to a halt. It was a strange, motley group, a family of at least a dozen Germans, a trio of either Swedish or Norwegian brothers, either their sister or cousin, a few men from Cornwall, who were on their way to work the mines and Seth. There were four wagons, each pulled by a pair of sullen oxen, each of them piled high with everything a new settler could possibly require. There were pieces of furniture waiting to be reassembled, dishes, endless bolts of fabric, and, to the pride of the patriarch of the German clan, several glass windows to be fitted into cabins or farmhouses. They were wrapped carefully in layers of fabric and covered with straw to protect them from the rough jostling of the dirt roads. After every hill or stream crossing, one of the family would cautiously, almost reverently check on the windows, lifting a corner of their covering carefully. The rest of the clan would wait anxiously, hands clasped or twisted into aprons and collectively exhale with relief, sometimes clapping. Seth could not begin to understand their odd affection for these windows, but he accepted it in stride. There was little to entertain on the trail, and the entire group was soon invested in the fate of the windows, sighing and smiling when they realised they were still whole. The party had paused at the foot of a hill. It was not especially steep, but it was long, and necessitated fitting the wagons with hill brakes so that they could not roll backward. All of the men fortunate enough to have horses were expected to dismount and help push to take some of the strain from the road-weary oxen. Seth had attained a mule when he had landed in Halifax, a surly and ill-tempered beast that the ostler had seemed far too happy to be rid of. It was only after he'd handed over some of his dwindling supply of banknotes that the ostler had placed a familiar hand on Seth's shoulder and warned him, Now... Daffodil here might be inclined to nipping, but nothing too terrible. So, naturally, it was within the first ten minutes of their knowing each other that Daffodil had decided to test Seth by clamping down on his bicep as fast as a snake. The next time the she-mule tried that trick, right as Shah Seth had joined the caravan, he simply put his hand under her chin before her teeth could make contact with his arm and lifted straight upward. This had apparently disoriented Daffodil so much that she had decided it was not worth the effort and had reduced her vitriol to simply staring at everyone and everything around her with her ears pinned back. Bjornsson, you are ready. Seth shook himself. He was more and more inclined to introspection and reminiscing these days when there was little else to do but watch the scenery go by. The father or possibly grandfather of the Germans was looking at him expectantly his startlingly full beard bristling with the prospect of such a physical task. Slipping from his jacket and throwing it over the saddle of his mule that was tethered to the back of one of the wagons, Seth took up position behind one of the vehicles. To his great pleasure, Seth discovered that he liked being among these people. To a person, they seemed to relish hard work, old and young, men and women alike. By the same token, they all seemed glad to have Seth along. He was pretty sure they referred to him as some sort of bear person, but they said it with such teasing affection that Seth did not mind in the least. It wasn't as if communication was exactly easy anyway. Everyone spoke a different language. 
Ostensibly, the Cornish miners spoke English, but Seth had nearly as much trouble understanding them as he did the Scandinavian brothers. Everyone communicated in a strange mishmash of German and possibly Swedish, with English peppered in. With a shout, the party began up the hill. One person driving, two walking at either side of the front of the wagon, ready to jam in small blocks of wood if the hill brakes failed, so that the wagons in the front would not roll backward into the ones at the rear. The oxen bellowed as the drivers tapped their rumps with switches, trying desperately to build up a good speed before they began their ascent. Ya, brothers, now! Tist shon! The bearded leader called out, and to a man, all those with even a little strength put their shoulders to the carts. Seth did not hesitate, surging forward with the others. It was a strange feeling, this kind of physical work. He had always been a strong, broad-shouldered man, but his time in the frontier was chiselling him into a solid block of muscles. He couldn't help but smile as he laboured, one shoulder pressed tightly against the rear of the wagon. His whole life he had felt simply too big for his life. His hands, like great bricks, felt clumsy and nearly monstrous when he attempted to hold a pen, but they bent startlingly easy to working with tools or chopping wood. Seth's love of disassembling and reassembling clocks and machinery had been a constant source of irritation for his mother. Tinkering again, she would sigh, her face disappointed. Out here, where everything depended on the strength of a man's back and the willingness of his hands to work, Seth felt right at home. His ability to repair the wagons had rendered him indispensable to the settlers. His good nature had endeared him to them. He had adapted to a life of hardship startlingly well. It had been only a matter of hours on the road before he had simply dispensed with his cravat. His feet slipped a little on the dirt as the road inclined, and he nearly stumbled. A hand caught his elbow, steadying him. After righting himself, Seth grinned gratefully up at one of the blonde Norwegians, Swedes, who returned it with a grunt as they redoubled their efforts. The trio of brothers was named Carl, Otto and Sven, but Seth could not begin to establish which was which. He half suspected they traded names back and forth, for a look sometimes came over their faces very much like one that Kitty wore whenever she was about to commit some mischief. Kitty. The thought of Kitty nearly caused him to slip and fall again. Seth had done all that he could to put her from his mind, but she kept sneaking her way back into his consciousness. Though she looked nothing like Kitty, the German clan had a sister or a daughter that tended to throw her head back with a th abandon when she laughed, much as Kitty did. It always stung when she did so. As the days wore into weeks, Seth found himself wishing sometimes that he had asked for a lock of Kitty's hair to take with him. It was a selfish thought, as he had wanted nothing more than to set Kitty free. He could not imagine her here with him, ankle deep in mud and God knew what else, skinning rabbits and starting fires. And yet, a part of him believed that she could adapt. There was something in her, a kind of good-humoured strength that he had little doubt would see her through just about anything. She was much like Seth in that matter, with her natural inclination to meet challenges with a smile and a clever solution. Well, Seth could not always lay claim to a clever solution as such, but he had found that he had a true gift for working with his hands, and that surely counted for something. I wonder if she would even recognise me any more, such as I am in this state, Seth thought grimly. The road was wet, and mud was clumping up around his boots. His hair had grown longer, and, despite his misgivings about German facial hair, he knew that he was in sore need of a razor too. His hands were quickly becoming work-roughened, and the idea of holding one of Kitty's dainty hands in them seemed a little preposterous, almost profane. You daydream, the Norseman said, his left shoulder against the wagon, so that he was facing Seth as they pushed. You think of your auskling, he said. His face, only a scant couple feet from Seth's, was bemused, his sharp cheekbones lifting. I do not, Seth protested. 
He was not entirely sure what the Swede had said, but he knew exactly what he meant. You do, Carl, or was this one Otto, replied firmly. Your eyes go soft. I see it among many men here. See what? Seth asked, shifting his shoulder so that he could bring more of the strength in his legs to bear. Men come, women stay. Everyone is unhappy, a nation full of sighs and longing. The Swede shrugged his free shoulder, then put his hand to the back of the wagon to steady himself better. Sometimes people are reunited, no? What about them? Seth asked, jerking his head a little towards some of the German family. This is true, Carl agreed. It gives us all hope, but makes us despair too. How many of us will see our loves again? He gave another dismissive gesture, as if the idea of a lifetime of loneliness and pining was simply a matter of routine. She is very vacker, yes? She what? Seth blurted, unsure if an insult had just been levelled. Her face, it is... Carl paused, turning about so that his back was to the wagon, his legs bent as he pushed backward uphill. With one hand, he gestured broadly at his own face. Not like your mule, no? I, no, Kitty does not look like a mule, Seth replied a little baffled. I, I think this, Carl nodded sagely. It makes the pain su sweeter, yes? It is always sad to leave a beauty behind. Seth said nothing until they had reached the top of the hill. The weight of the wagon was gradually lifted from his shoulder as the ground levelled out. The party was drawing to a halt at the peak giving both man and beast a chance to recover. Wearily, Seth trudged up the hill, cresting it with Carl a half-step behind him. When they, too, had attained the summit, they were caught like the rest of the party, staring down at the valley before them. It stretched out for miles, acres and acres of trees, pine, maple and oaks with their branches bare, all packed tightly in between rolling hills. A river, sparkling in the setting sun, sliced through the trees in a winding ribbon. Beyond the valley, in the distance, snowy mountains peeked over, their tops shrouded in foggy white. Seth was spellbound by the view, as was everyone else in the caravan. Everyone had pulled to a halt to take in the view before them. Once, in London, he had accompanied Kitty to a salon, in which a wild-haired young man a poet of some description, had tried desperately to explain the romantic concept of the sublime. He had compared it to standing on a cliff at the edge of the sea, of seeing a storm rolling in or even staring up at the night sky and feeling small. Seth had little use for such lofty ideas, but he couldn't help but think of that strange little poet now. It was truly overwhelming, like standing on the rim of the world. But there is also beauty ahead. Carl said, coming up to stand next to Seth. He tilted his blonde head in the direction of the valley. Surely this makes some of it bearable, do you not think? Seth said nothing for a moment, his eyes on the unblemished wilderness. I think your command of English is much better than what you let on, Seth replied at last, giving the Swede a sidelong glance. To his surprise, Carl gave him a jocular thump on the shoulder. Yes, but... If you Anglos know that I speak English, then you will want me to speak English. Seth stared for a moment, not entirely sure he understood. Carl's face broke into a grin, and Seth couldn't help but laugh. Something felt relieved within him, not totally, but a kind of tension that eased by degrees. Carl's smile broadened, and he began slowly walking down the hill. Seth remained where he was for a bit longer even as the rest of the party began to cautiously move off after putting brake slides on some of the wagon wheels. They would have to make camp when they reached the bottom, as the sun was beginning to sink behind the hills. But they were too exposed at the top of the hill. For some reason that Seth could not quite figure out, he tilted his head upward, the northern star blinking in the inky, growing dark of night. Chapter 13 one year later, when the scullery maid came to knock on Kitty's door to rouse her, her eyes were already open. 
She stared up at the ceiling, buried up to her chin in blankets. The fire in the grate had long gone out without even the memory of an ember left. The knock was not strictly required for Kitty to awaken, as she was quite in the habit of rising with the few remaining servants these days. But it was seen as an important ritual nonetheless. Perhaps it was simply that it was a relic of a time when the lines between them were all neat and tidy, and the house still showed some signs of life. Kitty gritted her teeth, then threw the blankets back all at once. It was better to get it over with quickly. If she tried to leave her bed by degrees, it would never happen. Bracing herself, she swung her legs out of the bed, the cold of the floor cutting right through the stockings that she had slept in, before she could lose her nerve. She forced herself to stand, quickly snatching up the quilted dressing gown that she kept on the chair beside her bed. There was another knock at her door, this time a little louder. As she threaded her arms into the robe, she called, Yes, Flora, come in. Her door opened and the scullery maid entered. She carried the pail of coals and tinder, and after a perfunctory curtsy, she began doing her best to build a small while using as few coals as possible. The poor girl's hands were shaking so much that it took her a few tries to get the tinder to spark but soon there was a fire snapping away in the hearth. It was minuscule, but enough to keep Kitty from freezing as she dressed. Both stood for a moment before the fire, holding their hands to it, sighing with relief. They looked askance at once another, smiling at their mutual delight in fingers no longer stiff with cold. Quickly, Kitty turned and picked up the stub of a taper left in her candlestick and lit it with a bit of reed. She turned to her dressing table, knowing that she would have to work quickly. The day was getting away from her, and the sun wasn't even properly up yet. Flora ducked out of the room with another little curtsy, which made Kitty sigh. She knew the girl only wished to show the proper respect, but, truthfully, it felt a bit pointless these days. There were only a handful of servants left, and Flora had taken on more duties than that of a simple scullery. Lady Veronica refused to promote her, however, as this would necessitate her paying a higher wage. Once, Kitty had asked Flora how she could stand it, if it wouldn't be better for her to return to her mother in Ireland. The girl had shrugged, coal dust smudged on her cheek, and simply said pragmatically, It's better than home. Kitty did not care to contemplate that for too long. Instead, she sat on her bed, quickly exchanging her stockings for fresh ones shivering a little as she pulled them up her calf, then tying them below her knee with ribbons. It was the one part of her wardrobe where she defied the Viscountess's expectations, as they would never be seen. It was a small but meaningful assertion of her personality, these bits of pink or purple or green holding up her stockings throughout the day. There was little time to ruminate on such things. The servants would already be bustling about in the kitchen, blacking the stove and warming it up. With a great deal of wistfulness, Kitty stood again and slipped out of her dressing gown. With practised ease, she pulled on her layers of clothing quickly, relieved with each additional garment at the added warmth. Chemise, petticoat with shoulder straps, jumps, underskirt, a long-sleeved shirt very similar to a man's, day dress over all of it. There was a row of three buttons at the upper part of the back of her dress, which Kitty had to stretch awkwardly to reach. Once her feet were safely slid into boots and buttoned, Kitty left her room, gently shutting her door. With whisper, quiet steps, Kitty tiptoed past Lady Veronica's room, where the Viscountess still snored. Gently, Kitty made her way down the main stairs, and with a quick glance around, skipped the last step, landing squarely on both her feet. This was the only frivolity that she allowed herself in the morning, however. When she reached the door to the servants' area, making her way cautiously down the narrow stairs, she was all business. There was an apron waiting for her on a hook, which she quickly donned, tying it behind her back and pinning the top portion to her bodice. It was another one of the strange quirks that she and the servants had adopted, they would ensure that her apron was left for her, but they would not witness her slipping it on. 
It was too much, watching the breach in propriety as it happened. There was already the smell of bread baking by the time Kitty attained the kitchen. Cook, stern-faced woman with fleshy hands, was working the dough for the second loaf of the day, her cotton cap slipping over her forehead. It was only her, the scullery maid, a footman, and Lady Veronica's lady's maid left to try and keep the house running. There seemed to also frequently be a boy underfoot, who was tasked with odd jobs and occasionally running to the livery to inquire if a horse might be hired for the carriage. Cook nodded at Kitty, who was rolling up her sleeves, exposing her wrists and forearms, in a way that would have surely given her mother a case of the vapours. She stood before the work table for only a moment, watching the small puffs of flour as Cook turned the dough over and over, kneading it with quick, vigorous movements. How can I help? Kitty asked. This, too, was an integral part of the routine. Cook would never request Kitty's assistance. Kitty would have to offer it. Would you be so kind as to check the dairy for any butter? You might also see if we have any of the blackberry preserves left, too, Cook said. While Cook might snap and bark at everyone else downstairs like a naval commander, she always spoke to Kitty with great deference. This was not simply due to the social gap between them, but also to the fact that Kitty had largely taken over the duties of a butler and housekeeper. It was imperative that they get along. Kitty made her way into the dairy, cool and dark, set a couple steps into the earth to keep the milk and butter cool. Shelves lined the walls optimistically, but only a corner was used now. It was mostly cheese, with some fresh milk for the baking. In a small glazed dish, Kitty found the butter. She lifted the lid, sniffing it to ensure it hadn't gone rancid. She returned and began setting up the tray for Lady Veronica's breakfast. Two slices of bread were sliced from yesterday's loaf and quickly toasted. To this, a slice of cold ham, a pat of butter and a small dish of preserves was added. Lady Veronica did not eat a great deal in the mornings, but she was adamant about it being prompt and delicious. Kitty, with nothing better to do, sat upon a stool and began polishing the silverware with a clean corner of her apron. She held up a spoon to catch a shaft of sunlight that streamed in from one of the high windows, inspecting it for any remaining spots. She caught her reflection, apron and all, warped by the curve of the spoon. She half smiled, amused at her ease in the kitchen now. Kitty of a year ago likely would not recognise this new, competent creature. The lady's maid, Elsa, was the one who would carry up the breakfast. She would knock on the door while Kitty stood to one side. After she had withdrawn, Kitty would count to five and then enter herself, as if she had just come from her own room, rather than been up for hours seeing to the running of the house. It was just another of the little deceptions that the Cluett house relied upon like a linchpin. Wait, miss, Elsa said, catching Kitty by the elbow, before she could head back upstairs. Your hair, it's not been dressed yet. Oh, bother, Kitty grumbled, turning her eyes to see that it still hung in the simple plait over her right shoulder. Quickly, she ducked into the servants' hall, where a small mirror was on the wall. Elsa followed her, hovering a little. Shall I? she asked, stepping forward. Kitty shook her head, which caused some of the shorter curls around her face to bounce. No, we haven't the time. Go upstairs, and I shall hie up after you. Elsa nodded, pressing a few hairpins into Kitty's hand, which she accepted gratefully. Kitty stood before the mirror and quickly unpinned the top part of her apron, letting it fall. With practised ease, she gathered up her braid, looping it loosely at the back of her head, with her teeth, she opened the hairpins, then slid them through her thick hair. When she was done, she turned her head this way and that, ensuring it wouldn't fall down at precisely the wrong moment. When she was ready, she removed her apron hastily, hanging it back on the peg near the stairs. She knew that the next time she needed it, it would be clean and ready for her, waiting there on its peg. There was no time to linger and consider the silliness of the whole system. She had to hasten her way up the stairs, else Lady Veronica would accuse her of slothfulness again. As she passed the kitchen, Cook appeared in the doorway. With the same stern cast to her face, she pressed a cold egg and cheese tart into Kitty's hands. 
It won't do to have you facing herself with only hunger in your belly, she said. The butcher down the street has a good price on squabs this week. See if you can't work those into the menus. Kitty nodded, accepting the tart and hurrying up the stairs. She ate it as she climbed up and up, first from the servant's area downstairs, then up again to the bedrooms, where Lady Veronica waited. With one hand on the banister, the tart clamped in her mouth, Kitty swung her body with her other arm outstretched up onto the stairs. It was another small defiance, just one of the minute ways in which Kitty asserted that she was still herself, still her own person. Hastily, with her left hand gliding on the banister, Kitty ran up the stairs as lightly as she could. All the while, she kept eating her tart, finishing it quickly. There was a mirror in the darkened hall just down from Lady Veronica's room, and she paused here to brush off any stray crumbs from her impromptu breakfast and to check her hair. This was one of the few quiet moments of the day, and Kitty took the time for a deep breath, steadying herself. As always, she felt her eyes drawn down, down to the far end of the house. That was where Seth's rooms were, locked against the world, waiting for their master's return. She had never ventured down there, though she would be lying if she said that she had not been tempted. She had gotten used to living among the things that had been part of Seth's life, viewing them almost as a sort of museum. This was easily done, however, because there was so little of him in the furnishings and decor. She could not see him picking out a portrait, or a vase. She turned back to the mirror, studying her reflection. She was 25 now, very nearly ready to go on the shelf, if she hadn't already launched herself there with her scheme. Her face had grown a little thinner, her round cheeks no longer so fashionably full. There was a determined set to her mouth that had never been there before, and the mischievous gleam was largely gone from her eyes. She peered closer, then swiped at a smudge of flour on her cheek. Ah, my beloved, would you even know me now? She murmured to her reflection. The door to Lady Veronica's room opened. As always, Elsa backed out and said her customary line, I shall see if she is dressed for the day yet, my lady. Kitty caught her eye, and silently Elsa shook her head. This was their silent exchange most mornings. Kitty did not need to ask the question any more. They wished to know if some message had been delivered, some sort of confirmation that Seth was returning. They could all fear the Viscountess's growing anxiety, heavy and oppressive over the whole house. She was afraid that her son had left her, just as her husband had. Kitty was afraid that she was right. Nothing will get better by my standing here, Kitty said, straightening up and opening the bedroom door. There is much to do, and unfortunately, I am the one to do it. Chapter 14 there had never been a lot of gossip about Kitty around London, mostly because she had very few secrets about herself. Whatever it was that people saw from her, that was precisely what they got. On the rare occasion she was accused of being a shameless flirt, her face would light up. Oh, yes, she would reply, usually with an enthusiastic clasp of her hands. Isn't it marvellous? Her sudden absence from society was noted, however, and perplexing. Her parents were still in town, though their circumstances were notably straitened. They had retired from their customary home to a smaller one, though still just this side of fashionable. Mrs Johnson had made several pointed comments at volume about how the move was due to their no longer needing the space, and certainly no other reason. But where has Kitty Johnson gone? was usually the hushed question that followed, though never to Mrs Johnson. Neither she nor her husband would entertain any inquiries regarding their daughter. When the ton did not have the facts, it was quite adept at making their own. The highest of the high society might turn their noses up at playwrights and novel writers, but they were no less adept at producing fiction to entertain themselves. Kitty was kept abreast of these tales about herself via letters from Lady Patience Chester. Despite the fraught nature of their earlier acquaintanceship, 
Kitty found her to be a surprisingly compassionate friend. In no particular order, Kitty's favourite tales about herself were that she had locked herself in her room from her embarrassment regarding the Baron's ill-fated display, that she was so heartbroken that she could not marry the man she truly loved. She had run off to a convent. That one hit a little too close for Kitty's comfort. And her personal favourite, that she had disguised herself as a sailor and run off to New Spain. Given that she had been sequestered for a year, she was under no illusions that her return to society, when it did happen, would be no small cause for conversation. She was no less sure that her radical transformation would equally cause a stir. Still, that was a problem for her to solve weeks from now. Or so she had thought. It had been a day much as any other, with Kitty busy helping Lady Veronica settle menus for the week. Cook had passed on word that she found a fishmonger who would give a good price, and would include lemons as well. As always, when Cook passed along one of these tips, Kitty would gently push Lady Veronica to include it in the menus, always letting her think it was her own idea. Did I tell you that I saw Lady Beauchamp in the park the other day when I was walking Quincy? Kitty asked casually, not taking her eyes from the papers she was making lists on. This was a complete fabrication, as she happily paid the kitchen boy, Jimmy, to take Quincy for his daily constitutionals. She was sat with the Viscountess at her writing table, Kitty in the position of scribe, and Lady Veronica sitting beside and opposite her. As ever, Quincy was seated in the place of honour on his mistress's lap, with Lady Veronica absently scratching him about the ears. Did you indeed? Lady Veronica replied, moving her hand to tickle Quincy under the chin. Hmm, Kitty said noncommittal. She found Quincy to be a handsome little chappy. She sat back, stretching her neck a little, all with forced casualness. She would know, of course. You know how fond she is of her spaniels. Oh, quite true, Lady Veronica agreed. She has those dogs at her side more often than her husband. Poorly behaved little brutes, too. She paused, lifting Quincy by his armpits, holding him so that his face was quite near hers. Not like my handsome little man, who is every bit a gentleman. Why, I saw her one time bring them to a ball at Carlton House. When it was time for dinner, she was positively enraged because her precious babies did not have their own seats at the table. Kitty watched, transfixed and a little repulsed, as Lady Veronica began to make kissing sounds at Quincy. The poor little dog wiggled his pudgy body until it looked as if he were swimming in the air, little pink tongue flicking out like a snake. She held up a bit of the lady finger she had been eating, just out of reach so that Quincy had to stretch for a nibble. Lady Veronica laughed, then popped the rest in her mouth. Have you ever heard of anything half so ridiculous? Lady Veronica demanded. Can you imagine a dog at the Prince of Wales' table? That woman has no sense of boundaries or propriety. Kitty could only stare for a moment. She was aware that she was doing so, and she was equally aware that her hand was poised over the page, the ink-filled nib just hovering. There would surely be ink blots if she did not move now, something that would result in Lady Veronica demanding that she copy the whole page over from scratch. And yet, she could not stop staring. I've never heard of such an egregious thing, she said at last. I suppose some people have no sense of decorum. I mean, honestly, at the prince's table, Lady Veronica said, brushing crumbs from the fur around Quincy's mouth. I shouldn't think he'd mind, Kitty said, turning her attention back to the menus. I imagine he'd be rather comfortable around one of his own kind. Lady Veronica's head snapped toward Kitty. That is entirely too much pertness, she admonished. He is still the heir to the throne. Kitty shrugged, entirely unchastened. She had learned by now that the Viscountess was a lot of bark, and very little bite. Incidentally, this was the direct opposite of Quincy, who was very happy to demonstrate the power of his needle-like teeth on any unsuspecting ankle. Back to the salient point, Kitty continued. Lady Beauchamp said that she feeds her dogs fish once a week. You know how handsome their shining coats are? 
She says it's all down to the fish. Kitty stopped talking there. She could almost hear the Viscountess's mind at work. Kitty made a great show of bending over her work, her pen scratching along the paper. It would only be a matter of moments before... Well, perhaps we might add fish to the menu this week then, Lady Veronica allowed. We haven't had any for quite some time. Mind, tell Cook that I shan't tolerate any outrageous expenditures. If she finds some that isn't too dear, then we might have some. I'll be sure to tell her, Kitty assured her. I have been very clear with your instructions regarding economy. It won't all be for naught, Lady Veronica said, resettling Quincy onto her lap. I have been pinching all of our pennies for a particular reason. Oh? Kitty asked. The time has come for us to emerge from our seclusion. We are going to re-enter society, Lady Veronica announced, punctuating her sentence with a firm nod of her head. Now Kitty really did blot the paper. She let the quill pen drop from her hand, splattering all over the page as it rolled down the sheet. We're... you're coming out of your mourning? Kitty asked, her eyes wide and searching. I am, and not a moment too soon, Lady Veronica said, frowning disapprovingly at the mess that Kitty had made. Simply so that her hands would have something to do, Kitty turned back to the desk, retrieving the quill and sprinkling sand on the ruined page before putting it aside. Her mind raced as she opened the shallow drawer at the centre of the desk and withdrew a clean sheet. I am glad to hear that, Kitty said slowly, carefully, considering each word as much as if they were footsteps across an icy lake. One misstep, and she could fall through the ice. I am sure that it will be a relief to all that have missed you. But, Lady Veronica prompted, her sharp brown eyes on Kitty, do you, do we, have the means to be out and about? I should hate to think of you going out in anything less than you ought to be, Kitty supplied, daring a glance at the Viscountess. I have been carefully saving all of my pen money, and only barely touching the interest of my settlement I was gifted when Seth was born. Lady Veronica sniffed. I tell you this only because you have a hand in the running of this house and are familiar with the accounts. Kitty stared for a moment, unsure if she empathised with the Viscountess's frugality so that she might have new dresses or furious because they had been barely scraping by. Before taking this position, Kitty would have been hard-pressed to make that choice as well. "'I can hear you from here, Catherine Johnson,' Lady Veronica said, her dark eyes staring unflinchingly at Kitty. "'Do not think I am ignorant to the privation and struggle of the last months. You have managed admirably. Truly, you are a credit to this house. However, it is not so simple as a desire to go out and attend parties and dinners.' Oh, Kitty asked, intrigued in spite of her trepidation. Lady Veronica looked down briefly, stroking Quincy's head again. For a moment, she had the look of a schoolgirl who was avoiding confessing something terrible to a schoolmaster. Kitty waited, the menus completely forgotten. Before he died, the late Viscount, my husband, was about to embark on a project of land development, Lady Veronica began, refusing to meet Kitty's gaze. He purchased a quantity of land on the outskirts of London, convinced that the city would have no choice but to grow in that direction. I have heard that more people arrive to London every day, Kitty said weakly. Lady Veronica rolled her eyes a little. Farming folk, certain that they can find riches just laying in the streets, waiting for them to pick them up and slip them in their pockets. The Viscountess paused, shifting a little in her chair so that she was sitting up a bit straighter, if such a thing were possible. She folded her hands carefully in her lap. This scheme was no mere row of little townhouses for the nouveau riche. This was to be a grand undertaking. Shops, homes, streets, even a school. For boys. How very ambitious, Kitty offered, a little staggered by the scale of it. To say the least, Lady Veronica agreed. The trouble is that my late husband was having to rely on a number of investors. They have naturally been a little, 
well, hesitant since his death. Kitty tilted her head, fixing Lady Veronica with a significant look. The Viscountess caught her expression and gave a sigh and a little helpless gesture with her hands. They wish to abandon the project altogether. They do not think my son can manage it, and with his prolonged absence, they only grow more uneasy. Well, that is a shame if they must call it off, but... Work has already begun, Lady Veronica interrupted, her voice low and urgent. It was imperative that work was commenced immediately in order to satisfy the investors. After my late husband's death, they graciously let things lie as they were in deference to my loss. Kitty could not help but stare at Lady Veronica. If she were not afraid of being admonished for it, her jaw would have surely dropped open as well. That is why you wish to see out the entirety of your mourning period without budging, she breathed, somewhat in awe. It was the proper thing to do, Lady Veronica sniffed, tossing her head a little. I lost my husband. It was only natural that mourning be fully observed. They fell into a contemplative silence. Kitty had frequently seen the rules governing so much of women's lives as nothing but silly restrictions. It had never occurred to her that they might be turned to her advantage, if she were clever. Such an education I have received in this house, she was tempted to say. Instead, she rummaged about in the writing desk, withdrawing a clean sheet of paper and laying it over the blotted and forgotten menus. Very well, she said, taking up her quill again and dipping it in the ink. She turned to the Viscountess expectantly, the nib hovering over the page. What must we do? The Viscountess turned to stare at Kitty, surprised and assessing. What? Kitty countered. You do not think that I have worked so hard to keep us all afloat these months so that I can see the household ruined by a few grubby bankers, do you? Lady Veronica was not a woman given over to great expressions of emotion, unless they served her in some fashion. This was particularly true of smiling. Kitty could not recall see seeing her ever engage in a true, open smile that reached her whole face. Now, however, a smile of such satisfaction and pleasure spread over her countenance that Kitty could not help but answer it in kind. Chapter 15 Seth had always felt a touch out of step with the world around him for as long as he could remember. The expectations that such an eligible gentleman, the heir to a title particularly, would know how to flawlessly navigate a ballroom or a drawing room had never been anything but a proverbial millstone about his neck. The noise had always been borderline overwhelming, conversation and music melding into one dull grating roar in his ears. He had thought that he already understood and appreciated silence. He sought it out whenever he could, frequently in the corners of forgotten barns or mills creaking slowly in the wind. Seth had thought he knew what total silence was, he was quite wrong. From the moment he passed the last border of a world that had even a glimmer of something recognisable, the nights drew close around him, endless and claustrophobic all at once. He had never even considered the possibility that there were variations of silence, degrees of silence. He had never heard a silence so deep that he fancied he could hear his own body, simply existing in a dark so deep as to be comparable to the void. The days were so long that Seth rarely had the energy to do much when the work was finally done. He had arrived at the small logging camp that had been established by a man in his father's employ. Unfortunately, the moment that funds had stopped arriving, the former foreman had scarpered, taking as much of the equipment with him as he could carry. It was barely even a camp at Seth's arrival. It was more of a speck in a primeval forest that had been cleared enough to turn a pair of wagons about in. The Scandinavians had proved themselves to be good, hard-working fellows, and without a second thought, Seth had decided to hire them. He had little in wages that he could offer them, but they were quite happy to be made partners, taking a percentage of every piece of timber cut. This turned out to be a wise investment, for though they sported questionable moustaches, 
they proved to be adept timbermen. The oldest, or perhaps simply the tallest of the trio, wielded an axe as easily and casually as if he were a fashionable man in London, twirling about a walking stick. Sven, as he answered to more often than not, seemed to not have a care in the world for the sharpness of the blade as regarding his own safety, because of the inconsequential way that he would lug it about. The first time he set to work felling, Seth was so startled by the sudden ferocity and pinpoint precision that he jumped backward. Otto, the shortest of the brothers, would then crawl all over the tree once it was felled, muttering and measuring with a length of string. Carl would listen to the incomprehensible Nordic words, taking meticulous notes with a pencil in a small worn notebook. Over the course of a couple of weeks, Seth learned that they were calculating, with startling accuracy, the amount of usable timber in any given tree. As they had no mill to speak of, this was imperative information, as it would have been easy for the miller to short them on payment. We need a mill, Seth said, and the brothers had all nodded gravely in agreement. There was a good source of water, a creek that had ambitions of being a river during the spring thaw. They used this to float the logs downstream, but Carl seemed convinced that it could be turned to powering a bandsaw. The family of Germans had stayed as well, and Seth was glad of this. The father was an able driver and showed great skill at training the plodding wagon, horses in the art of tushing. The ladies set to work immediately transforming the little clearing into a livable space, and Seth couldn't help but wonder at their industry. Already, they spoke of writing to more of their relatives, and soon, there would be the littlest seeds of a town planted. Seth had little to pay them with, but instead granted them lots along the thin strip of dirt that was quickly forming into a sort of main street. It was the strangest thing that Seth had ever witnessed. Tents and makeshift lean-tos slowly giving way to clappered buildings and log cabins. There was talk of digging a well, and Otto, his moustache fluffing with excitement, seemed to think that it would be worthwhile to sink a mine for copper deeper in the forest. All of which meant that Seth's days were full, fuller than he could have ever imagined. There was scarcely a moment in the day that his hands were not turned to some industry or another. He too had taken to carrying an axe about with him, for there was always wood that needed chopping, limbs to be hacked off of trunks, rails split for fences. He fetched water, learned to start a fire from nothing, even the basics of tushing, driving the horses as they dragged logs from the forest. One of the German boys, a lad of no more than twelve, showed him how to set snares for rabbits, which were plentiful. Seth had never been in a position before, where if his hands failed, he would go hungry. It was terrifying and exhilarating all at once. When he lay down at night, and the dark curled around him like a second, or third, or fourth blanket, he knew a kind of tiredness that he had never known before. He had no bed, merely a pile of skins and blankets over a scattering of straw on the bare wood floor of a hastily thrown up cabin. Given that all his body had known to this point was downy feather mattresses, he could never have considered that he would sleep so easily in such humble surroundings. The only real trial was in those few, fleeting moments before sleep descended on his eyes. He would float, neither awake nor sleeping, too awake to be fully dreaming. It was then that the loneliness would set in. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. Thank you again. Now back to our story. He had companionship, more true friendship than he had ever known in his life, really. But he could not deny that at the end of the day, he was utterly alone. Everyone else had friends family, smiling faces awaiting them. Seth retired to his cabin to listen to it, creak and shift in the wind and cold. One of the young ladies, Gretel, a girl with hair so blonde it was almost white, practised a sort of singing that seemed to encapsulate all their isolation. It was unlike anything Seth had ever heard before, a kind of wordless keening that echoed around the hills of the camp. He would lay in bed and she would begin her song, causing a strange, 
cold, prickling sensation to crawl up the back of his neck and his eyes to burn with tears. He did not know her story. She, like many of them, treated Seth with a kind of deference, clearly seeing that in spite of his unshaven face and unkempt hair, he was the lord of the castle. Never mind that the castle was a log cabin, held together mostly with hope and crooked nails. She rarely met his eye, ducking her head and stepping backward out of his path at every turn. On the rare occasions that her eyes, so light as to almost be colourless, met his, darting away furtively, there was such a quiet, abiding sadness there that Seth became more aware of his own pain. It was impossible for him to know what she pined for, for whom she longed, but Seth could recognise her own suffering. When she loosed her song, it felt as much for himself as for her own need to give vent to her broken heart. It would have been a fool's errand to bring anything of value with him as he crossed the wilderness. Moreover, anything of any remote value he had sold in order to fund his expedition. There was one single thing he had kept, one little trinket he could not bear to part with. In a small velvet box lay a small gold band, a diamond set into the top in such a way that it resembled a gleaming star, little sapphires around it. Seth had known that it was for him to proclaim his love and devotion to the one that illuminated his heart and kept him tethered to him in a shock of recognition. In the near total blackness of his cabin, one small candle wavering and sputtering on a little plate near his head, his hand would find the little box that he kept ever safe in the inner pocket near his heart. His thumb would find the little brass latch worn from how many times it had been opened without even needing to see it. As Gretel's strange, banshee-like song warbled about in the little camp, he would hold the ring up to his eyes, turning it this way and that so that it sparkled and caught the light, taking on the aspect of a real star. Don't give up on me, he whispered like a prayer. Guide me back home. Chapter 16 Watching Lady Veronica enter a salon was a little like the descriptions Kitty had heard of tigers stalking their prey. She was not ostentatious, nor did she rely on colourful plumage. She laid in wait, watching, assessing, and picked the perfect moment to strike. She was more akin to an ambush predator than anything else. Kitty had always thought that she knew every trick there was to working a room, but even she had to admit that Lady Veronica had much to teach her. The Viscountess had chosen the place to make her re-entrance into society carefully. It was a salon-come-luncheon, casual but respectable. Much of society was still out of London, but a few were beginning to straggle back in for the holiday season. It was not an occasion that would require diamonds and tiaras, but Lady Veronica made a great effort at digging out her best lace pieces. It was Kitty's duty to stand quietly at Lady Veronica's elbow, ready to step in whenever called upon. They remained at the fringes of the gathering, Lady Veronica accepting the greetings and condolences with equal gravity and graciousness. Kitty, meanwhile, had been given the task of locating one Mr Archibald Maddox, a man who was carrying a significant amount of the debt regarding the development project. She had only the vaguest of descriptions, and was at last forced to rely on asking another chaperone who was attempting to be invisibly visible. Might you know which of these gentlemen is Mr Maddox? Kitty whispered, leaning closer to the woman, her face obscured by the wide wings of her bonnet. The chaperone turned toward her, revealing a face settling firmly into middle age and a thin mouth. I believe he is in the drawing room still, listening to the reading. The chaperone returned quietly, her lips barely moving. Her watery eyes flicked to Lady Veronica. Your mistress wishes to speak with him? Kitty resisted the urge to correct the chaperone. She had come dressed simply, even a little humbly, at Lady Veronica's behest. She had rankled a little, perturbed that her first foray back into society was to be in a dress that was neither grey nor brown, with scarcely a ruffle or pink trim in sight, but she quickly realised the role she needed to play. 
it was easy to mistake her for a lady's maid. Possibly even a nurse. Much like her dress, her position was nondescript, easy to change at a moment's notice. So Kitty was content for the moment to let the chaperone believe her to be a lady's maid. Her time downstairs had taught her that servants had a world unto themselves, and they saw much more than anyone would like to believe. Clearly, Lady Veronica had brought Kitty, dressed as she was, in the hopes that she would be able to tap into this information network. Yes, Kitty replied, matching the tone and surreptitious manner of speaking of the chaperone. She is most eager to do so, in fact. The chaperone's eyes flicked in the direction of Lady Veronica, and then the drawing room in question. Matters of banking, then, I presume? I couldn't say, Kitty demurred, as was only proper. Do you know what sort of man he is? The chaperone looked thoughtful, considering. I've had no dealings with him, personally, mind you, she said, leaning in a little closer. But I am given to understand that he is partial to flattery. Show me a man that is not... Kitty quipped, earning her a quick huff of laughter from the chaperone. Their conversation was cut short then, for the chaperone had to move off in order to keep a weather eye on her charge. Kitty felt a pang of nostalgia mixed with envy then, remembering her own halcyon days of being a bright young thing flitting about social events. No time for that, Kitty said, silently sidling her way up to Lady Veronica again, who was receiving the attentions of a grey-haired matron. I do sympathise with you, the older lady was saying, fluttering a black lace fan that lifted a few tight curls on her forehead. There's a great many of us that know what it is to lose a husband so young. You are a treasure for thinking I have lost my dear Viscount while still young, Lady Veronica replied, smiling indulgently. It is a hard thing, learning to navigate the world on one's own. The other woman gave Lady Veronica a sidelong glance before she could reply in a manner that would surely irritate the Viscountess. Kitty stepped forward, keeping her hands clasped low at her waist and her gaze down. My lady, Mr Maddox awaits you in the drawing room, she murmured, just loud enough to be overheard. This was not entirely true, but Kitty needed a way to impart the information and extract the Viscountess all at once. Lady Veronica, without missing a beat, let out a heavy sigh. Do forgive me, Lady Jersey, she said, laying a hand on the other woman's arm. I must take my leave. The Viscountess looped her arm through Kitty's, as if she needed either the comfort or support of her companion. Kitty, knowing the part she still had to play, patted Lady Veronica gently on the arm, careful to keep her face the neutral mask expected of servants. Kitty tipped her head closer to Lady Veronica's and whispered what she had learned. They broached the door of the drawing room, where there were still bookstands at the front of the room, but now abandoned. The guests had withdrawn to one corner of the room, where it was clear that someone else was holding court. For her part, Kitty could not keep herself from looking about hungrily at the silks and satins, the feathers in hats, and oh, the ruffles on the hems. Oh, Lady Veronica said quietly, her voice rife with disappointment. It seems we are too late for the reading. One of the fellows standing at the back of the crowd, ringed around a speaker, turned and gave a little bow in Lady Veronica's direction. Kitty knew him at once, Sir Hayes, the young heir to the squireship at North Downs. He had the dark hair and eyes of his father, but dressed simply, humbly even, in a grey worsted wool jacket and plainly knotted cravat. Kitty had danced with him more than once, feeling a superior sort of pity for him when she did so, as if she were bestowing a great honour upon this poor country lad. I see that I am to be humbled much today through irony, Kitty thought dryly. Subtly, she angled herself away, not wishing to be recognised. That would not help the case that they were coming to press. She ducked her head a little, hoping that her transformation was complete enough to pass inspection. The reading is over, but... Mr. Maddox has been kind enough to expound on some of his thoughts on the modern system of banking, Sir Hayes said lowly, tilting his head toward where the crowd pressed in. Oh, is that the great Mr. Maddox then? Lady Veronica said, raising her voice slightly. I was so hoping to see him today, such a good friend of my late husband's. 
Kitty glanced up to see Sir Hayes taking in Lady Veronica's wardrobe, a dusty lavender day dress with black velvet ribbons at her neck and wrists. It was fashionable, but clearly the garb of a widow, still in half mourning. Immediately, Sir Hayes dipped his head in recognition of the loss, his forehead creasing sympathetically. Please, my dear lady, allow me to take you to him then, he said, offering his arm to Lady Veronica and bowing again. I apologise for my forwardness, as we have not even been properly introduced, but I should hate to see you grow fatigued from waiting. Kitty quietly dug the fingernails of her right hand into her wrist, using this as a means of keeping her emotions under control. She felt well and truly guilty now, not simply because they were playing up on this kind young man's sympathies and sense of chivalry, but also because she had thought rather shabbily of him in the past. She had dismissed him out of a hand because his jackets were simple and worn at the cuffs, or his waistcoat was plain and unfashionable. His face was long and lean, with a prominent nose, and chin made worse by large, thick teeth. Someone had snippily remarked once at Newmarket that he looked as if he ought to be running the course himself, and Kitty's face grew hot with shame as she remembered that she had laughed. My whole life has become an exercise in looking through a glass darkly at all I once was and how dear, she thought to herself, feeling oddly removed from all of it for a moment. Sir Hayes was as good as his word, and Lady Veronica laid her hand upon his elbow, smiling up gratefully at him. What a good lad you are, she said all motherly affection, and Sir Hayes preened under her praise. Gently, that good fellow nudged his way up through the crowd, which parted only grudgingly. Kitty, hanging back, had only a limited view of what transpired next. Mr Maddox, Sir Hayes said, his voice rising above the general din, I have brought the widow of an old friend of yours, who wishes to renew your acquaintanceship, Lady Veronica Cluet, wife of the late Viscount Cluet. There was a pregnant silence that followed for a moment, a little stunned on both parts. It was an unusual introduction, and Kitty could tell by the tension in Lady Veronica's back that she was not altogether pleased by it. Likewise, it seemed that Mr Maddox was a little agog at being addressed in such a way, as it was a little untoward for women to proclaim that they wished to be better acquainted with a man, widow or no. I am always glad to be reminded of old friends, Mr Maddox said at last, having recovered. Oddly enough, Lady Veronica said nothing, which was most unusual. Kitty, growing alarmed, wriggled her way forward through the spectators who were beginning to exchange glances and whispers at the strange scene. She sidled up next to Lady Veronica, glancing to her face and then down, down, to Mr Maddox. Kitty was about average height for a woman of her age, not particularly short, but neither was she a giantess. Lady Veronica, who was quite a specimen of height, was a solid couple inches taller than she, which she emphasised by continuing to wear shoes, in a style no longer in favour with solid block heels. Mr Maddox, however, was shorter than both of them, reaching up only to about the midpoint of Kitty's nose. Kitty knew that she should not stare. It was imperative that this man have a favourable impression of them, but it simply couldn't be helped. Compounding the problem was that the top of his head was completely devoid of hair and shined as if a footman had come by and applied furniture polish to it. It drew Kitty's eye like a lighthouse out at sea. Thankfully, just as Mr Maddox's long forehead was beginning to crease in consternation, Lady Veronica appeared to come to her senses. Please forgive me, Mr Maddox, she said, her voice low and thick with some sort of emotion. It's just that... Oh, you will think me a sentimental old fool, she said, withdrawing a handkerchief from one of her sleeves and dabbing at her eyes. I could hear my husband's voice for a moment when I saw your face and all of the kind things he said about you. Kitty's eyes darted back and forth between Lady Veronica and Mr Maddox, unsure how the blatant flattery would be taken. The entire crowd in the drawing room was engrossed as well, having been pulled into this little drama. Kitty also suspected that this was deliberate, as an audience usually was a guarantee of better behaviour than in private. At length, 
Mr. Maddox's face split into a grin and he reached forward to take Lady Veronica's hand. My dear Lady Cluette, he said, you have been very much in my thoughts these past weeks. Please, why don't we take a turn through the house and see what we remember about your husband together? Lady Veronica bestowed on him another smile, which was warmly received. Deftly, she slipped her arm out of Sir Hayes's and laid her hands on Mr. Maddox's proffered elbow. An amused grin threatened to break onto Kitty's face, and she had to work to keep it contained. She was preparing to follow Lady Veronica from the room at an appropriate distance when she felt someone staring at her. Glancing up, she saw that it was Sir Hayes, who was watching her with a curious look, head tilted. Quickly, before he could say anything to her, she ducked her head and hurried after Lady Veronica. To her great surprise, she realised that she did not want to be recognised, to cause a great scene with her return to polite society. Who could have suspected, she mused as she glided along, silent and watchful, that there was more to life than being the gilded lily of the party? Chapter 17 Despite his reputation as something of a hard-nosed miser, it turned out that Mr. Maddox was a surprisingly soft touch. Of course, it helped that Lady Veronica was a consummate professional at bestowing little compliments that were not so blatant as to be patronising. Lady Veronica also had no quibbles about reminding him that she was a widow, freshly out of mourning. She would occasionally touch the black ribbon about her neck, upon which was hung a locket. It would appear to anyone observing that she was fondly remembering a miniature of her late husband, tucked away inside, but Kitty suspected it was empty. Moreover, it was early December, with the holiday season just around the corner. It was considered bad form, at the very least to call in debts at this time, gauche to the highest degree. This was doubly so when one was dealing with a widow, who had a tendency to go misty-eyed at the mere mention of the impending feast days, being the first without her husband and her son still across the sea. So it was of little surprise that Mr Maddox was persuaded to drop his debt claim for the time being. As she watched all of this transpire, Kitty could not help but feel as if she were receiving the strangest but most practical education at a kind of finishing school. Once, when they were alone in the carriage, Lady Veronica caught Kitty watching her. She arched one of her dark brows and inquired if Kitty required attention of some sort. I don't mean to stare, Kitty said hastily. It's simply that I hadn't realised that there was such an art to navigating the ton when you are a woman alone. Or that it was even possible to do so, she added. Lady Veronica's mouth quirked as if she were considering smiling but then she sighed and looked out of the carriage window as London slowly rolled past. It is less about possible and more about necessary, she said. The late Viscount was rarely at home and it fell to me to maintain our family standing. It is difficult when there is only one child. You must do everything for them then to ensure not only their future but for generations onward. An unexpected pang of guilt jabbed at Kitty she too turned to look sharply out the window, swallowing hard. She knew that her parents had done everything to prepare her brother to take over the holdings and her father's trading firm. When he had died on a faraway shore, they had simply been unable to cope. A kind of denial had settled on the entire household then. You are looking very thoughtful, Catherine, Lady Veronica said. Is something troubling you? It was unexpected and a little unprecedented for Lady Veronica to take a personal interest in Kitty, at least vocally. In the interest of maintaining parity, she dropped her gaze to her hands and decided on honesty. I don't think I have been very fair to my parents, she admitted quietly. I've yet to meet any child who is, Lady Veronica said wryly. Even the most dutiful of them are a trial at one point or another. Thank you. That's helped greatly, Kitty retorted before she would stop herself. To her relief and surprise, Lady Veronica merely tilted her head a little in her Kitty's direction. Very well. 
if you wish to treat this brief carriage ride, our only respite between appointments today, mind, as something of a confessional, be my guest. Unburden yourself as you see fit. Kitty eyed Lady Veronica for a moment, unsure if she was speaking in jest or not. She decided to chance it. After my brother died, I don't think... I don't believe that any of us really considered what that meant for all of us. Lady Veronica did not object, so Kitty hurried on, the words just tumbling out as she thought them. It was always assumed that that Stephen would simply see to everything, since there was an heir presumptive. Stephen was the future, and I was... Well, I honestly don't know what I was. Something like a very good painting, she said, stumbling a little over her brother's name, which she hadn't said aloud for years. I was the landscape in the hall, something to show to guests when they came calling, and everyone would stand around and nod, saying, Ah, yes, what a lovely picture. Really brightens the place up. Stephen was real, and I was not. Lady Veronica gave a mirthless chuckle. Yes, that is ever the plight of our sex, particularly when one is a pretty girl. And I was so angry at my parents, my father for losing our fortune, my mother for not preparing me for the possibility that I would have to be... to be sold off into the marriage market to keep all of us afloat. I did not really exist for years, and then suddenly it was all down to me to keep us from the streets, Kitty continued. Her words coming faster and faster. All I saw was that they wanted me to marry. Well, you saw the Baron. You saw him twice. I've known him for nearly half my life, Lady Veronica muttered. Never knew a party that he could not dampen. You're well clear of him. Perhaps so, Kitty agreed. But I never stopped to consider that my parents might be just as lost and floundering as I was. They had a perfect vision of the future. And then, that future simply was not. I think... I think I've been very unfair to them. Most likely, Lady Veronica agreed. Helpful, Kitty muttered darkly. But that does not mean that you were unjust in your feelings. As far as I can tell, your father laid no provision for you. Which is very poorly done, Lady Veronica said. You were given the opportunity to marry for practical means, which you declined. There's no point in coming over or watery about decisions that are done and cannot be undone. If I'd known you were given to bouts of sentimentality... I'd never have taken you in. Kitty turned her gaze back out the window. It was beginning to snow, the flakes dancing around in the wake of the carriages as they passed through the streets. She knew that Lady Veronica did not mean what she said, but the truth was, they complimented each other well, in a way. She suspected that the Viscountess was prickly, as a means to conceal her own predilection for sentiment. I suppose that it is a luxury to have the principle that I should like to marry for love, Kitty said at last, her breath fogging the window a little as she spoke. Of course it is, Lady Veronica agreed. You must decide if it is a luxury you can afford in your reduced circumstances. She paused, then touched Kitty's arm with her gloved hand. You must decide if this is a price you are willing to pay. No one else can make that decision for you. What about you? Kitty asked, returning Lady Veronica's gaze. Did you marry for love? Lady Veronica reared back a little, bristly, her face closing off. That is entirely too pert of you, she admonished without any real heat. Kitty said nothing, merely looked expectantly at Lady Ver Veronica, who was doing her best not to meet Kitty's eye. She reached up with one hand and touched the locket on the black velvet ribbon about her neck again, and Kitty followed the motion. I made my choices long ago. That is enough for you to know, the Viscountess said at last. A lull in the conversation followed, with Kitty turning her attention back to the streets and sidewalks as they passed. They were on their way out to the building site, where work had halted. Lady Veronica had carefully put out the story 
that it was in deference to the freezing ground and not because she could not afford to pay the builders. The buildings began to thin, gradually giving way to empty fields. The roads, too, became rougher, the carriage jostling occasionally as the wheels found ruts frozen into the mud. The ladies were forced to put their hands to the ceiling and sides of the carriage on occasion to prevent themselves from tumbling off the benches. By the time they had reached the site in question, they were quite relieved to step out of the carriage, even if it was into the cold December air. They had little time to recover their equanimity, however, for the man they were to be meeting, one Mr Forsyth, was already awaiting their arrival. Lady Veronica had it on good authority that he was not as soft of a touch as Mr Maddox had been. He would require figures and facts to be persuaded to their course. It was unlikely that he would fall prey to the sentimentality of a widow in winter. They had dressed not only in deference to the cold weather, but also for the purpose at hand. Lady Veronica had settled on a riding habit, a little out of date with the waist low and fullness around the hips but the red colour and row of buttons down the front gave the impression of a field marshal striding about. She set this off with black gloves and boots, carrying a riding stick which she used as both a cane and a means of pointing to various landmarks to illustrate her points. Kitty, meanwhile, had been assigned the role of bookish assistant. It was her job to tote about a leather folio, packed with architect sketches, cost estimates and endless lists of facts and figures as well as projections for future profits. Her dark hair was pulled back severely, coiled into a braid at the back of her head that was pinned tightly. She too wore an outfit that passed as something of a riding habit, with a closely cut bodice and long straight skirt. A white collar and cravat peaked from the top, giving the illusion of a man's riding suit. A plain black riding hat completed the ensemble, in an effort to further the charade that Kitty was a woman of letters and numbers, a pair of tiny spectacles perched on her little nose, which were prone to sliding down and she was obliged to keep nudging back upward. She stood silently to one side, wordlessly, passing over the required sheets from the folio as required. It was altogether strange to see the way in which Lady Veronica wages a war of sense and persuasion on Mr Forsyth, a man with a red beak of a nose and hollow cheeks. It was also altogether inspiring, for Kitty had never seen a woman speak as Lady Veronica did, with such a clear understanding of what was required. The site manager appeared, a round man with a round belly and an equally red nose as Mr Forsyth. He was dressed in the brown, worsted wools of a working man, his waistcoat pulling tightly across her belly. He pulled his forelock in deference to Lady Veronica. It is imperative that work resumes so that at least this road here, Lady Veronica said, pointing to a blank lane on the map that Kitty balanced on the open folio, is completed by the spring thaw. All else depends on it. Begging your pardon, Mrs. That is my lady, the foreman said, reaching up to touch his forehead again. But this is easier said than done. The ground is freezing fast and it's no time to be laying cobbles. It needn't be cobbled, Lady Veronica replied coolly, merely cleared and flattened with the curbs laid. The foreman glanced to Mr Forsyth, a gesture so tiny that it would be easily missed by anyone, but Kitty saw Lady Veronica immediately seize onto it. It was like a falcon seeing a twitch of grass in a field that gave away the position of a mouse. I'm not sure that is wise either, my lady, the foreman said, hesitating. The frost is on us, and mortar won't stick. Hmm? Lady Veronica said, tapping her chin thoughtfully. I suppose that you would know more about these things, mister. Ah, Bullworth, my lady, the foreman supplied, shooting another wary glance to Mr Forsyth. Mr Bullworth, Lady Veronica continued, you clearly are a man of experience. Obviously, that is why my husband hired you. I'd like to think so, your ladyship, Mr. Bullworth said. Been a carpenter and mason for most of my life. Of course, Lady Veronica said, smiling at him without it reaching her eyes. 
and I am sure that someone with so much experience would know that you might lay sheepskins or peat upon the masonry to keep the mortar warm enough while it sets. How did... That is, yes, that is possible, my lady. Mr. Bulworth stammered, his eyes darting to Mr. Forsyth again. Kitty, mindful that she could not break character at this moment, lowered her head lest she grin and give the game away. It's more than possible, Lady Veronica said, rounding on the hapless Mr. Bulworth. It is precisely what you shall do. This road must be done by March, no later. I'm not sure how we shall convince the workmen to return to their posts, Mr. Bulworth said weakly, being as the accounts are somewhat in arrears. That is for Mr. Forsyth to see to, Lady Veronica said coolly, levelling her hawkish gaze onto the man in the improbably tall black top hat. Now, what's this? I shouldn't take such liberties if I were... He began, but Lady Veronica cut him off with a coy sidelong glance. Do not mistake me, Mr. Forsyth, Lady Veronica said, her tone low and disconcertingly gentle. I know precisely how you managed to evangel Mr. Bulworth here into my husband's business affairs. I know full well that you are both constant drinking companions. Yes, you may look surprised all you like, but I can see it on you even now. You might wish to pass off your red noses as the result of a December breeze but I know all too well that their true origins are in a pub less than a mile back. You might think you have a full measure of me, but I can assure you that I have more eyes in places than you shall ever know. Mr Forsyth and Mr Bulworth both stood staring at Lady Veronica. Kitty, too, her guise momentarily forgot, simply stared at her, feeling more than a little in awe and a good dose of foolishness as well. Gentlemen made no bones about women and gossip, that it was their favourite sport after husband hunting. Kitty had never realised that it could be used as a means of procuring such pointed information. Satisfied, Lady Veronica made to leave, and then turned back abruptly. And how is Mrs Forsyth, if I might ask? It's been some years since I've seen her. She's well, Mr Forsyth answered warily. Oh, good. Lady Veronica said, all warm smiles again. I am pleased to know that there is someone to hold you accountable to. Tell me, do you still pretend it is your niece that you are visiting in the lower end of Covent Garden? Now Kitty really did let her guise slip. Her mouth fell open, her eyes nearly popping out of her head. Everyone knew why a gentleman would call upon a young lady in that particular corner of Covent Garden. To brazenly mention it out loud in such company was unheard of. Mr Forsyth's reaction was to go pale, then red all over, his lips pressing so tightly together that they were nearly white. Nothing more was said, but Kitty did not doubt that the workers would have their wages restored in quick order. Lady Veronica was already on her way back to the carriage, and Kitty had to hustle to catch up. She suspected that she had a great deal of catching up to do in order to keep up with Lady Veronica. Chapter 18 To be a chess piece in someone else's game was not a position that Kitty had ever desired for herself. In truth, it was not even something that she had considered to even be possible. She had always known that fathers and brothers tended to marry off their daughters and sisters in the most advantageous way possible, but that was the extent of it. She had never entertained the notion that she might have the wherewithal to play a part in a scheme of actual consequence, rather than girlish shenanigans. She sat, preparing the Viscountess's letters, to be read and answered, the portable writing desk opened and placed in its customary spot upon the small side table in the drawing room. At any moment, Lady Veronica would enter and take up her seat in the chair diagonal from Kitty, and they would begin the day's business. As she waited, she allowed herself to look about, taking in her surroundings. The drawing room was one of the few rooms still open, the others mostly closed off to save on heating costs. A fire burned low in the grate, and Kitty had scooted the table as close to it as she dared. Even so, her fingers regularly stiffened from the cold, and she had taken to wearing fingerless mitts indoors at all times. 
It was an incongruous scene. Kitty wrapped up in her thickest shawl, her feet stuffed into fur-lined walking boots, occasionally blowing on her fingers to keep them flexible. All the while, she was surrounded by fine furnishings and paintings, the trappings of wealth. And yet, none of it does a thing to keep me warm, she grumbled inwardly. The thick rug beneath the settee in the centre of the room caught her eye, cream with red flowers and oriental patterns. Well, perhaps you do, she amended silently to the rug. It was positively foolish to think of wearing one of her dresses from the time before she came to live with the Viscountess now. They were pretty enough, but she would surely turn into a kitty-shaped block of ice if she dared. Most mornings, she fairly launched herself eagerly into her thick, plain dresses. The door to the drawing room opened, and Lady Veronica entered, cutting off any nostalgic remembrances on Kitty's part. As always, Quincy followed closely on his mistress's heels, little pink tongue lolling out as he bounced along behind her. This, too, was part of their daily ritual, in which Lady Veronica would take her seat and then roundly admonish Quincy that he could not expect to be sat on her lap. Once this was completed, the Viscountess would reach down and unceremoniously scoop the little pup up and deposit him on her lap, which he would accept as his due. Kitty did not object to the dog holding court per se, but she did object to the way that he stared at her with his beady little eyes. It seems that we have been noticed, Lady Veronica said, having taken the pile of letters and rifled through them. The ton have begun to remember me. As if they could ever forget, Kitty said smoothly, retrieving the foolscap of paper from within the little writing desk, penknife and a fresh quill. Lady Veronica gave her a withering look, which Kitty roundly ignored. It was their custom. They traded barbed compliments that could be taken any number of ways, always with a thin veneer of flattery. If they were to exchange actual words of fondness, Kitty would be instantly alarmed. With precise little strokes, Kitty began cutting down the quill, as Lady Veronica spoke, only paying half mind. Lord Bannister wishes to pay his compliments, of course he does. Lady Tyrell has invited me to her Christmas fete. That might prove useful. Ah, here we are, she said, retrieving a plain little letter that Kitty had put far back in the stack. This is one that I have been expecting. Kitty handed over the pearl-handled letter opener wordlessly, only glancing over as Lady Veronica sliced past the wax seal. She had recognised neither the name on the return address nor the seal, as, per Lady Veronica's instruction, this put them behind those of rank, whose letters were clearly of higher importance. It seems Sir Alexander Wright has accepted my invitation, Lady Veronica said, her eyes still roving over the written lines. Sir Wright? I'm not sure I know him, Kitty said, shaking the stoppered bottle of ink. They had taken to making their own ink at home for household lists, reserving the fine gum arabica for sending letters and cards. I'm not surprised, Lady Veronica said, still half reading. His title is younger than you are. She gave Kitty a significant look. It was a reward for services rendered to the Queen Mother, she explained, namely long-suffering years, keeping the regent from trouble. I'm not sure whether to pity him or demand that he return his title for a job poorly done, Kitty said, her pen hovering expectantly. Well, in any event, he took his generous pension and limited holdings and has expanded them significantly. Unlike the others, he won't be easily swayed by sentiment or scandal. Lady Veronica continued, watching Kitty as she scratched out some quick notes. How shall you approach him then? Kitty asked, dipping the quill and tapping the excess ink off. Well, it would seem that his time with the Prince Regent has worn off on him. He has an insatiable appetite for good food, good wine and pretty girls, Lady Veronica said casually, running her fingers through the fur on Quincy's head. I suppose the real challenge then is how to make a dinner sufficiently grand Wait, pretty girls? Kitty asked, realisation dawning. Oh, you can't possibly mean to serve me up on a platter at this dinner? Honestly, Catherine, the stage is missing a virtuoso theatrical performer in you, Lady Veronica sighed. Of course not. 
he simply is susceptible to a pair of fluttering eyelashes and charming smiles. If he has the opportunity to think that he is saving a hapless, helpless, charming young lady from ruin, then he will leap at the chance. I'm not sure how to feel about this, Kitty said, ink laden quill resting on the page, causing an ink blot. I should hate to think you've forgotten how to be a charming ornament to a dinner party, Lady Veronica said with a sidelong look at Kitty. Of course, you have permission to wear one of the gowns you brought with you just this once, mind. That was a tempting prospect. It seemed silly, a shallow and flippant thing to be so taken with the prospect of wearing a pretty dress again that she was willing to do the very thing she had been trying to escape. This is on my terms this time, Kitty thought, and I do not do it for my own selfish ends, nor even Lady Veronica's. We both simply wish to save Seth's legacy. A stricken look passed over her face when she invoked Seth's name before she could stop it, and Lady Veronica clearly saw it. I know that I have asked much of you, she said, her face soft and serious for once. Risking Quincy's displeasure, she leaned forward, putting one hand on Kitty's forearm. I will understand if you do not wish to be party to this. Truthfully, I have no real right to ask it of you, and will not think less of you should you decline. No, it's not that, Kitty replied with a shake of her head. It's just, well, I know the staff are rather anxious about their positions and wages, and I should feel very guilty if I were to dine in splendour when they have done so much to see us through. Lady Veronica withdrew, sitting up straight against the back of the chair again. You have become quite close with them. It was less of a question and more a statement of fact. Kitty hung her head a little, wavering back and forth, sure that Lady Veronica would tell her off. Instead, the Viscountess appeared thoughtful, absently playing with the little triangles that were Quincy's ears. I will not fault you for this, for it is a poor mistress indeed who is cold and unfeeling to her servants, Lady Veronica said quietly, and their loyalty is the greatest asset they have, one that must be cultivated carefully. I know that there is a fashion for cruelty and depravity to them sometimes, to treat them as if they are not entirely human, but this is a folly, I say, they are a resource that must be jealously guarded. Kitty stared. This was not what she had expected, not at all. Though Lady Veronica's motives were perhaps not as pure as one might have wished, there was no denying that she meant what she said. Kitty knew that Lady Veronica had quietly sold a painting and a pair of pearl earrings to ensure that every servant she had to dismiss left with a pocket full of wages to tide them by. She thought it had been done simply to keep them from gossiping. But now... But you need not worry, Lady Veronica said, her face lifting in one of the rare few smiles that Kitty had ever seen her make. My son has not forgotten me. He has deposited quite a sum into the household account and given the bank instructions to allow me permission to draw upon it as needed. Your son, Kitty breathed. He is... He's well, then. He's all right. It would seem so. I've had far fewer letters than I would have hoped for, but that is his way. He has always preferred to make himself known through actions rather than words, Lady Veronica said, eyes distant and gentle. I know, Kitty nearly blurted, but bit down cruelly on her tongue to stop herself from speaking out of turn. The pain was bright and sharp in her mouth, helping her to focus on the matter at hand. She couldn't get sentimental over a few sovereigns in the bank. She had a real duty to do, something that could be of material use to her beloved Seth. Then let us begin, she said instead, determination making her voice strong. If this Sir Wright must be charmed with luxury and petticoats, then that is precisely what we shall do. Chapter 19 with the luxurious allowance of two new tapers for her candlesticks, the satins and silks hung in the cedar wardrobe of Kitty's small dressing room gleamed dully. They were lined up exactly as she had left them, some with a sheet of plain white cotton or paper between them 
to discourage creasing and colour loss. Timidly, as if she could scarcely believe that she was going to feel them on her skin again, she reached forward slowly, running her hand over them. She had grown accustomed to the rough texture of the cheaper linens and cottons that had formed the basis of her wardrobe these days. The fine gowns of her past felt impossibly flimsy, as if a sturdy breeze would simply blow them away. Her hands, too, were rougher than they had been the last time she had touched these fine gowns and petticoats. The contrast was not lost on her, her hands' work reddened and rough. Lady Veronica had been ordering her to soak her hands every evening in buttermilk with rose water, but it was all for naught, though they had taken on an additional maid temporarily to help get the Cluet townhouse into shape. It was still necessary for Kitty to get her own hands dirty more often than not. She had also been given a small stipend to purchase the almond cream and lavender powder that she had eschewed during her time with Lady Veronica. They lined her dressing table now, strange and foreign, but something to be treasured in a way that Kitty never had before. She could not begin to describe the simple luxury of powdering her hands so that they slipped easily into gloves, or going to bed with her face soft from the almond cream. She chided herself for simply taking it for granted for so many years. So, here she was, the night before this all-important dinner, and Kitty Johnson, once one of the most fashionable young women in London, was in great danger of being completely undone by a dress. No, that is not quite right. It was not simply a dress, but the prospect of so many of them. She could scarcely imagine what she did with so many of them, now that her choice these days was between her grey day dress and... her grey day dress... The colour, the cut, the fabric. There was so much to choose from. And this was even before she chose what accessories to complete her ensemble. Still, it was nice to feel a little like her old self, to have some sense of who she used to be. Kitty smiled wistfully, then reached in for a particular favourite of hers. It was a fine muslin with a pattern of little pink blossoms embroidered on it. The lining was a light green, so... It gave the impression of spring flowers blooming across a field. Carefully, Kitty pulled the dress from the wardrobe, laying it out across the chair in the dressing room. It needed to air, and she wished to inspect it for any tears or damage. The hem at the bottom was a cartridge-pleated ruffle, which was in need of fluffing and starching tomorrow morning. Kitty gave one last wistful look to the dress as it was draped over the chair, waiting for her. She couldn't resist running her hand over it one last time, but quickly pulled back. Her hand did not match the delicacy of the dress anymore. Kitty's cheeks grew warm, a little ashamed, as she wondered if Seth would even know her anymore. She did not think he would turn her aside, because her hands were a little rougher, her cheeks a little thinner, but the point was that she wanted to be everything she had been for him. With a last sigh, Kitty blew out one taper and carried the other to her bedroom. As quickly as possible, she shared her day dress, petticoat and chemise. With a sigh, she untied her jumps and stood out of them, exhaling a little as she lost their support. She did not have time to linger, however, and quickly wriggled into her night rail before she could freeze. Thankfully, She'd had the foresight to put a warming pan into her bed before she went into the dressing room, and she quickly reached under the heavy quilt for the wooden handle. Her teeth beginning to chatter a little, clacking away inside her mouth, she withdrew the brass warming pan and carefully emptied those embers back into the hearth. As was her habit, no matter how tired she was, Kitty always skipped the last step or so before her bed, leaping gamely into it. Shivering, teeth still chattering, she stuffed her feet beneath the quilt, sighing with pleasure when they found the place where the warming pan had been. Meticulously, Kitty wrapped herself tightly, as if she were a Frenchman's crepe, withdrawing only one arm to unpin her braid, and then to smear the almond cream on her face. It was such a series of contradictions that it made Kitty smile a little wryly, she shed her servant-like dress and was tucked into a warm bed in the family part of the house. She put face cream on to improve her complexion and coax along her rosy cheeks, but applied it with hands that had calluses. 
Am I the world's most spoiled servant or the most wretched of society girls? She wondered out loud. The night had no answer, only a strange, nervous rolling sensation in her stomach. Twisting a little, she blew out her remaining candle, the smoke curling in the cold air and tickling her nose. She hoped that she remembered her old self properly, the way to flutter a fan, how to pour tea so that a flattering glimpse of her wrist peeked out of her sleeve. It was foolish that so much rode on one dinner, but then her life was all absurdity these days. Kitty's room boasted a window with white lace curtains, which, while fashionable and feminine, did little to help insulate against cold draughts that were always leaking in from around the window frame. It was through these curtains that Kitty could glimpse the sky as she lay in bed if she turned her head to the right. Her world was small, far smaller than it had been before she had come to live with Lady Veronica. There was little that tangibly existed for her outside of the walls of this home. Her days, and many of her nights too, defined by the work that she did within them. It had been a daunting task before she came here, to contemplate the reality of Seth going across an entire ocean, to a land that Kitty had only heard the name of. Now, it was something completely beyond her realm of understanding, the sky, clear save for a few wisps of airy clouds that drifted lazily across the sliver of moon, showed the stars to good advantage. If she tilted her head a bit so that she could gaze between two stone chimneys of a house just across the back garden, she could see the northern star. It blinked and twinkled, constant but never the same. It seemed strange that a light so far away, farther than her mind could comprehend, shone down on both herself and Seth. He too was likewise far away, unreachable. Still, like the sailors who relied on it for navigation, Kitty could feel her love and devotion guiding her like the northern star. She stared at the star until her eyelids grew heavy. When she slept, it was to dream of being lifted from her bed by a mighty, unseen force. Higher and higher she was taken until all of London was spread out beneath her like a quilt of lights that blinked out one by one. A strange weightlessness infused her whole body. Kitty looked down at herself, holding her hands out, and saw them shining so brightly she had to close her eyes. The way the light sateen lining and muslin whispered over Kitty's skin was almost enough to intoxicate her. It had been so long since she'd worn anything so light and delicate that she shivered a little as she put her arms into the sleeves, the skirt whispering around her legs. In fact, she had twisted herself into all sorts of unflattering postures so that she could see the movement of the light fabrics as she walked, earning a sigh from Elsa O'Toole, Lady Veronica's maid. She had helped her ladyship dress quickly and then been sent to Kitty. It was a rare, strange luxury to have such assistance again. They had gotten into a pattern of Elsa simply darting into Kitty's room or stopping her in the hallway to help with buttons hurriedly. Once Kitty was fully dressed, silk and wool-blended stockings tied below her knees with new blush-pink ribbons and dress in place, she sat before her dressing table and for the first time in a year let someone else's hands tend to her hair. Since Kitty was blessed with locks that curled naturally, it was simply a matter of dampening her hair and working a setting lotion through. After a brief conference, they both decided that the most successful means of styling her hair would be to pile it up near the back of her head, letting some curls fall loose over her shoulder. It was not especially modish, and on any other occasion likely to earn Lady Veronica's ire, but it spoke to a certain wild femininity as if it might all come tumbling down at any moment. Elsa added a wide silk organza ribbon about Kitty's head pink and shot through with gold thread. Carefully, Elsa added a hint of colour to Kitty's cheeks with a cream rouge, swiping it on with her fingers over her cheekbones. It was not enough to be blatantly obvious, adding more of a healthy glow to Kitty's face. Likewise, Kitty dipped a finger in and spread it over her lips, the cochineal and berries adding flavour as well as colour. When they were done, 
Kitty simply stared for a moment at the mirror on her dressing table. Her face felt like a stranger's, but also her own. It was like looking at a portrait of oneself. The features were familiar, but there was an unnatural aspect to it, a sort of highlighting and blurring of the face. Come, miss, Elsa said, chivying her along. We have not the time for idleness. Kitty shook herself a little, trying to shed the strange feeling that coursed all along her skin now. Something was most assuredly not right, but she couldn't begin to explain what it was. It's all down to this flimsy dress and this cold house, she tried to reassure herself as Elsa held out stylish, pink leather shoes for her to slip her feet into. They were cut low so that the clocking on her stockings might be glimpsed as she walked. With a last glance at her reflection, Kitty swept from her dressing room, snatching up a light shawl as she went. She was draping it loosely about her shoulders as she approached the stairs, hesitating. Lady Veronica had given her very clear instructions, and there was a plan that Kitty must adhere to. At precisely the right moment, there came a knock at the front door, which was answered by a butler hired temporarily from a London agency. When the door swung open, a distinguished gentleman in a slate grey greatcoat and dark blue top hat was admitted, along with a gust of cold air. Why, Sir Wright, what a pleasure to see you, Lady Veronica said, stepping forward from where she had been loitering in the doorway of the sitting room. It is so good of you to call on us. Yes, well, I shudder to think of the day a gentleman wouldn't feel compelled to respond to your invitation, he replied, dusting fresh snow from his shoulders. We are in the sitting room, just here, Lady Veronica said, her voice raised slightly. That was Kitty's cue. With a deep breath, she turned the corner in the hall to the stairway and slowly, deliberately began to descend. Ah, there you are, Catherine dear, Lady Veronica said, smiling up the stairs. Sir Wright turned to follow her gaze, and there was no mistaking the way that his eyes widened appreciatively when he saw Kitty coming downstairs. She gritted her teeth behind her demure smile, especially as his eyes slid down to where her ankles flashed into view from beneath her hem as she walked. Kitty could feel his gaze on her from that moment on, oily and slick as his hair. When they entered the sitting room, as they found their seats, Lady Veronica engaged him in conversation. Always, it was with Sir Wright staring sidelong at Kitty. For her part, Kitty did her best to tolerate him, making the requisite curtsy in conversation after their introductions. It isn't forever, Kitty consoled herself, laughing at one of Sir Wright's clumsy attempts at flirtation. Just get through this luncheon. Charm the rake to save Seth's home. Kitty was busy attempting to look interested, as Sir Wright regaled them with another anecdote about his time in the Regent service, when the butler opened the sitting room door again. Lady Veronica stood, clasping her hands high at her waist. Is that dinner, Stowe? She asked, looking expectantly at the butler. No, my lady, he said, and then stood aside. From behind the butler, another gentleman entered the drawing room. Unlike Sir Wright, he was tall and broad rather than lanky, his chin badly in need of a shave. He moved easily rather than mincing along quite at ease. His brown eyes were level and calm. Though he was tanned and sporting longer hair and more of a beard than when she had last seen him, Kitty would have known him anywhere. She felt her heart leap into her throat and her stomach plummet simultaneously. She might have gotten up and run to him were she not rooted firmly to the spot. All she could do was listen to her own ragged breathing, her eyes burning with tears that threatened to overwhelm. In the end, it was Lady Veronica who rushed forward, crying, Seth! Chapter 20 Seth had imagined many things on his journey home. He replayed the journey in his mind over and over again, as if he could will himself to be home faster, the winds more favourable, the waves gentler, if he simply thought about it hard enough. He had formulated and abandoned dozens of plans, unsure of how his return would be accepted by those he wanted to see most of all. He had made up his mind at long last, as he was being rocked about in a humble hammock slung below decks of the ship, on a course of action. 
No more would he be a timid boy man, perpetually caught in his father's shadow and under his mother's thumb. He had endured too much, grown too much, to continue on in that manner. His time in the wilderness had taught him not only independence, but also how to be decisive. No moment could be taken for granted. To that end, Seth had resolved to say hello to his mother, ensuring her that he was home safe and sound, and without delay to sally forth to Miss Kitty Johnson's home. Once there, he intended to ask for her hand, to spirit to her away that very evening if she was agreeable. He had allowed others to make decisions for him for long enough, and it was time he started living for himself. The very last thing he had expected on long nights, shivering in the dark, creaking bows of the ship, was to push open the door to his mother's sitting room and find the object of his longing there, waiting for him. It was like some kind of miracle, a scene from his own hopeful imagination. There Kitty was, sitting on a settee, looking for all the world like a painting come to life. She was pastoral, fresh and spring-like, a sharp contrast from the grey winter outside. Her eyes, green and wide, were shining with some unnamed emotion. Seth could not take his eyes off her, a dream-like haze colouring his vision. It was impossible to tell what was real and what wasn't for a moment. The manner in which his mother rushed to him, crying his name and throwing her arms about him, was also incongruous with the life he had known before. Lady Veronica Cluet was many things, but warm and loving were not the sort of adjectives one might have used to describe her. Yet, here she was, nearly bowling Seth over in her exuberance to see him. Seth! Oh, my darling boy! Whatever are you doing here? she asked, holding him by the arms. I have returned, he answered obviously, tearing his gaze away from Kitty with only the greatest of efforts. To stay? Lady Veronica asked, her own brown eyes staring up into his. For now, he said his attention, drawn to Kitty once again with an irresistible magnetism. Yes, I am here. Well, come in and make yourself known, Lady Veronica said, taking him by the arm and drawing him forward. It was only then that Seth noticed that there was a stranger sitting on a chair near the settee, turned toward Kitty. He was a tall, thin man, with hair that was neither blonde nor brown, plastered to his head with a quantity of pomade. He looked to be about forty or so, with a highly fashionable cut to his jacket. He rose, peering down his sharp nose at Seth. Seth, may I present Sir Alexander Wright? He is one of the gentlemen with an interest in one of your late father's building projects, Lady Veronica said, smiling benignly at the stranger. Sir Wright, this is my son, Seth. Viscount Cluet, she concluded, beaming proudly up at him. My lord, Sir Wright said, bowing only as much as was required to avoid seeming impolite. Sir, Seth answered neutrally, returning his bow. They eyed each other warily, like dogs meeting on the street who circled with their hackles raised. I had no idea we would be enjoying the pleasure of your company, Sir Wright said smoothly. He shifted his posture slightly, angling himself so that he was standing slightly in front of Kitty. All the better, Lady Veronica said hastily. Now our numbers are balanced, and my son can help to answer any of your questions. She turned to glance at Seth's rumpled travelling clothes. I imagine that you will want to change before dinner. Seth shrugged. I doubt my cases have been delivered from the dock yet. Lady Veronica gave him a pained smile. Well, then, I suppose we shall simply have to make do. Seth shrugged again. He allowed his eyes to slide back to Kitty, who was watching him with an unreadable expression. Sir Wright followed his gaze, clearly trying to subtly shift so that she was blocked from Seth's view. Oh, yes, Lady Veronica said, clearly having forgotten all about poor Kitty. This is my companion, Miss Catherine. I expect you will remember me mentioning her in my letters. I do, Seth said, stepping forward and bowing under Sir Wright's frown. Kitty's expression changed, becoming pleading. She shot a glance to his mother, then back again. Seth, 
a little bemused in spite of the strange situation, decided to play along. I am pleased to meet you as well, Miss Catherine, he said, bowing again. I can't tell you what a relief it was to know that my mother was being so carefully looked after, he added. I am so glad that you are here, was what he really said, hidden beneath the words he spoke. I am just so pleased that you have returned safely, Kitty replied. Lady Veronica prayed for your homecoming every day. I thought of you every day, was the meaning he took from her careful reply. He smiled at her gently, and for a moment they were lost in a world of their own making. Kitty's eyes still shone, and there was much emotion in their depths. Seth could not begin to imagine what strange turns had led her to accepting a place in his mother's house, but he meant what he said. He was beyond glad that she was there. A single tear spilled over Kitty's cheek, and Seth felt his own sentimentality respond in kind. He wished to rush forward, take her in his arms in a most daring fashion, and to comfort her. There was very little stopping him from doing so, really. He could drop to one knee and propose right now, if he so wished. Why, Catherine, you sentimental thing, Lady Veronica said, smiling condescendingly at her. Forgive me, Lady Veronica, Kitty said quickly, dabbing at her eyes with the back of one hand. I am just so pleased to see you reunited with your son. I know how much anxiety it has been giving you. I told you she was a soft touch, did I not, Sir Wright? Lady Veronica said, leaning toward the thin stranger, as if they were co-conspirators. Sir Wright smiled, but it was not mirthful. To Seth, he looked hungry, like a wolf that had just spotted a wounded deer, all sharp teeth and leering eyes. You did, indeed, he confirmed, turning toward Kitty again. The butler reappeared at that moment to announce dinner. Lady Veronica immediately claimed Seth's arm, that he might escort her into dinner, which left Kitty to be squired by Sir Wright. The situation left a rankled feeling in Seth's stomach, and he could not begin to explain why. It was clear that something was at work here that he had no clue of, and it unsettled him. I've been back in society for all of five minutes, he groused, and I am reminded of why I hate it so. What schemes and duplicity have I wandered into now? Though he was warm and safe, he could not help but think longingly of the harsh wilderness he had left behind. Lady Veronica was chattering away amiably, instructing the staff to lay another place as they made their way to the dining room. Seth could have been mistaken, but he swore that he saw a panicked look pass between a maid and the footman. He was clearly not expected, but that should not be enough to put the house into a tizzy. Seth frowned. There was clearly more at work here than he had imagined. Oh, ho, ho, Miss Johnson, you are too amusing, Sir Wright said from behind them. Seth felt his frown quickly turning to a scowl and had to work to smooth his face. He had spent so long simply being Seth instead of Viscount Cluet that he had forgotten how to school his expressions carefully into acceptable masks. Something about this man needled Seth and he could not figure out what it was. Well, beyond the fact that he seemed to assume that Kitty was to be served up to him alongside dinner. That was certainly reason enough for Seth to detest the man. He craned his neck, catching a glimpse of Kitty holding to Sir Wright's elbow. She was smiling up at Sir Wright, ignoring Seth entirely now. During his time in the Canadian wilderness, he had seen storms whip up out of nowhere. One moment, it would be a mild, if slightly windy day, and he would be in his shirt sleeves cutting wood. In the next moment, a thunderhead was pouring over the nearby hills, rolling across the sky in great roiling waves. The entire settlement would have to scramble to secure their belongings and livestock as the wind turned violent. The skies would loose a barrage of hail and rain, lightning cracking across the sky and down into the forest. That was precisely how Seth felt now. He had been full of hope and relief from the moment his hired horse turned onto the street his mother's house was on. Seeing Kitty here, in his very own home, was more than he could have ever expected. It was a joyous surprise, 
one that filled him with the same kind of optimism that a warm, sunny day did. Now, with a word, a gesture, Seth could feel his own mood blackening, storms gathering and ready to charge down the hills at any moment. He cast a last glance at Kitty as they entered the dining room. She ignored him again, only letting her eyes dart up to his once. She positively glowed in the candlelight for a moment as she waited for the footman to help her with her chair. Then she was lost behind the dishes, piled high with food, the polished candlesticks and the floral arrangements. Though they were closer than they had been for over a year, there might as well have been a whole forest between them. They were together, but alone, cut off. Not for long, Seth thought to himself. It was both comforting and a promise that he intended to keep. Chapter 21 Keep your head down, Kitty repeated to herself, over and over like a liturgy. Do not look at him. Do your duty. Humiliation and embarrassment did not make for good dining companions, and they soured the taste of all the food on the table. This was more than a little bit of a shame, for Cook had been given permission to flex her skills. The smells from the dishes alone would have been enough to whet even the pickiest of appetites. Glazed fruits, sugar sculptures, a large roasted joint of meat, game pies with decorative crusts, and every manner of roasted vegetable was spread across the table. Orange blossoms and lavender were scattered about the table too, peeking from between the dishes. There were also different wines on offer, arrayed in different glasses like jewels. Sir Wright seemed pleased by this fact, taking frequent and generous swigs from the wine glasses. He ate little, taking portions from everything, tasting with relish as if he were there simply to assess the quality of the cooking. Kitty knew that it was her job to keep Sir Wright happy and entertained, and she did her very best. She called upon all of her years of training, all of her skill in society to complete this task. It was daunting, for Sir Wright had long been in the company of the Prince Regent, and was used to that set. They had a certain reputation, and Kitty was not sure how she could keep up with that and still maintain her self-respect. Still, she figured the safest course of action would be to laugh appreciatively at all of his attempts at humour, blushing prettily. This seemed to mollify him a bit, which was about all she could be expected to manage as she pretended to eat. She was also grateful for Lady Veronica's penchant for large floral arrangements on the table. This allowed Kitty to pretend that Seth was not there at all, for he was completely blocked from her view. If she'd had to endure this ghastly dinner with Seth's eyes on her, she was not sure she could cope. Don't you agree, Miss Catherine? Sir Wright asked suddenly, breaking into Kitty's reflecting. Startled, she put on one of her gentle little smiles. I'm sure that I do, Sir Wright, she said. Sir Wright did not frown precisely, but he did lift his chin a fraction, assessing Kitty. She was not sure what she had just agreed to, but she knew that it was imperative that she be on her guard. No time for daydreaming, she chided herself. Lady Veronica has told me that you are quite a clever girl, Sir Wright said, lifting his red wine glass and swirling it about a little. I'm wondering now if she was being entirely truthful, he continued, not even bothering to look at her. From across the table, Kitty could hear a chair scrape against the floor. Desperately, Kitty took a chance and stretched her leg out as far as she dared, tapping Seth on what she hoped was his shin. It would not do to cause a scene, not now. Lady Veronica is always most generous in her praise, Kitty said, turning a beatific look upon her benefactor. For instance, she described yourself as a stalwart example of a gentleman, she continued, fluttering her eyelashes a little. Sir Alexander quirked an eyebrow at Kitty, his mouth pursing slightly. He was caught. Either Lady Veronica was a shameless flatterer, or she had lied regarding Kitty. He inclined his head again, acknowledging the predicament. That's kind of her to say, Sir Wright said at last. I am used to being invited to dinners and having young ladies flung at me from every quarter, he continued. They seem to think that simply because I was the prince's attaché for years, that I will bring them into rarefied circles. It is nice to hear genuine praise for once, 
from someone who surely has no ulterior motives. Kitty glanced at Lady Veronica, who was busy staring daggers down the table. Oh, Kitty said with a light laugh, dabbing at her mouth with her napkin. Sir Wright's eyes followed the motion, his fingers curling a little more tightly about his wine glass. My mother taught me long ago the best way to deal with powerful men in such high positions, she said coyly. Oh, and pray tell, what is that? Sir Wright asked, turning a little more toward Kitty. A bit of his wine sloshed over the rim of his glass as he did so, landing on the white lace tablecloth. The stain began to immediately spread unseen or ignored by the one who had made it. To agree with everything they say, naturally, Kitty said, lifting her eyes slowly to Sir Wright's. And if they have become too intoxicated by wine or beauty, then to distract them until they remember their better selves again. Here she paused, and without thinking twice, she lifted a dish with little frosted cakes each decorated with a pattern of candied rose petals on the top. Have you tried one of these? They are most excellent. Cook always adds a splash of orange water to the batter, so delicate but decadent. Sir Wright stared for a moment, his eyes flicking from the platter of cakes to Kitty's face and back again. Slowly, a strangely pointed smile began to spread across his face. Perhaps... You are more clever than I had allowed for, he said, as if bestowing a gracious honour upon her. Why, Sir Wright, you must take care that such praise does not go to my head. Kitty said with such sincerity as to be almost nonsensical. Sir Wright, clearly sensing her sugary sarcasm, only smiled again, arching one brow. Kitty stared back, refusing to be cowed even though she knew that it was imperative to the part she was going to play. She forced herself to remain focused on his eyes, grey and cold, rather than the rest of his face, so sharp and angular. Perhaps I will have to call on you again, he said finally. From somewhere behind the ferns and flowers on the table, directly across from Kitty, there came a choking sound. Kitty ignored it likewise ignoring the pointed look that Lady Veronica sent to Seth. This is as it should be, Kitty said, turning her eyes at last down to her plate. She forced herself to make a show of moving the food about on her plate again, a pantomime of eating. Thankfully, Lady Veronica came to her rescue, keeping Sir Wright engaged in conversation. She and Veronica had come up with a carefully constructed plan. It was Kitty's job to appear innocent and beguiling, an ornament meant to keep Sir Wright's interest. When the time was right, Lady Veronica would swoop in and begin to hint around business, testing the waters. Seth's arrival, however, was an unknown quantity. Kitty, too, began to quickly realise that Sir Wright did not simply want a willing waif. There were plenty of those at court and everywhere else, willing to throw themselves at him for influence and understood that he would find a challenge far more intriguing. Once the farce of a dinner was concluded, complete with a dessert course of wiggling, jiggling puddings that delighted Sir Wright, the party rejoined in the sitting room. The gentlemen were offered brandy, while the ladies enjoyed cups of coffee served in delicate teacups. Under the guise of welcoming back her son, Lady Veronica left Kitty to Sir Wright's tender mercies, while she remained locked in conversation with Seth. Kitty sat on the very edge of the settee, as if she might spring up at any moment. She did not dare to allow herself to relax or appear at ease, lest she let her guard down, or Sir Wright take the wrong meaning from her posture. To her dismay and alarm, Sir Wright plonked himself down directly next to her. It's a touching sight, is it not? he asked, nodding towards Seth and Lady Veronica, who were talking in hushed tones on the far side of the room. It is, Kitty asked, feeling her expression soften a little. It's nice to see someone get a happy ending. Is it? Sir Wright asked. I am not sure I would call it just that. Oh, Kitty asked, lifting her coffee cup so that her hands would have something to do. And why is that? 
Well, the boy has returned, but their situation remains precarious, Sir Wright said with an off-handed shrug. Unless, of course, something has changed in the months he was gone. He lifted his brandy glass, peering into it as if trying to discern the future. I'm not privy to the family's financial status, of course, Kitty said, lowering her tone conspiratorially. But I cannot imagine that they are in such dire straits. Can you doubt it after such a splendid dinner? Sir Wright offered another shrug, his face somehow coming over more lean and pinched. It was perfectly adequate, but, of course, I am used to rich fare. What a pity, Kitty replied, tutting a little. I will concede that dessert was quite good, Sir Wright allowed, as if making a great concession on Kitty's behalf. I imagine that is because it reminded you of the Prince Regent, Kitty retorted snappily, thinking of the younger George's propensity for sugar and drink. The puddings at dinner had jiggled and shook in such a manner as to be reminiscent of the future king. Sir Wright's head whipped around to stare at Kitty. He would have to be a fool to not understand her meaning. She could feel him staring at her, but she remained cool and unperturbed, sipping her coffee. And why is that? he asked at last, his tone unreadable. Kitty turned back around to him as if she had already forgotten the comment. Well, as I understand it, His Highness has a great fondness of sweets, Kitty said, all apple-cheeked smiles. You must have more than your share of wonderful treats. Sir Wright was sitting close enough that Kitty could feel the tension leave his body. Yes, I was fortunate enough to sample the pleasures of the prince's table quite often, Sir Wright said. His Highness has a great dessert chef in his employ that travels with him. Fancy that, Kitty said, her voice a little flat. It was difficult to carry on a neutral conversation when discussing the profligate who would inherit the throne. Kitty had never been particularly fond of him finding his excess distasteful. She could feel Sir Wright watching her again with those cold, grey eyes of his. Idly, Kitty wondered how someone who dined with the prince as regularly as Sir Wright allegedly did could sport such hollow cheeks and thin frame. You don't fool me, you know, he said suddenly, taking Kitty quite by surprise. I beg your pardon, she asked, setting down her coffee cup a little harder than was wise on the saucer with a clatter. You have all the outward appearance of a sweet little English rose, he said, his eyes boldly sweeping over her from head to toe. It was all Kitty could do to keep her lip from curling in distaste. But you are a sharp little thing, aren't you? I'm not sure I take your meaning, Sir Wright, Kitty said, tossing her head. Do not try that demure, fawn-eyed act with me, he said, leaning closer. Instinctually, Kitty shifted backward and sideways, feeling the arm of the settee pressing against her side. You might wish to pretend that you are a sweetling, all smiles and rosy cheeks, but there is something lurking within you. I wager that you have quite the razor tongue in your mouth, he continued, his gaze flicking boldly down to her lips, which Kitty pressed into a thin line. I wager it would not take much persuasion to turn you into quite the formidable little fighter. Persuasion? Kitty repeated, drawing herself backward as much as she dared, without looking as if she were actually fleeing, sir. Right. He leaned closer still, looming. One bony arm across the back of the settee now. Kitty could smell the brandy on his breath, and it made her nose wrinkle a little. I think that all you would need is a little nudge, with the right man to guide you, and you could cut a swathe through the tongue. And... I suppose you believe you are that man? Sir Wright did not smile so much as leered at Kitty. I know that I am. He shifted closer, angling his torso so that Kitty was truly trapped. I wonder how much trouble I will be in if I kick him in the shin, Kitty thought wildly. She knew logically that she should not, that too much was riding on him having a good opinion of the household. And yet, the temptation was there, as well as a healthy dose of righteous indignation. Sir Wright, a deep voice said flatly from behind him. Seth, Kitty sighed inwardly. Frowning a little, Sir Wright turned a little to address the interruption, and then was seized abruptly upward, 
It was only after the fact, when Sir Wright was standing before Seth, that she understood what had happened. Seth, in a pretense of familiarity, had taken Sir Wright by the hand and hoisted him upward, shaking it all the while as if they were great friends. Seth still had hold of his hand, refusing to release him. "'Can't thank you enough for paying a call this evening,' Seth was saying. "'It's such a relief to know such men of your calibre of honour were watching over my household.' Fascinated, Kitty watched as the expression on Sir Wright's face changed from one of annoyance to realisation, and then to a poorly concealed grimace. She glanced down to their clasped hands and saw that Sir Wright was clearly trying to wrangle his hand free. Seth, implacable and unconcerned, merely maintained a steady grip. Though he showed no outward signs of effort, his expression serene even, Kitty had little doubt that Seth could quite easily crush Sir Wright's hand to the consistency of one of the puddings they had just eaten should he so choose. It was my privilege to do so, Sir Wright responded tightly. Under the low candlelight, Kitty thought she could see beads of perspiration dotting his forehead. I'm glad we understand each other, Seth replied evenly, finally releasing Sir Wright's hand. I have already rung for your carriage. I know what a busy man you are. We shouldn't keep you for the whole evening. Sir Wright nodded, and to his credit, he did not rub at his hand as he clearly wanted to. He settled for flexing his fingers, bowing stiffly to the assembled. Thank you for a most illuminating evening, he said. I will be calling again to resume our negotiations. He paused, then turned his icy eyes to Kitty. And to conclude our conversation. Kitty, so that she would not stick her tongue out like a misbehaving schoolboy, smiled with her teeth clamped tightly together and dipped her head instead. Sir Wright seemed to be placated by this. He turned and exited the sitting room, clearly attempting to pretend that his departure was his own idea all along. Was all of that really necessary? Lady Veronica said into the heavy silence that followed. The ticking of the hall clock followed her words, marking the passing of the seconds with infuriating regularity. Yes, it was, Seth stated at last turning slowly to glance at Kitty. His tone brooked no argument. Chapter 22 The unknown uncertainty had very little appeal for Kitty these days. Her situation had been too perilous, too nebulous, for her to enjoy mystery and, and intrigue the way that she once had. She had developed an appreciation for the practical and tangible, she supposed this was a symptom of her being forced at long last to grow up. She was, after all, now a woman of five and twenty, staring spinsterhood in the face. To that end, the uneasy nature of the evening weighed heavily on her when she at last took to her bed. She laid there, the quilt pulled tightly up to her chin, and stared at the ceiling. In the dark, scenes played over and over in her mind. It was obvious that Sir Wright was intrigued by her, too much clearly. This was a point weighted in their favour when it came to negotiating with him. The trouble was, Kitty doubted that he would be content with a simple flirtation. She would not be surprised if he presumed that she was part of the bargain. And then, there was Seth. He had behaved gallantly, by some measure, but Lady Veronica clearly fretted that he had insulted Sir Wright. Kitty doubted this and said as much that evening when she was conversing with Lady Veronica before she retired to bed, as was their custom. That man is far too used to getting what he wants, Kitty had said, sneering a little. That is true, Lady Veronica allowed. He did only seem to take a real interest in you when you became a little impertinent. Precisely, Kitty agreed. The idea of being put off by anyone is probably the most interesting thing to happen to him in weeks. Their conversation had placated Lady Veronica, putting her mind at ease. It seemed a little unfair that she could be troubled by anything when Seth had returned, but that was not for Kitty to say. An errant stick popped in Kitty's fireplace, bits of kindling left from starting the fire in her grate. It was a nice luxury, being allowed such a built-up fire before bed. Her hands, too, felt oddly soft, 
no cracks or roughness from the cold or scrubbing. It was a day of odd contrasts, and it made sleep elusive. It certainly, absolutely, was not because of the undeniable knowledge that Seth was sleeping down the hall, tucked safely into his own bed. True enough that his room was in the opposite wing of the house, but that was closer than he had been for more than a year. It boggled the mind. He's home. He's safe. That was all that you asked for, isn't it? She asked herself. That was true, too, that she had been only asking for his safe return and nothing more. She had no hopes or expectations about what he might intend for her, particularly given the nature of their parting. He had made it clear that she should not expect anything from him because of his reduced circumstances. And what possible explanation could she possibly give for pushing into his home like this? It was absurd at best, insane at worst. She did not want to be another Claire Claremont chasing a disinterested nobleman all across Europe. That was a sobering thought indeed, one that caused Kitty to reach up and scrub at her face with both hands. They had not had time to talk, which was intentional on Kitty's part. She had fled upstairs at the earliest opportunity, completely dodging Seth. No point in wallowing now, Kitty muttered to the dark stillness of her room. It was not likely that she would sleep, and the longer she stayed up there, the more she would make herself miserable. Besides which, she had little doubt that quite a quantity of dishes had piled up below stairs. Despite their small windfall and influx of cash, Kitty knew that they were still desperately short-staffed. Resigned, Kitty threw back her quilt, inhaling sharply at the cold as it rushed over her. Ignoring it, she slipped quietly from her bed, knowing good and well that the floor in her room creaked particularly badly in the cold. Deftly, she traded her night rail for a chemise, wriggling into her jumps easily. She pulled on a morning dress and tied a ribbon about the loose curls on her head, leaving the rest in the customary braid cascading over her shoulder that she wore to bed. She had become accustomed to navigating the house without the aid of tapers, what with their limited means. Without much thought, her feet knew where to step to avoid squeaky boards, and her hands found the banister on the stairs easily. When she reached the bottom of the stairs, because no one was looking, she hopped over the last stair, using the banister for leverage so that she turned the corner at the same time. It was quiet and even darker in the servants' area downstairs. She did not dare to hop down these stairs at all, for they were unforgiving stone. There was always an oil lantern left by the bottom of the stairs, however, and this was thankfully still lit. She carried it with her, finding her way into the kitchen. As she suspected, there was still much to be done, though Cook and the scullery maid had made good progress. With a sigh, Kitty took up her customary apron and put it on as she made her way to the cold pantry. She had not eaten much at dinner, and it would not do to begin scrubbing on an empty stomach. She found some fruit tarts and slices of roast beef and from the dairy took out some cheese and butter. Her arms thus loaded, she made her way back into the kitchen proper, hoping the stove was still a little warm. Ah, I see, I am not the only one hunting for victuals. Kitty nearly dropped all of the procured food in shock, barely managing to muffle a shriek. The voice had spoken out of total darkness, scaring her out of her wits. I'm so sorry, Seth said, stepping forward into the circle of light made by the lantern. He darted forward, taking the things out of Kitty's arms. I thought you had seen me. I never meant to. Are you all right? With one hand on her stomach, the other helping to steady herself on the sturdy wooden work table, Kitty gulped down a few deep breaths. You gave me such a start, she breathed. I shouldn't be surprised if I've gone grey. Here. Sit, Seth said, pulling over one of the stools. The servants sometimes sat in while they shelled peas or polished the silver. Kitty accepted gratefully, sitting for a moment. She avoided Seth's gaze, who looked at her expectantly. What are you doing down here? She asked at last. I did not have much of an appetite at dinner, he responded, pulling up another stool on the opposite side of the heavy table. 
Truthfully, I did not eat much on the crossing back to England either. Rough seas? Kitty asked, nodding sympathetically. She had heard her own brother complain many times about that. No, a rough cook, Seth replied. In spite of herself, Kitty laughed. Yes, I've heard those ships' cooks can be deadly. You've no idea, Seth muttered darkly. Never want to see a piece of hard tack again. He paused for a moment, tilting his head curiously. What are you doing down here? Kitty shrugged, attempting to appear nonchalant. I could not sleep, and I, too, did not have much enthusiasm for dinner. Besides which, she said, nodding toward the sink and counters that were piled high with pots and pans. I thought I might give Cook a head start for tomorrow morning. Seth followed the direction of her nod, then seemed to truly look over Kitty. You are in the habit of helping Cook? I am, she confirmed. I do a bit of whatever needs done these days. To that end, she said, sliding from her stool and making her way to the stove. Cautiously, she put her hand on it. Well, at least it's not gone totally cold, she said. With practised ease, she opened one of the doors and began piling in, wide in little bits of kindling from a nearby stack. She withdrew one of the paraffin-dipped reeds from the canister on the shelf over the stove and motioned at Seth. Bring that lantern over, would you? She asked. He complied and she opened it up, using the small flame within to light one end of the reed. Carefully, mindful of the danger of dripping paraffin, she brought it to the stove. After a couple of false starts, the kindling took and began to crackle. Gently, Kitty blew on it to encourage the small flame. Once sure it was properly lit, she closed and latched the little door, stood and opened some of the flues to ensure airflow. Once she was satisfied that the fire was crackling away, she located a shallow cast iron skillet, and after lifting one of the dampers, placed it over the licking flames. Wordlessly, she located a cutting board and began cutting the bread, having put a couple pats of butter into the skillet. She was aware that Seth was watching her closely, and it made her uneasy. She couldn't begin to imagine what he was thinking, what he might have thought of her now. She was no longer the carefree, light-hearted young society lady that she had once been. Her hands were work roughened, her smiles a little more rare than they might have been when he had left. What are you making then? Seth asked softly, watching her work with a curious gleam to his face. Sippets, Kitty answered easily. I am rather fond of them. She paused. I hope this meets approval with your lordship's palate. Seth smiled slowly. Don't worry yourself on my account, he reassured her. Heaven knows I've been eating rougher than this for quite some time now. Besides, I'm rather partial to butter myself. Satisfied, Kitty continued to cook. Once the sipets were well toasted and covered with butter, she pulled the skillet from the stove, but left the damper off so that the kitchen was a little warmer and lighter. With a gesture, she invited Seth to eat with her as she took up her stool again. They ate in companionable silence, neither of them entirely sure what to say. It was a strange situation, to say the least, and Kitty had no idea how to even begin addressing the wide gulf between them. I'm not sure what the proper conversation is in this situation, Seth admitted. Kitty smiled wryly. I am fairly certain that we are long past the bounds of propriety. Seth nodded, chewing slowly. It's a little strange to be having any conversation, really. Why is that? You can't mean you were alone the whole time you were in the wilderness, Kitty said. Seth shook his head. No, but... Not the same. It feels... different. I'm different. Kitty could not help but give him an appraising look. This much was clearly true. He was dressed in trousers and a crisp shirt, with a quilted dressing gown over top for warmth. Even so, it was clear that he had lost a bit of weight, his waist narrowing and his shoulders broader than ever. His face, always handsome, had lost all of the boyishness, with cheekbones and chin more prominent. I suspect that we are both very different people from who we were just a year ago, Kitty said softly. Seth smiled and nodded, a little sadly. That is true. 
I was quite fond of the old kitty. And what of this new kitty? Seth's smile widened. Well, she makes a decent sippet, so I am inclined to think favourably of her. Kitty scoffed and tossed a piece of pie crust at him. A decent sippet, he says, as if he did not sit there and eat a half a dozen all on his own. Seth chuckled, a deep rumbling from within his chest. So, I've learned to cook sippets. What did you learn in your absence? Seth looked thoughtful, a kind of faraway expression coming over him. To chop wood, he answered finally. I suspect it was a great deal more than that, Kitty said, biting into a fruit tart. She was pleased to discover that it was cherry, one of her favourites. I suspect, Seth said slowly, that we have both learned quite a bit. I also suspect that you are the reason the house has continued to run at all in my absence. He hesitated, then looked down at his hands. It could not have been easy. It has been a different sort of education, I'll admit, Kitty allowed. But it was a choice I made myself. When my mother wrote to me of her companion named Catherine, I never would have believed it to be you, Seth said, one side of his mouth pulled up into a crooked smile. Can't believe you spent all these months with her without strangling each other. There were moments I was tempted, I will own to that, Kitty said with an answering grin. Of course, the real tyrant of the house everyone has grown to fear is Quincy. Quincy? Kitty lowered her voice, looking about as if she expected him to spring forth at any moment. That incorrigible dog you saddled us with. Oh, that bad, is he? Seth said, his grin spreading. I would suggest you take to wearing your boots at all times if you value your ankles, Kitty said. She paused, then added, or your stockings. Seth chuckled again, which made Kitty laugh softly too, around another mouthful of tart. His face became serious then, as he stared at her from across the table, and he leaned forward a little. I hope Mother did not... That is, she should not have asked you to do anything that you were... That was in poor taste, he said haltingly, his eyes searching Kitty's. I would be lying if I said that it had been easy, or that she hadn't taken some kind of liberties, Kitty admitted. But I couldn't let all of this come down around her ears, not while you were gone. What would you have come home to? If she intimated that you should be given to Sir Wright in some kind of transaction, I will... He began hotly with more temper than Kitty had ever seen him display. She rolled her eyes a little. She did not, she said firmly, waving him off. And I was not a damsel in need of rescuing, either, for that matter, she stated firmly. He was distressing you, Seth objected. Did I look distressed, Kitty retorted. No, Seth allowed grudgingly. You looked contemplative. Kitty grinned again feeling more like her old self than she had thought possible. That is because I was contemplating where to kick him. Seth laughed again, which evaporated the rest of the tension. You'd crush your poor toes in those little slippers you were wearing. Shame. About my toes. Or the slippers. Both. They were pink. Your favourite colour. Kitty laughed again, secretly delighted that he had remembered. Then we have established that he was not, in fact, distressing me. More of an annoyance than anything. Fine, Seth sighed, grumbling a little. Perhaps he was distressing me. Well, I would advise you to take firm hold of your scruples. I suspect that we will be seeing more of him, for he still holds some of your finances in his grasp, Kitty warned. A dark look came over Seth's face. They were silent for a moment. Then, he said slowly, a glint in his eye, perhaps you ought to consider wearing boots at all times as well. And why is that? Kitty asked. More leverage for kicking. Laughter seized Kitty then, and Seth joined in, both of them uproariously taken with humour. This was the manner in which the scullery maid found them grey light in the high kitchen windows beginning to filter in. The girl said nothing, but gave Kitty a knowing look. 
Chapter 23 You wish to throw a ball? Seth said, incredulity colouring his voice. He was in the drawing room, watching as his mother sat upon a velvet upholstered lounge. She patted the seat next to her and, at first, Seth thought that she meant to invite him to sit next to him. A small bundle of flax-coloured fur arrived there first, however, turned about in a circle, and then stared at him with little shining eyes. It is not really a difficult concept to understand, Seth, Lady Veronica said, patting Quincy on the head, which caused the dog's tongue to loll out. We must quickly squash any of these persistent rumours about our straightened circumstances. It is time for you to take your place in society now that you've returned. Seth took a deep breath, then straightened. Not sure I want to take my place, or any other in society for that matter. It will probably be necessary for me to go overseas again. No, that is all done now. You yourself said that it was all a success, Lady Veronica said with a wave of her hand. For now, Seth argued, that could all change, and I wish to ensure that our interests are really secure. Also need to be fair to the people in our employ. That caused Lady Veronica's nostrils to go a little pinched. That is a whole other matter that needs to be discussed. You cannot possibly pay these people, labourers, with an interest in the timber sales. I can and I have, Seth replied coolly. To do so is the easiest way to ensure that they are as profitable as possible. Well, that I may grant, Lady Veronica allowed. But that does not change the fact that you must take your position in society. There is likely a role for you to play at court, even to be of service to... That life is not for me, mother, Seth replied evenly. The hand that was patting Quincy paused. The pup, objecting to the loss of attention, let out a sad little whine. It is for you, Seth, because you are the Viscount Cluet. I refuse to endure another absentee Viscount simply because of a whim. Seth knew better than to press the point just now. It was far better to let it be for a while, and then approach the conflict with renewed interest later, after Lady Veronica had time to stew upon it. He changed tack, saying, We are only just up on our feet, mother. This is surely not the most prudent time for a ball. It is the only time for a ball, Lady Veronica insisted. You do not know what I have done to keep this family from succumbing entirely to shame and ruin. We are balancing upon a knife point, and we need the ton's good opinion. The ton or Sir Wright, Seth countered. Both, Lady Veronica replied testily. Does it matter? Honestly, Seth, it seems that your time at the frontier taught you how to argue and nothing more. You never used to talk this much. I know, he agreed softly. You look over the plans and debts that your father left, and then decide what is necessary. Lady Veronica continued as if he had not spoken at all. You are as stubborn as your father ever was. For pity's sake, even that fool girl upstairs knows why this is important. Do not speak ill of her, Seth warned, his voice and face hardening alike. She is a good girl, and you cannot pretend that she has done much for our family. We are in her debt. Lady Veronica snorted derisively. Perhaps so, but she has come to use it for her own ends, not altruism. Do not forget that, either. What do you mean? Seth asked, but was interrupted by the drawing room door opening. Kitty entered but she was dressed in such a way that Seth at first did not recognise her. Her hair was scraped back from her forehead and braided, pinned tightly to the back of her head. She wore a nondescript day dress of such plainness that it was almost Spartan. Seth could not help but stare, wondering if this creature was really the same person that ate purloin tarts with him the night before. She carried a stack of letters and papers with her and placed them carefully before Lady Veronica. Studiously, Kitty avoided Seth's gaze, no matter how much he willed her to at least spare him a glance. There is a letter from the Dowager Countess of York, and a note from Mr Forsyth that warrant the first of your attentions, Kitty said, sliding the envelopes over. Anything else I ought to be aware of? 
Lady Veronica asked, idling, flipping through the stack. Kitty hesitated, visibly troubled. So Wright has also sent a note, she said at last. Ah, well then, I suppose we shall see if we have landed in his good books, Lady Veronica said, lifting that letter first and slicing through the seal with her pearl-handled letter opener. Well, well, well. It would seem that he would like to thank all of us for a most entertaining evening and hopes to be able to pay a call again. Well done, Catherine, Lady Veronica said with relish. Who knows, you might be able to make a decent match for yourself yet. From Seth's vantage point, he could clearly see Kitty's cheeks colour. She lifted her head a little and cleared her throat. That is flattering, but I am not sure we would suit each other. Nonsense, Lady Veronica said, waving Kitty's objections away. It does not matter if you suit. What matters is security. The Baron, now, that was not a suitable match at all. Not for someone like you. Sir Wright, on the other hand. She trailed off, implication heavy. Seth and Kitty both stared at Lady Veronica for a moment, the former's head spinning as the latter's cheeks only reddened further. With your permission, I shall go speak to Cook about the menus for the rest of the week, now that Sir... His lordship is returned, Kitty said, catching herself carefully. Hmm, Lady Veronica said, only half listening. Yes, you go do that. Where was I? Ah, uh, yes, she said, her attention refocusing on Seth, in a way that made him decidedly nervous. Speaking of matches... It is high time that we find you a suitable wife, and quickly too. I have already found a suitable wife, Seth replied firmly. Lady Veronica threw her head back and laughed, nearly upsetting the white cap on her head. No, you haven't, dear heart, she said, as if Seth were a lad asking if he could keep a lizard that he found as a pet. And how do you know that? Seth demanded, feeling his temper rising again. Because I have not told you that you found a suitable wife yet, Lady Veronica retorted easily. I don't doubt that you met a very charming, pretty young thing in your travels, but that is not the sort of girl who will do for you. And what sort of girl will do for me, mother? Seth's voice was tight with barely concealed frustration. Our finances may be secure for now, but you cannot pretend that our position in society is as safe. Lady Veronica said in the manner of one who is about to deliver a homily. You may deride society and its vagaries, and I will not pretend that you do not have a point to an extent. What you fail to realise is these contracts and contacts you rely on to sell your hard-won timber, or the copper you hope to import, are only possible through favourable connections. We cannot afford to be foolish now, especially now, Lady Veronica paused, her eyes finding Seth's. He refused to cower or quell before her, but she had chosen her ammunition well. It was hard to argue with logic. For instance, surely you know that the King's Navy requires all of the timber it can possibly get. A contract to supply the wood needed for ships would go a long way to restoring our fortunes and ensuring the security of not only your children, but their children as well. Lady Veronica continued. Her grip tightened on the letter opener, and now it resembled nothing so much as a little sword in her hand. You simply cannot marry a girl with nothing. She must bring something of her own to the marriage. That is the way of things, else we shall never crawl out of this hole we find ourselves in. Seth was prepared to argue, to disagree simply for the sake of disagreeing, because there was no real argument to be made against such salient points. He was stopped from doing so, however, from an unexpected quarter. She is right, my lord, Kitty agreed softly. You need, you deserve to marry someone that will aid your cause, not hinder it. You do not wish for a life of hardship. Seth simply stared for a moment, not sure he could be hearing her right. He knew that it would be difficult for them to resume their courtship, particularly after he had departed as he had. He'd had no real expectation of success, but now that he could provide some sort of security for her. 
There was much that he longed to say to her, things that he had rehearsed on bitterly cold nights in the forest, or on days staring out at the roiling, grey, endless sea. I left for you. You were the bright star that guided me back home. I calloused my hands all for you, he thought wildly, hoping that she could hear him. They stared at each other for a long minute, silently vying with one another, with only the subtlest of expressions. If you shan't listen to me, then at least listen to her, Lady Veronica broke in, back to slicing open letters with ruthless, efficient swipes of her letter opener. The girl knows better than anyone what the past months have been like. You cannot possibly wish for us to go back to that. It is time for you to finish doing your duty. Chapter 24 There was a decided pall that had fallen over the Stanton house. It was purely nonsensical, as far as Lady Veronica was concerned. There was simply nothing to be so morose about. Her son had returned, their financial security had been insured, and though the ton might still view the family with hauteur, it wasn't as if they had fallen from grace entirely. It was more of a wobble, if it was anything at all. Lady Veronica intended to simply ignore the whole episode. If it did not exist for her, then the ton would surely follow suit. And yet, for some unfathomable reason, her house was decorated with more size than she knew what to do with. She might have been induced to think that it was simply a product of Seth being home, rather than allowed to run wild like some sort of heathen in the wilderness. He had never been allowed such a degree of freedom before, and she was inclined to believe that allowing it had been something of a mistake. Of course, she was induced into thinking that it had been a choice, rather than a matter of necessity. So great were her powers of persuasion that Lady Veronica was not even immune to them. It was quickly becoming one of those flights of fancy that young men take sometimes, a youthful escapade and nothing more. This was the story she was quickly recounting around tea tables and in fashionable parlours, always with an indulgent smile and an inconsequential wave of her hand. Catherine, too, was not immune to these odd humours. The girl had always been a little odd, prone to pert little asides and a propensity for socialising with the servants that did not bode well. Lady Veronica knew that she should not expect too much of the girl, for though her birth was relatively respectable, there was a great danger her father's foolhardiness was a family trait. Besides, it was not as if she were the daughter of a nobleman, simply the daughter of a jumped-up merchant who had gambled with the exotic trade and lost. The girl was diligent in her attentiveness, but she too seemed distracted, pensive somehow. It's all down to her situation being precarious, Lady Veronica thought to herself, adjusting her new lace-trimmed cap on her head. Catherine must be uneasy now that Seth is home and her services will not be required. Well, that was one matter that was easily settled. Lady Veronica might be a woman of decided opinions, but she was not unjust. Not consciously, anyway. Perhaps she might do a little kindness to the girl, settle some money on her for a dowry, maybe even nudge an eligible, but not too eligible, suitor her way. There, Lady Veronica murmured to herself, nodding sharply at her reflection. It was late at night, her room dark save for a couple of candles on her dressing table, and one near her bed. She tilted her head this way and that, inspecting her reflection. Lady Veronica might not ever have been described as a great beauty, but there was a certain aristocratic strength to the bones in her face, and her brown eyes were pleasingly shaped. She and her maid, O'Toole, took great pains to preserve her beauty as much as possible. Morning and night, Lady Veronica slathered herself in every sort of cream, known to, woo, man. At night, she bound her face tightly in strips of linen to halt whatever sagging might be occurring. Once a week, O'Toole would scrape her face with a smooth stone as she laid on her back, attempting to force her face back into youthful obedience. Lady Veronica's face was not yet bound, still glistening from the cream that had just been worked in. O'Toole was convinced that heat was the key and was busy hot-pressing the linen strips downstairs. 
She would then run up the stairs, the strips bundled into thick cloths to keep them warm. This has gone on long enough, Lady Veronica thought, and immediately stood from her little padded stool. Once she had decided on a course of action, she never saw a point in dilly-dallying. She would forge right on ahead, marching relentlessly to her goal. It was unlikely that anything could distract or sway her once she had established the correct thing to be done. Therefore, she was unconcerned that she was in her night rail, with only a quilted dressing gown over top. She quickly placed her feet into her fur-lined slippers, lifted a candlestick, and was off. Stepping into the hall, she did not even hesitate, having decided that she would address Catherine first. That was likely to be the easier task at any rate. It was not as if the girl could have any objections, and it was not as if a young lady could have any more complicated concerns than her lack of husband. The hallway was dark and cold, and Lady Veronica found herself stumbling into a table, nearly upsetting it. Her eyes closed in frustration, which she tamped down. A few paces further down the hall, a door opened, spilling weak light into the hallway. Catherine poked her head out of the doorway, the dark rope of her braided hair swinging from her shoulder as she leaned out. Lady Veronica? she asked. Even in the dark of the hallway, it was easy to see the surprise on her face. Is everything right? Is something the matter? Why should something be the matter? Lady Veronica sniffed, adjusting her thick dressing gown and tossing her head a little. I just thought I heard, do you wish me to fetch O'Toole? Is she taking too long? Catherine asked, her eyes looking past Lady Veronica and down the hall. No, I wish to speak to you, Catherine, Lady Veronica said. Me? Catherine asked, her dark brows shooting up as if Lady Veronica could possibly be hoping to speak to someone else at this hour, in the hall directly in front of Catherine's room. Yes, Catherine, you... Lady Veronica sighed, pushing past her and into her room. It was bold and more than a little ill-mannered, but if Lady Veronica waited for Catherine to take the hint and invite her in, they would have grown old and withered to dust by then. Without waiting to be asked, Lady Catherine took a seat on the chair in a corner, which seemed to be used only for laying out petticoats. Catherine hesitated, unsure of where she ought to go, and settled for sitting perched on the end of her bed. I wished to speak to you because I have noticed a... Well, a sort of unsettled nature about you, Lady Veronica said once Catherine was seated. Unsettled? Catherine repeated all again. You seem ill at ease since Seth has returned home, and I believe I know the reason why, Lady Veronica continued. You know the reason why? Catherine, honestly, this conversation will take twice as long as it ought to if you insist on repeating everything I say. Lady Veronica sighed, exasperated. It is late enough, and I don't want to look unrested for tea with Sir Wright tomorrow. Catherine pulled a face at that, but Lady Veronica ignored it. If she took the time to correct every single one of Catherine's quirks and misbehaviours, she could scarcely do anything else. I believe you are concerned with the matter of what is to be done with you now that my son has returned, Lady Veronica continued. Catherine's mouth pressed into a grim line, and Lady Veronica took this as confirmation of her suspicions. I should like you to know that your efforts over the past year have not been unnoticed. I know that you sometimes think me cold and callous, but I assure you that I see and appreciate your hard work. Catherine did not open her mouth to object to any of this, which was surely a tacit agreement. This was a positive sign, one that showed that the girl could be trained for a husband. As we are now restored to our rightful place and means, Lady Veronica said, lifting her chin a little, it seems only right that we use some of this recovered standing to help you find a proper husband. A husband? Catherine blurted again. Lady Veronica gave her a baleful look and the girl hurried on. If I wished to be married off, why did you encourage me to reject the Baron's attentions all those months ago? 
He was certainly not the proper husband for you, Lady Veronica sniffed. You require someone else entirely. Even I can see that you ought not be spending your life wasting away in some ancient castle on the moors. Besides, you are young and not without your good qualities. Surely we can do better for you. I, Lady Veronica, this is of course very flattering, but I am not sure I can ask you to pursue such an undertaking for me, Catherine began, her green eyes going a little wide. Why ever not? Lady Veronica demanded. Here she was, extending a great generosity to the fool girl, and Catherine was objecting as if she had suggested becoming a nun. To be perfectly honest, I am not entirely sure that I wish to marry at all, she admitted quietly. Lady Veronica stared for a moment, not sure if she could be hearing properly. Oh, you silly thing, she said at last, leaning forward and swatting Catherine gently on the knee. You nearly had me there. I thought you spoke in earnest. Why shouldn't I be speaking earnestly, Catherine retorted, her jaw tightening a little. Because, dear girl, it is the aim of every woman to obtain a husband, Lady Veronica replied without hesitation. I know that you are fond of a jape here and there, but you must prepare yourself to curb that impulse. Your husband may not appreciate your humour as much as I do. Catherine looked away sharply at that, and Lady Veronica took it as her cue to exit. She had another call to pay before she retired for bed, after all. She rose, and as she was leaving, stopped to pat Catherine's head much in the same manner that she did Quincy. The hour was getting decidedly late when Lady Veronica rapped three times on Seth's door. She did not bother waiting for an answer, simply pushing the door open. Confusion quickly settled in as she scanned his room finding the bed not only empty but perfectly made, as if it had not been laid in at all. A dozen thoughts ran roughshod through her head, from kidnappers to wondering if Seth had simply run away. What the devil is... Mother? A deep voice said, and then Seth's red head was popping up from the far side of his bed, looking about like an owl. I might ask you the same thing, Lady Veronica hissed, stepping further into Seth's sleeping chamber. Once she rounded the bed, she found Seth on the floor, a folded blanket beneath him, a pillow awaiting his head, and his large frame swaddled in a second blanket. She simply stared, blinking for a moment. Are you... are you sleeping on the floor? She demanded in a whisper, as if she feared that someone might overhear. Seth pulled his legs up a little beneath the blanket, resting his arms on them as if he hadn't a care in the world. Why shouldn't I be? more comfortable than the bed. Lady Veronica simply goggled at him for a moment, unsure of which point to address first. Because you are a Viscount now, and Viscounts do not sleep on the floor, she said, her voice somewhere between a whisper and a shout. That bed has no less than three mattresses, all of them feather. I doubt there are princes in Europe who sleep so finely, and... Seth interrupted this tangent with one of his infuriatingly casual shrugs. Feel like I'm sinking into it, like sleeping in a bog, he said. Besides, my feet stick off the end now. Lady Veronica paused, pursing her lips, the hand not holding the candlestick drilled into her hip. She glanced to the bed again, giving it a critical eye. It was a heavy, dark wooden affair, intricately carved, with posts jutting up and supporting an upholstered ceiling. It had been carved sometime during the reign of Charles II and was perhaps not the most fashionable thing in the house. Seth was a tall boy, man, and it did seem entirely possible that his legs were too long for a bed made over a century ago. Then we shall have that addressed, but you cannot be seen sleeping on the floor, Lady Veronica said at last. Who would possibly see me? Seth asked, infuriatingly calm and logical. A servant, your valet, anyone, word gets about, Lady Veronica said, growing exasperated. Don't have a valet, and like to make up my own fire. Not enough scullery maids or footmen besides, Seth added, nodding toward a small pile of wood sitting near the hearth. You, what? Lady Veronica demanded, not knowing which thing to address first. 
Where did you even get the wood? I thought we had converted to coal grates, she said at last. Chopped it myself, Seth said with another of his nonchalant shrugs. Had a tree in the garden tilting, so down it came. I, you, a tree, was all Lady Veronica managed. Seth, you are no longer in the wilds of the new world. You are in London. What would happen if one of the neighbours saw you out there chopping wood like some sort of rustic peasant? Lady Anstruther next door did not seem to mind. He replied with a little smile curling one side of his mouth. She waved her handkerchief at me from her window. Lady Anstruther is a shameless... Lady Veronica bit off her word sharply. That is neither here nor there, she continued, working hard to control her voice. I had some idea that things were out of control in this house, but I had no inclination they were this bad. It is obvious that you must be taken tightly in hand. You've had too much freedom, and it's gone to your head like strong drink. Seth simply stared back at her, his face impassive. He voiced no objections, but his quiet confidence and self-assurance nearly made Lady Veronica waver. It was a dangerous predicament. She was used to firmly controlling her entire household, including her son, but now he had reached his majority, there was little she could really hold over. A fundamental dynamic had shifted between them, and it frightened Lady Veronica. As always, this caused her to lash out. Do not sit there and stare at me like a vacant fool, she snapped. You have been allowed far too much liberty and must be reminded of your proper place. I will not have you make a fool of me and our good name all over London. Seth glanced down and for a moment Lady Veronica caught a glimpse of him as he had been when he was a boy, all shy smiles and affection. Still, she did not allow herself to be swayed. There simply was too much at stake to allow sentimentality to overcome her good sense. What you are in need of is a wife, nothing more, Lady Veronica said firmly but gentler. Then you will be settled and not so prone to these wild escapades and notions. Seth was quiet for a moment and then softly, so softly Lady Veronica almost did not hear him. He said, did marriage help settle father? He stared up at Lady Veronica unflinchingly, as if he were perfectly sincere. That is different, Lady Veronica said, biting off each word sharply, her tone crisp. Your father was... This is not about him. It is about you, and I shan't be distracted by your hypothetical queries. All that is wrong with you is that you need to marry. He looked away for a moment, his eyes distant. It seemed as if he were seeing something that Lady Veronica could not. When he spoke, it was hesitantly, like he was dipping his toes into a cold pool of water. Perhaps I do not wish to be married. Lady Veronica stared, nearly dropping her candlestick with the shock of it all. She wondered for a moment if she was living in some sort of asylum, the inmates running wild and declaring that they had no use for societal norms. What is this? Lady Veronica demanded, finally breaking loose of her astonishment. Is this some strange new fad among young people, where you all declare that you have no need for marriage? You all? Who else has told you this? Seth interrupted. That fool girl, Lady Veronica said, gesturing with an impatient wave in the direction of Catherine's room. She began to pace, unable to hold still from all the frustration and absurdity of this evening. Catherine said that she did not wish to marry. Seth repeated slowly. What does that matter? Lady Veronica cried. There was a knock on the partially open door, and Lady Veronica whirled about. Who comes now? She snapped. Tis me, my lady, O'Toole said nervously from without. It's simply that your wrappings will begin to cool and... Oh, who cares a hang about that? Lady Veronica said, reaching the limits of her patience. There was a muffled sound as O'Toole scrambled away, knowing full well when her mistress had more than enough. Lady Veronica took a deep breath in the ensuing silence, willing herself to be composed. It was exceedingly rare that she was driven to an actual outburst, and she found herself equally irritated that she had given in to the impulse 
as she was by the vexing circumstance she found herself in. This is what will happen, she said finally, her voice trembling from the effort of her control. We will begin the work of finding you a proper wife. You will conduct yourself accordingly, and we shall be all the happier for it. Seth voiced no objection, which Lady Veronica took as agreement, or, at the least, submission. Satisfied, she jerked her head in and nod once, nearly dislodging her cap. It listed like a drunken sailor over one ear, the ribbon having come loose. She did not deign to fix it, refusing to acknowledge this little annoyance. With all the dignity of a ship in full sail, she swept from Seth's room, closing the door firmly behind her. The latch clicked loudly into the darkness, but her hand lingered on the handle. It was as if she thought that if she could close the door hard enough to pull on it long enough, that it would contain all of the errant thoughts and behaviours that lurked behind it. She was close enough, therefore, to hear Seth murmur just loud enough to be heard, she doesn't want to be married. Chapter 25 With the return of Seth, Kitty was hoping to remain as inconspicuous as possible. She wished to remain unnoticed, of no more consequence than a side table in the hall that was seen so much that it scarcely warranted a second look now. She hoped, perhaps in vain, that this would give her enough time to come up with some sort of plan for what she would do now. It was clear that she could not remain here. She might not have been able to marry Seth, but she also was not going to be a spectator to the Enterprise either. But she was not sure of where she even could go. She knew that her parents had moved to a much humbler home at a much humbler address, which was a last resort. This was not bought worn of snobbery, but rather a refusal to be a pawn on their terms. She'd had enough of their scrabbling, scratching social schemes to last a lifetime. She had thought to throw herself at the mercy of Ava, her dearest friend, but she was still on an extended tour with her husband. There were other friends she might call on, perhaps Lady Chester, but the connection was tenuous at best. Moreover, she did not want to suffer the twin humiliations of pity and shame. It did not matter, for there was no respite to be had for Kitty, so she had little time to formulate a plan. In fact, she had been hustled and cajoled, rather hurriedly, from the comfortable solitude of her room by O'Toole, who looked exactly as thrilled by the prospect as Kitty felt. Herself has asked for you to attend tea with her, the maid explained hurriedly, following behind Kitty and fiddling with the pins in her dark curls. Tea? Why? Kitty asked suspiciously, hustling down the hallway and trying to push O'Toole's hands away. What are you? It's fine. I am not going to an audience with the Queen. She's in a mood. You'd best take care, O'Toole warned, pulling one last pin out so that a few corkscrew curls fell loose next to Kitty's cheek. Here, hold still, the maid instructed. With little else for warning, she reached up and whipped the white tucker from Kitty's neck. Elsa! She hissed in surprise, her neck and collarbone suddenly exposed to the cold air. Trust me, O'Toole countered, herself asked that you look as fetching as possible given the short notice. Oh, good lord, Kitty groaned inwardly. She had a sneaking suspicion that dogged her steps as she tripped lightly down the stairs to the main floor. Suspicion quickly morphed into a sinking sensation as she stopped partway down the stairs, craning her neck to see out to the street. As she feared, there was a carriage at the curb, and she already knew who it belonged to without needing to ask. No, thank you, she muttered, turning back around. But O'Toole was there, having anticipated her objections. Now, miss, you know you cannot do this, O'Toole said, herding her down the stairs. I am not some sort of performing pony that can be trotted out to entertain her guests, Kitty hissed, objecting strenuously. O'Toole who had taken her by the arm with one hand and had her other arm wrapped around Kitty's back, tipped her chin down and gave Kitty a significant look. Aren't you, though? was the silent question. Kitty had no answer. When they were before the sitting room door, Kitty made a half-hearted attempt to dig her heels in, but O'Toole had opened the door and nudged her through before she knew what was happening. 
Consequently, she had the aspect of a hare that was cornered by hounds, all wide, darting eyes. Swallowing hard, she attempted to compose herself, particularly as Lady Veronica was glaring at her with a forced smile. Ah, Catherine, there you are, she said through gritted teeth. We were beginning to wonder if you had forsaken us. The other person at the table, a man with greying blonde hair, turned about. It was Sir Wright, and when his eyes met Kitty's, his mouth curled upward into a smile that looked somehow like a snake's. He stood slowly, bowing to Catherine with a sort of self-aware irony. Catherine did n not curtsy, instead dropping a more modern bow that young ladies favoured. This caused Lady Veronica's face to tighten, her nostrils going pinched. Sir Wright noticed this, with favour, however, you are a young lady who attends the latest fashions, he observed. Though your current dress might not reflect it, he added, eyeing her drab day dress with a critical eye. Please forgive me, she said with forced sweetness. I was not expecting to entertain. It's no matter, Sir Wright said, waving Kitty over. The frame does not make the painting after all. Kitty had no response to that, for she felt certain that, no matter what she said, it would be taken as encouragement. Instead, she busied herself getting settled into the empty chair at the tea table. Lady Veronica made some attempts at small talk, which Kitty ignored, and Sir Wright answered while staring at Kitty. Catherine, dear, have you seen the map and plans for all of the buildings that we shall be building? Lady Veronica asked suddenly, startling Kitty into paying attention. I don't believe I have had that privilege, Lady Veronica. Kitty answered neutrally, unsure of where this was leading. Sir Wright has brought over some fascinating bits of paper, you see, which we have been looking at while waiting for you. Lady Veronica continued with an indulgent smile. Kitty stared back blankly, not particularly wanting to play this particular game. Perhaps you might care to see them, Lady Veronica continued her smile fading a little, as you are always so interested in the future of this house. Kitty felt quite certain that there was a pointed message in there for her, but she could not discern it. She glanced to Sir Wright, who was watching her expectantly, but curiously. I would like to know more about it, I suppose, she answered finally. I am not sure how much of it I will understand, of course. Please, Allow me to accompany you then, Sir Wright said, standing and gesturing with a sweep to a large table where various folios and maps had been laid out. Taking a deep, steadying breath, Kitty stood as well and passed before Sir Wright to said table. There was one map that was larger than the others and dominated the centre of the table. It was full of extremely tidy ink drawings, plans for shops and houses, with streets laid out on a neat grid. Some of them bore names, such as a public livery and a church, and one larger home was labelled as a school. Is this the school Lady Veronica wished to found? Kitty asked, tilting her head a little to try and understand the placement. It was hard to reconcile the lines on the page with the street she had stood on some weeks ago. Indeed it is, Sir Wright said, standing some steps away still. And a fine endeavour it is too. Educating our youth is such an important foundation for our proud empire. As long as they're boys, Kitty muttered. Sir Wright heard her and gave her a quizzical look. You can't possibly expect for us to build a school for girls when so many boys are still in need of a good education. Why can't I? Do girls not grow to women who might benefit from learning more than darning socks? Mightn't they benefit from options, Leo? Well, Kitty demanded, but instead of looking at Sir Wright, she stared straight at the Viscountess, who glanced away. It was a small victory, but one that emboldened Kitty. I did not know that you entertained such progressive notions, Sir Wright commented neutrally. I entertain practical notions, Sir Wright, Kitty countered readily, whipping her head around. She'd had enough of being cowed by this man, the tone of his gaze changed a little, and he lifted his chin in response. Or at least, 
Kitty thought that, he did, for he wore a collar that was so tall and stiffly starched that Kitty was not sure if he had a complete chin, or jaws, for that matter. Satisfied, she turned her attention back to the plans laid out before her. She appreciated the neat and tidy nature of it, the ease with which the streets might be navigated. So, what think you of the Viscount's ambitious undertaking? Sir Wright asked, leaning on one hand against the desk. It does seem a marvellous enterprise, Kitty admitted, though I must confess that I have some difficulty in understanding all of the plans. Ah, that is because you must imagine them as buildings, and not simply squares on paper, Sir Wright said, overlaying his hand atop Kitty's. She resisted the urge to shake him off and slide her hand away, certain that he would simply enjoy the challenge. Take this little patch here, he continued, and now imagine that it is a house, rising up like this. He lifted their joined hands a few inches. I see, Kitty said. This is to be a large structure then, she asked, trying hard to keep him focused on the subject at hand, and not on taking liberties. Sir Wright gave her a wry smile. I do intend to build a modest house on the property, he said, he released her hand to leaf through another stack of papers, producing a drawing of a grand façade. In the margins and corners of the rendering, there were little architectural details, carving and moulding examples. The home was in the neoclassical style, all symmetry and exact angles with beautiful little flourishes. Oh my, Kitty breathed. She did not care a jot for Sir Wright but she could not deny something aesthetically pleasing when she saw it. I'm glad it pleases you, Sir Wright said, stepping closer again. He was so near that Kitty could feel his breath on her ear, which made her shiver. She curbed the urge to flinch away, refusing to give him the satisfaction. He was all hooded eyes and coiled energy, like a snake determined to slither up to her. I'm not sure why you should care a whit for my opinion, Sir Wright. Kitty said acerbically. I'm not only a woman, but nearly a servant. Surely I do not warrant your consideration. Oh, but you do, he said, giving her another oily smile. Might I direct your attention to that particular parcel of land just there? No, a bit to your left. Yes, that one, he said with a nod as her fingers found the aforementioned space on the map. This, it is completely empty, Kitty said, her brow furrowing. It is, Sir Wright confirmed. Will there be nothing built here? It seems an odd oversight, Kitty continued, studying it. There might be, Sir Wright answered cryptically. You see, I own that particular patch of land. You do? Kitty asked, turning to look at him with brows raised. Why do you not build your house there? Because it is where the road that connects this new neighbourhood to London will be placed, and I've no desire to live on a busy turnpike, Sir Wright sniffed. His expression quickly changed, however, to one of such confident slyness that Kitty took an automatic half-step backward. Though it is but a humble piece of land, it is no less significant. Without it, this new neighbourhood will have no means of connecting to London proper. Kitty stared at Sir Wright for a moment then down to the map again. Then, then that means that this is the most important piece of land in all of England at this very moment, I wager. Sir Wright finished for her, leaning closer again. Which makes my happiness with this deal of the utmost importance too. Kitty shot a look at Lady Veronica, who was busy attempting to appear busy rearranging the tea service. Well, I am sure that Lady Veronica and his lordship will do everything to... Oh, they certainly will, Sir Wright said, his voice and posture curling around Kitty like the coils of a serpent. But the real question is, will you prove as tractable? No, Lady Veronica said at last. The true question is, how far does your loyalty to my, our, family extend, Catherine? She rose and came toward Kitty, holding her hands out in an uncharacteristically familiar gesture. This only unsettled Kitty more. Sir Wright would like to pay you the great compliment of asking for your hand, 
and, in exchange, he will approve the construction on that part of the land. Kitty simply stared for a moment, feeling the jaws of the trap she had wandered into closing about her. She had no expectation any more of being able to marry Seth, but she also had no desire in the least to marry Sir Wright of all people. And yet, Lady Veronica was right. What wouldn't Kitty do? Not for Lady Veronica, but for Seth. He had worked so hard, overcome so much, and to have him within sight of the legacy he deserved. And it all rested on her. Chapter 26 It seemed cruel, perverse almost, to think of attending a ball with the question of Sir Wright's proposal hanging over her, but Kitty found herself preparing for one all the same. The ballroom at the Cluet home was not modest by any stretch of the imagination, but Lady Veronica seemed in real distress that it may not be grand enough for the party she had planned. Kitty could see the distress on Seth's face at the mention of hiring public assembly rooms for the evening, so she had stepped in and pointed out that it was better to have an overcrowded ballroom than one that looked empty. So it was that the ballroom was thrown up, fires lit within the twin fireplaces at either end at all hours of the day to warm it in preparation. White dust sheets were pulled from the furniture, floors polished, the chandelier shined to diamond-like brilliance. Cook was exceedingly happy, for she had a whole retinue of underlings to bark orders at now. A housekeeper and a legion of footmen had been brought on board with all haste too, and Kitty found much of her duties no longer necessary. By rights, she ought to have been relieved, but the truth was that she was now suffering from an affliction of boredom. This left her with far too much idle time, time in which she endlessly contemplated what answer to give to Sir Wright. Lady Veronica had pressed her subtly and overtly as to what answer she might give. I do not simply want to be transactional goods, Kitty had protested. Catherine, all marriages are transactional, Lady Veronica sighed in return. Why else do you think we have marriage contracts? When Kitty had nothing to say to that, she had continued, The trouble is that you are only seeing it from one side of the mirror right now. I'd have thought that you'd have learned to turn a situation to your favour after all this time with me. So Kitty was sat before her dressing table staring at her reflection. She was wearing a gown, a new gown even, and had silk flowers and pearls in her hair. Her dress was of a changeable silk, pink and warm gold, with velvet trimming and sleeves. The bodice was cut close and pleated in a flattering manner, with the skirt falling elegantly away from Kitty's waist. It was thoroughly into January-December, having passed in a whirlwind of visits and paying calls to ensure that everyone in London still remembered the Cluet name. Kitty was aware that she ought to be dressing in a palette more suited to the season, but it was so long since she'd had a new gown that she figured she deserved one that she liked. She was also exceedingly aware that she was expected to give her answer tonight, for she had promised Sir Wright as much. In truth, she still was not completely decided, but she could not delay any longer. She had been able to cry off for as long as she could, citing the business of the holiday season and needing to call upon her parents. Sir Wright, too, had called upon her father, and Kitty shuddered to think of his sneers and ill-disguised jibes at their reduced home. At last Kitty knew that she could tarry no longer, and with a sigh began pulling on her champagne-coloured gloves, sliding them up her arms. It felt odd to be wearing dancing slippers again, a dark pink with little gold and diamond buckles on the toes, and she allowed herself a moment to become steady. As she left her room, something about the action of shutting the door felt final in a way she had not expected. Perhaps it was because her days in this house were numbered, one way or another. Everything felt precious to her again. All of the furnishings and places where Seth had spent most of his life were now a part of her too. Kitty walked slowly down the hallway, the noise from below tumbling chaotically up the stairs. The banister and railing along the upper gallery had been wrapped with ribbons and flowers, 
a shout of defiance against the grey winter outside. With one hand lightly trailing along the banister, her gloved fingertips occasionally running over the blossoms, Kitty made her way slowly down the stairs, the short train of her dress cascading after her. So preoccupied with her own thoughts was she that she did not notice at first that someone was awaiting her. Two someones, in fact. At first, her eyes were full of Seth, and Seth alone. His wide shoulders were visibly tense, his hands clasped tightly behind his back. He looked incongruous in his black evening jacket and crisp white waistcoat, but with his hair still too long to be fashionable. He'd tied it back into a short K. He seemed as if he had been at the point of pacing, but caught himself when he spotted Kitty. A smile broke across his face that warmed his dark eyes instantly. For just a moment, there was no one else but them in this moment, simply Kitty and Seth with nothing to weigh them down or pull them apart. Kitty had been told more than once that her smile was infectious, impossible to resist. Now she found herself on the receiving end of just such a smile. There was pure, unadulterated joy in Seth's face at seeing Kitty, and she was tempted to let go and fly down the stairs to him, to wrap each other up and simply refuse to let go. But she could not and the primary reason for her not doing so was standing just behind Seth. Sir Wright watched this display dispassionately, his nearly colourless eyes observing coolly as if it were of no more consequence than a scene in a theatrical. Kitty suspected that a large part of her attraction for him was that he was well aware of her true feelings for Seth. He did not seem perturbed that her cheeks had grown warm, nor that her eyes were surely sparkling at Seth. With an inner ruthlessness, Kitty tore her gaze from Seth, instead refocusing on Sir Wright. She did not further acknowledge the true object of her heart's desire beyond the dip of a lady's bow. My lord, she murmured, and then breezed right past him as if he were of no more consequence than an acquaintance on the street. Please, dear heart, forgive me, she continued inwardly. I do it all for you. I wish you could know that. Ah, uh, Miss Johnson, Sir Wright said, taking the hand that Kitty offered him proprietarily. He bowed over it, daring to brush a kiss across her gloved knuckles. Kitty did not miss the fact that his cold eyes flicked to Seth as he did so, but she did not give him the satisfaction of looking as if she cared, nor even noticed. Sir Wright, how kind of you to be waiting for me, she said instead, a smile with as much substance as a sugar sculpture plastered across her face. I wish to escort you into the ballroom. I assume you do not object, he replied smoothly. I suspect you do a great deal of presuming, sir, Kitty shot back, punctuating it with what she hoped was a teasing smile. All of her skills at flirtation seemed to wither in his presence, but she was determined to make an effort. Sir Wright straightened to his full height, looking down his long pointed nose at her. Perhaps, he allowed. He offered her his elbow, which she looked at for a moment before accepting. She could not stop herself from shooting a glance of her own to Seth, who watched with an inscrutable expression. Long, cold fingers covered Kitty's hand on Sir Wright's elbow, his left hand covering hers. She could feel them through the silk of her gloves, and she had to resist the urge to shiver. Tilting his head toward her ear, Sir Wright murmured, I shall also presume that many things will become clear tonight. Kitty did not know what to say to that, but felt a coil of stone-like dread in her stomach. She did not give him the satisfaction, humming non-committally in response. He seemed to take this as some sort of unitacit agreement, and smugly led her through the house. There was a veritable crush of people all filtering into the ballroom, stopping to pay their compliments to Lady Veronica. The house was festooned with candles and flowers at every available nook and cranny, which made for a warm, heady scent. There were more than a few curious looks directed to Kitty's way, and she noted the way that the crowd seemed to part before Sir Wright as if he were Moses at the Red Sea. They all knew that he had the ear of the Prince Regent, and he wore that fact as proudly as if it were a dignitary's sash. 
Kitty recognised some of the faces, some of the people that she had counted among her outer circle of friends. They viewed her with suspicion now from behind raised hands and fans, eyes slitted and lips whispering. This left little doubt in Kitty's mind that her second re-entry into society was going to be turbulent at the least. It would seem that we are attracting more than the usual amount of attention, Sir Wright commented blithely as they proceeded. They're probably trying to figure out why a man of your standing is out in polite society with a lady's companion on your arm, Kitty responded bluntly. To say nothing of the fact that my father's fool from Grace is very public knowledge now. Mm, he agreed, not contradicting her in the slightest. I have decided you are fashionable, however, so that will be rectified in short order. Because you decided, Kitty retorted. Do you doubt it? Sir Wright asked, deigning to look down at Kitty. Something almost like a smile was playing about his mouth. Kitty had a sneaking suspicion that Sir Wright could be goaded into nearly anything, if he perceived it as a challenge. Kitty only shrugged nonchalantly in response, which seemed to amuse and vex Sir Wright all at once. Inwardly, she grimly smirked. Perhaps Lady Veronica is right, and I might be able to turn a bad situation more to my favour. It was a sad consolation prize, but it was all that Kitty had left to her. Chapter 27 The ballroom was positively packed with people, though Kitty suspected that more than a few of them had arrived simply to ogle, checking if they might see any lingering traces of Cluette's temporary reduction in circumstances. There was clearly more than one guest turning vases over, checking for maker's marks, or trying to ascertain if the furniture was hired. You would never have guessed how nearly cucumbered they were just a few weeks ago, Sir Wright mused. Kitty shot him a look, which he caught. Do not mistake me, I am not as snobbish as many of the ton. No, I rather admire someone willing to scrabble their way up the slippery slope. Kitty bit her tongue and put as neutral an expression as she could on her face. For they were approaching Lady Veronica. Seth was nowhere in sight instead of standing next to his mother and receiving guests as he ought to be. This clearly was trying to her, but Kitty doubted any of the other guests would notice her clipped manner of speaking and the tension around her mouth. When it was their turn before her, her face seemed to relax fractionally. Sir Wright, Miss Johnson, how delightful it is to see you, she practically purred, and all the more delightful to see you in each other's company. It was kind of you to include us, Lady Cluett, Sir Wright responded. Kitty could feel a crease forming between her eyebrows from the familiar phrasing that he used, as if they were already attached. When their brief audience was concluded, Kitty made her way to the table laid with embossed dance cards, the cords to hold them on decorated with silk tassels. She picked one up and, as she was sliding it onto her wrist, she said, I do hope you are not intending on following me about like a dowdy old chaperone all night. Sir Wright turned a sly expression onto her. Why should I not? Because I have every intention of dancing with who I please tonight, Kitty said, adjusting her glove beneath the cord of the dance card. And it would be unseemly for us to be constantly in each other's company. You may claim your two dances now, but that is all that may be permitted. Is that an ironclad rule? Sir Wright asked, looming in her direction slightly. It is, as no formal attachment exists between us. Neither of us will be helped by unkind gossip, Kitty declared firmly. Before he could say anything else, Kitty made as if she had spotted friends across the ballroom and left him standing there quite alone. It was a risky thing to be unchaperoned in public, but she figured that, as a member of the household now, Lady Veronica was technically her guardian. Kitty was content to take a turn about the ballroom, seeing and being seen. She could hear the trail of whispers that followed in her wake, but she frankly did not even care anymore. What misery could the ton possibly inflict on her at this point? It was freeing, in a way. The musicians began to play in earnest, signalling that the dancing was about to commence. 
Kitty had made a full circuit by then and was standing just next to Lady Veronica. It was a relatively sheltered place, as no one would dare to gossip about her within earshot of the hostess. There was another young lady to Lady Veronica's left, one that Kitty did not recognise. She had strawberry blonde hair, neatly styled, and the sort of face that one was happy to see anywhere. She was pretty, not in the arresting, undeniable way that Kitty's best friend Eva was, but more in the sort of way that would guarantee she was the prettiest girl at any country fair. There was a freshness about her, as if she were not burdened by any of the secrets or hidden desires of the rest of them yet. And yet it was her eyes, somewhere between green and brown, that Kitty was truly struck by. There was a lively, snapping intelligence in them. They moved restlessly, taking in everything about her. It was these eyes that pinned Kitty in place, peering around the Viscountess. The strange girl clearly wondered who Kitty was and how she came to be at the Viscountess's side, for Kitty wore an identical expression of curiosity on her face. Their mutual curiosity was interrupted, however, by an unexpected arrival. Seth simply was there, standing before them. Lady Veronica looked visibly relieved. Oh, Seth, darling, I am so glad you're here. I thought we might nearly have to open the ball without you, she said through a strained smile. Have every intention of opening the ball, he replied, but his attention remained fixed on Kitty. She wished desperately that he would look anywhere else but at her, but wasn't sure if she could stand it if he did. May I present Miss Magdalena Alcott, Lady Veronica said a little louder, clearly trying to interrupt whatever was happening right before her. I'm sure that she would be thrilled to open the ball with you. She's kept her dance card quite empty just for that purpose. I should like to dance with Miss J... Miss Catherine, Seth replied. Well, perhaps she has already spoken for, Lady Veronica replied through clenched teeth as if Kitty were not standing right there and could overhear every word. She is not, Seth replied readily. Her card, too, is empty. Without breaking eye contact, he reached into his inner jacket pocket and withdrew a pencil. It was not a fancy one, like most gentlemen used, filigreed and gilded, but was plain lead. Wordlessly, he lifted the pencil, and Kitty found her wrist automatically rising so that he might pencil his name in, with deliberate, clear letters. At last, Seth broke Kitty's gaze, turning instead to stare at his mother with squared shoulders. It is the least that we owe her, he said firmly. We have asked much of her, and it is a trifle compared to what she deserves. Lady Veronica looked mutinous, as if she might argue the point. Seth's eyes moved from side to side, and Lady Veronica followed the movement, this was when she realised that there were any number of people standing about listening eagerly. There was clearly some sort of story at work here, one which would satisfy their curiosity and lust for gossip. It was owing to this that Lady Veronica's mouth snapped shut with a click of her teeth. With no further obstacles, Seth offered Kitty his hand. After only a moment's hesitation, Kitty found herself giving in laying her hand over his and following him willingly, eagerly even, out to the dance floor. A kind of hush fell over the crowd for a moment as they, along with a few other select couples, took their places. This was to be expected, as music was to begin shortly. What was not expected, however, was the quiet rushing sound of whispers that swelled through the crowd immediately after, swelling like a tide. There was little doubt in Kitty's mind that they were discussing her. Who was this one-time heiress, now a penniless lady's companion, and why did she attract the attentions of not one, but two rich and titled men? Kitty, Seth murmured, low and soft, so that only she could hear. Do not pay them any mind. For the first time in quite a while, Kitty felt a real smile bloom across her face. Seth still held her hands in preparation for the opening strains of the dance, and he squeezed gently, reassuringly. For the moment, Kitty put away her anxieties and dedication to playing her role, and allowed herself to be Kitty, not Catherine. 
not Miss Johnson, just Kitty. The music began, and all of Kitty's doubts melted within the first few notes. It had always been a bit of a difficulty to dance with Seth, not because she did not want to, she ardently did, but because while he was a good man and a good many other things, one could never have described Seth as a great dancer. There was a kind of galumphing awkwardness in his movements, which he was keenly aware of. Combined with his own natural bashfulness, it made him excessively discomforted with so many eyes on him, which was only exacerbated by his lack of grace. Kitty had first suspected that she loved him because he was willing to put himself through the ordeal of dancing in public, simply because she loved it so. This was not so anymore. He moved through the steps with a kind of careless ease, as if they were wholly unimportant. Gone was the tension, the hesitating steps and nervous clutching of hands. He was quite at peace with his body, his own solid frame and manner of moving. When he took Kitty's hands, it was with great care. He was no Josiah Galpan and he never would be, but Kitty was no less awed by his transformation. You look a bit astonished, Seth commented. Kitty grinned openly at him as they held hands, skipping sideways together. I am a bit astonished, she said as she passed under his arm, stepping nimbly around him. Of all the things I thought you might learn in the Canadian wilderness, the finer points of dance were certainly not one of them. Seth rumbled a laugh, which only made Kitty's smile widen. You're right, though. I did learn a lot of things out there. Such as? How to fell a tree, he listed. How to learn. How to tell if an axe is well balanced. How to keep food safe from bears. He paused, his eyes going distant. I learned about silence. How to be completely still and just listen to the world. How to read the stars. The smell that trees make just before a storm comes in. Kitty listened, enraptured. She had never heard him string together so many words in a row. My lord, have you been hiding a poet's heart all this time? She breathed, gently teasing him. Seth chuckled and blushed again. No, he said, shaking his head a little. They danced in silence for a moment. I never got the chance to ask you what it was like out there, Kitty said at length. It was... Seth paused both to apparently gather his thoughts, and, because they were separated, pairs of dancers passing beneath their joined and raised arms. It was just so much more than I had ever thought existed. It was lonely, but familiar, no, comforting. I was content there. Well, he amended, almost content. I did not expect to find so much joy and satisfaction in working the land. I know what you mean, Kitty thought, thinking back to her own time with the Viscountess and the strange tasks that it had been necessary for her to undertake. I'm not sure that I could ever go back to just being a lady of leisure now. Seth's eyes glanced to the far end of the ballroom, where Sir Wright stood next to his mother. Kitty followed his gaze and felt her cheeks grow warm again, this time from shame. Are you certain that is not the future you want? he asked quietly. A wave of sadness swept over Kitty, causing un unexpected tears to sting her eyes. Very few of us get what we truly want in this life, she said, fixing her eyes wide so that the tears would not fall. There was nothing for Seth to say to that. His hands took on a heaviness then, as if her words had weighed him down. There was no more joy in his dancing, no light spark between them. It was simply one more tragedy that Kitty had to endure. The song ended, and Kitty and Seth both remained still. Hands still linked for a moment, both loath to let go. Kitty stared up at Seth, her eyes swimming with unshed tears, and Seth searched her face for understanding. I believe your mother has selected a bride for you, Kitty said quietly, her voice breaking a little on, bride. Gamely, she swallowed back the rest of her emotions and soldiered on. You should try to love her. She... she may be a good helpmeet, and her face is comely. 
What more can any of us expect? And with that, she released Seth's hands, turning away and dabbing at the rims of her eyes delicately with a single gloved finger. She did not even care that the tears would ruin the fine silk, which she figured was a true measure of the depths of her misery. Chapter 28 Lady Veronica could not ever be a woman described as being taken with superstitions. She did not believe in portents, signs, or anything else of the like. When someone claimed to have felt something in their waters, she was likely to respond with an eye roll and a sneer. She reasoned that if she were to ever experience such a thing, surely it would have happened when Seth, here dear boy, was far away. Surely she would have felt that he had made it safely to foreign shores instead of spending weeks in suspense. Surely. Strangely enough, she had been having one of those odd, premonitory feelings for the past several weeks. She could not rightly put her finger on it, but something was amiss. There was no real evidence, nothing that she could point to and say, Aha! There is the thing! It was just a vague nagging at the back of her mind that refused to settle. With all of the preparations that had to be completed before the ball, she'd had even less time than usual to contemplate what all of this meant. It did not help that Seth was moping about the house, and Catherine seemed more distractible than usual lately. She was inclined to give the latter a bit more leniency, as much was riding upon her decision, which was pure foolishness. What other possible offers could that girl think that she would possibly receive these days? It was not until she was standing in the ballroom, still privately fuming that Seth had chosen Catherine, Catherine, of all people to open the ball with, that the pieces had begun to come together. It was something in the way in which Seth escorted her lady's companion out onto the floor, the natural way in which his head tilted toward hers that had sharpened the vague sense of alarm into sharp focus. They danced together with a familiarity that was upsetting, for Lady Veronica could not begin to imagine where and when they would have done so before this night. It was also upsetting because they looked so happy together. A kind of light seemed to shine from both of them when they smiled at each other. Their faces were suffused with a glad, abiding affection that made anyone who observed it glad that they had. And Lady Veronica positively hated it. Something shifted when they were dancing, and the smile was melted away. What was left in their place was something desperate and longing, and that unsettled Lady Veronica more. A dalliance, an inappropriate fondness, these were all things that she could duly manage and would find their natural end. Unresolved desires, forbidden love, these things were more durable and harder to squash. Catherine, doing all of them a mercy, had fled the dance floor and possibly the ballroom altogether. Seth was left alone, staring after her. He clenched his fists and turned back toward his mother with a mutinous expression. Whatever had passed between them, he clearly blamed her for. Lady Veronica turned toward Miss Alcor as if they were in discussion which would blunt much of Seth's ire. It was unthinkable that he would interrupt two ladies simply to argue. In what was quickly becoming a trend that she positively despised, Seth proved Lady Veronica wrong yet again. Mother, he said, standing before her tautly, I must speak with you immediately regarding... Oh, surely it can wait, dear boy. Lady Veronica interrupted all smiles. She slid her hands around Seth's right arm, which he automatically crooked. There is someone I wish to introduce you to, she continued, guiding him forward by the elbow. Seth, may I present Miss Magdalena Alcott? Miss Alcott, my son, the Viscount Cluet, she announced proudly. The two young people simply stared at one another, Seth blankly, Miss Alcott curiously, assessing. There was a decided lull in the conversation, which caused Lady Veronica to grind her teeth together. Eschewing subtlety, she nudged Seth forward a half-step. A pleasure, Miss Alcott, he said at last, but carelessly, as if he paid the words no mind. Your lordship, Miss Alcott replied, dropping a curtsy. Miss Alcott was just saying what a dash you cut on the dance floor, 
Lady Veronica supplied, causing both of the young people to look at her blankly. What is this century when the old must engage for flirtation on behalf of the young? It is an absurdity, she groused inward, but her face never lost its rigid smile. You are fond of dancing, Miss Alcott? Seth followed up at last after a subtle pinch on the arm from Lady Veronica. In a manner of speaking, I suppose? There is a kind of mathematical purity to it. It's all numbers and angles, no? Miss Alcott said, tilting her head a little. You are a scholar, then? Seth asked, and Lady Veronica very nearly crumbled in despair. To suggest such a thing of a lady, in a ballroom of all things, it was too much. As much as a lady might be permitted, I suppose, Miss Alcott replied easily, looking completely untroubled by the question. I find facts and figures easier to understand than people most of the time. Lady Veronica glanced up to Seth and found that though his jaw was still showing his irritation through a certain tension, his expression had softened a little into something approaching intrigue. This gave her hope, and she reached forward, snaking her arm through Miss Alcott's. Well, that settles it then, she said, pivoting both young people toward the dance floor. I am sure that Seth would like nothing more than to put you at ease, Miss Alcott, as any good host would be keen to. Seth, his face mutinous, dug in his heels a little. I am not here to impose a dance upon Miss Alcott, he protested. Do not worry, my lord, Miss Alcott said, leaning, so around Lady Veronica so that she might address Seth directly. I have no intention of coercing you, or any gentleman, into a dance he does not wish. I should scarcely suggest such a thing. However, she continued, it seems likely to me that your mother has some romantic scheme in mind for the two of us, and it might give us respite if we were to simply submit. The price of one dance is small for an evening of peace, no? Seth and Lady Veronica both turned to stare at Miss Alcott, who regarded them dispassionately. To her great relief, Lady Veronica could feel Seth begin to laugh before she heard it. I suppose it is at that, he allowed. Miss Alcott, would you permit me a dance? I would, she answered. Relieved, Lady Veronica backed away, releasing her iron grip on Seth at last. The two young people stood side by side, stiff and formal, with no hint of warmth between them. They were a handsome pair, though they refused to look at one another again. It was stilted and awkward between them, with no further conversation. There, that is a much better arraignment, Lady Veronica attempted to convince herself, and it was if she ignored the stony look on her son's face. As Seth took his place in the line of dancers, directly across from Miss Alcott, his mind was most decidedly not on the dancing at hand. It was also most definitely not occupied with thoughts of Miss Alcott. He supposed that she must be a charming girl, with material assets of some sort for his mother to be pushing him towards her so insistently. But Seth had no real interest. Unfortunately for him, whenever he sat at the card table, he had no talent for keeping his feelings from his face. Anyone who saw him might guess his true sentiments at any given moment. This proved true for Miss Alcott who Seth had clearly forgotten was of an especially discerning mind. "'You may put your mind at ease where I am concerned, my lord,' she said abruptly as they circled one another in the opening steps of the dance. "'This was not an elaborate ruse to win a dance for myself.' "'Didn't think that,' Seth answered immediately. "'Then I am correct in thinking that it is something else that troubles you,' Miss Alcott stated. Seth did not answer for he had no wish to burden this girl, a stranger, really, with his troubles. As they danced, Seth could scarcely bring himself to look at her. Instead, his head was on a constant pivot like an owl's. She is not here, Miss Alcott murmured suddenly. When Seth turned to face her, surprised, she continued, that woman you were dancing with earlier, she is not in the ballroom. You were watching her. Yes, she replied simply, ducking under Seth's arm and taking his left hand. I observed the two of you together. Am I correct in thinking that there is some sort of feeling between you? Seth paused for a moment, then plunged headlong into honesty. 
It would do neither of them any favours to be under any illusions. Yes, though I do not know to what extent, he admitted. A great deal, I should think, Miss Alcott said breezily as they promenaded. You seem very well suited. She's quite beautiful, she added with no malices. She is, Seth agreed, feeling awkward. He was not a young buck of society, but even he knew that it was poor form to discuss a woman's beauty while dancing with another woman. I suspect that much like myself, she is a piece of a rather complicated transaction that seems to revolve around you, Miss Alcott continued nonplussed. How do you mean? Seth asked, his eyes narrowing. I am an untitled daughter of a lawyer who has performed some service for Sir Wright, which has left him in my father's debt, she explained. Your estate, or possibly your mother directly, is in Sir Wright's debt in some capacity or another. I do not wholly follow, Seth admitted, taking Miss Alcott's hands and raising them so that the other couples might pass under them. I, myself, don't either, not yet, Miss Alcott agreed. I believe that I am missing some relevant information. However, she said, intertwining her arm with Seth's, so that they might take their turn passing under the other's hands. There is something odd in all of it. Odd? Why should your mother be pleased to see her son, a most eligible young man with title and position, married to the daughter of a solicitor? Miss Alka asked simply. It does not seem likely. The song ended, and Seth stood for a moment, staring at Miss Alcott. She stared back at him, glancing away once, and then stepping forward. She spoke quietly under the cover of the polite applause for the dancers and musicians alike. Come and stand with me by the windows and have a glass of lemonade. It is draughty there, and everyone is avoiding that spot. We shan't be overheard there. And with that, she curtsied again and made her way over to the place indicated. Seth stared after her, hesitating. He did not know this strange girl, and he was unsure if he should trust her. For all of her talk of honesty and frank assessment of her own position, there was still a chance that she was luring him into some kind of romantic plot. He did not trust himself to make this decision. What would Kitty make of her, his mind asked. She would like her pert way of speaking and the way she has fixed her hair, there is nothing else she would need to know, his heart answered. That seemed as good of a guarantee as any. Taking a deep breath, Seth steeled himself for whatever was to come. Miss Alcott awaited him. Seth suspected that, whatever she would say next, it would decide much for him. Chapter 29 Though Seth was full of a general anxiety about whatever it was that Miss Alcott wished to say to him, he was soon preoccupied by a much more immediate anxiety. Burying two glass cups of lemonade through an overcrowded ballroom, without spilling any on anyone else or his formal white gloves. No one could ever have described Seth as a man of grace, so this was a Herculean effort as far as he was concerned. He was so focused on the task at hand that he at first did not realise that he had made it to where Miss Alcott awaited him. She accepted her lemonade without comment or smile, clearly not wishing to encourage onlookers to make speculations. They stood in relative silence for a moment, the noise of the ballroom washing over them, all about conversations, laughter, music, the sound of feet on the dance floor, the rustle of silk gowns joined into a chaotic rush like water over a fall. It made Seth feel jumpy, like a country horse unused to the traffic and noise of London. You do not care for all of this, do you? Miss Alcott asked, nodding in the general direction of the ball. Please, she said when Seth bobbled his head around, waffling without really answering. Let us pay each other the compliment of honesty. I shall begin. Uh, I have very little desire to marry you. There. Taken aback, Seth rocked back on his heels a little. He had never had a young lady state her position so clearly, particularly such a cool, dispassionate rejection. He blinked at her for a moment. Very little? Why very little, if I may ask? He inquired. She shrugged, giving a blasé wave of her gloved hand. 
You seem an amiable enough chap, particularly for a Viscount. I do not expect I should be unhappy with you, but I also do not expect I should be happy with you, either. Seth nodded, understanding her completely. Then why are you... he asked, gesturing vaguely toward her and the ballroom generally. She considered for a moment. Curiosity, for one thing. I wish to know you before dismissing any proposal outright. For another, you are not the only person facing parental pressure to marry well, she said, sipping her lemonade coolly. You are the only son of this house, yes? Seth nodded and she continued. Well, I am my father's oldest daughter with five younger brothers, and he has grand plans for them. It is imperative that I not only marry well, but brilliantly as far as he is concerned so that I might drag them with me up the social ladder. And none have proven to be up to the mark? Seth asked. A wry smile lifted one corner of Miss Alcott's mouth, the first sign of humour that Seth had seen all night from her. On the contrary, a number of beneficial introductions have been arranged for me ever since I made my debut into society. She paused, swirling her lemonade, making the little slice of candied lemon on the top bob about like a ship at sea. It's more that no man wants a blue stocking for a wife, particularly one who has no interest in playing the part of society hostess. Seth allowed this information to sink in. It was becoming all the more suspicious that his mother would push him to marry Miss Alcott. Lady Veronica had made it clear that she wanted Seth to restore the Cluett family, a name to its former standing. He would need an accomplished hostess to have any hope of doing this. Of course, it was entirely possible that Lady Veronica wanted Seth to marry someone so disinterested as Miss Alcott so that she could simply keep her role as Lady of the House. How does Sir Wright fit into all of this? Seth asked suddenly. I'm not entirely sure yet, Miss Alcott admitted, gazing across the ballroom. Here is what we know. My father, ever at Sir Wright's service, desires an advantageous marriage for me, and your mother leaps at the chance in a most uncharacteristic manner. Sir Wright, to whom your family is connected in some way, suddenly has the beautiful and young but penniless lady's companion on his arm. It is all a little too much of a coincidence for my taste. She took another sip of lemonade, then lifted out the little slice of candied lemon without a care for her gloves and bit into it, peel and all. I cannot abide these machinations. A bunch of sour-faced schemers, the lot of them, she said, her eyes staring coldly across the ballroom. Seth followed the direction of her gaze and found that Lady Veronica Sir Wright and another gentleman, who Seth could only assume was Mr Alcott, were all standing together. They all took great pains to not touch one another, looking stiffly posed, smiles stretching their faces grotesquely that did not reach their eyes. A den of vipers, he murmured. They underestimate us, I think. Miss Alcott silently clinked her glass against Seth's in agreement. It would be easy for one to assume that Kitty had grown accustomed to being overlooked, given her position for the past year. It was true that she had taken on something of a wallflower status at most social events, but it had been born of necessity. Lady Veronica needed her to glean information from places that a Viscountess could not go. Kitty had also learned that it would not be wise to outshine Lady Veronica. This did not mean, however, that Kitty enjoyed this state. She was naturally a social, effervescent creature who enjoyed the company of others. She had hoped, perhaps naively, that with this ball she might be able to recover some of her old spark, maybe to even re-enter society in some capacity. After she had fled the dance floor, hiding as much from Seth as from her own feelings, she realised that it had been disturbingly easy for her to do so. No one came looking for her. No one came running after her. She had half hoped that Seth might do precisely that that he would whisk her away to Scotland that very night. But no, she was left to nurse a bruised heart alone, hidden in a little alcove where no one could see her fighting to hold back tears. When she had gathered herself up 
reasoning that she was missing a ball, a ball that she did not have to attend as a servant or a lady's companion or anything else demeaning. She was determined to enjoy herself even a little. Moping had accomplished very little for anyone in life, herself included. Thus, with a proud toss of her head and armed with a ready smile, she felt herself prepared for anything. She was not, in fact, prepared for anything. She was decidedly unprepared to see, while surveying the ballroom, Seth and the young lady that had been in his mother's company locked in conversation in a discreet corner. She could not stop watching them, riveted to the scene as if she were Lot's wife. Their heads were close, clearly speaking lowly to each other. Whatever they said, they sealed with a chummy clink of their glasses. The world tilted oddly for a moment, as if reality was spinning away from Kitty. She knew that she was staring openly, but she could not stop. The knowledge that Seth would begin to court someone else was purely hypothetical up until that point. The reality was far harsher and more terrible than Kitty had ever considered. She was shocked back to herself by a cold hand locking about her wrist. Dumbly, she looked down, noting the oddly long fingers that wrapped about her, the cold of them seeping through the thin silk of her glove. Her eyes followed the fingers up, up, up the long arm, and slowly her vision coalesced on the sharp and wan features of Sir Wright. Miss Johnson, he said, his eyes searching her face. There you are. Shall we return to the ballroom? I believe you have space upon your dance card still. Kitty stared at him for a moment, and then determination made her jaw clench firmly. No, she answered definitively. We shall not. When Sir Wright's face showed annoyance, she raised her free hand. I believe that we need to come to an understanding. Perhaps we might adjourn to the library. She did not wait for him to answer, merely turned about and assumed he would follow. Her arm slid from his grasp, but there was no doubt in her mind that he was behind her. She could feel him looming, like being stalked by some primordial reptile. Quickly, Kitty wove her way through the house, slipping past a few wandering guests here and there, who were either too engaged with their own pursuits or too drunk to notice her. The entire veneer seemed to have faded from the party. The flowers were beginning to wilt in their vases. Half-spilled drinks left little puddles everywhere, making unsuspecting fingers sticky. The air, so warm and welcome against the cold of winter outdoors, was stifling and thick with bad decisions and too much noise. It was not a gilded affair of the rich and connected of London. It was simply another bored house for all the transactions that were happening within. Kitty tried to shake off her bitterness. It would not do to enter into negotiations with someone as wily as Sir Wright with a clouded head. She could not afford to be sentimental, not any more. This was the final lesson that Lady Veronica imparted upon her. Once they had attained the library, Kitty, with surprisingly little feeling, instructed Sir Wright to close the door. Aren't you worried for your reputation? He asked with a hint of a sneer. I think we are both long past caring about that, Sir Wright, Kitty replied dispassionately, and I do not wish to be interrupted. Sir Wright bowed slightly, the gesture a little ironic somehow, but complied. When he turned back around, Kitty faced him unflinchingly, assessing him as openly and shrewdly as he had done to her at their every meeting. I promised that I would give my answer to your proposal tonight, and I have every intention of doing so, she began, folding her arms over herself. But first, I would like the answers to some questions. As ever, Miss Johnson, I am at your service, Sir Wright replied smoothly with another little bow. Kitty gave him an arch look that told him exactly what she thought of that statement, which only made him laugh. Why is it that you are proposing to me at all? I come with neither land nor dowry and very little connections to speak of, Kitty asked bluntly. Her honesty seemed to surprise him, but he tilted his head a little, intrigued. I find that I have all of those things that you speak of, he said, but I'm lacking someone to share it with. 
I require a beautiful young wife who will be an ornament at all of my parties. More importantly, I need someone hard and sharp who will not be swallowed whole by my world. I move in the highest of circles, and they will cut anyone to ribbons who does not cut them first. And you think this is me? I think you could be a worthy companion, yes, with the right tutelage. You are still burdened by sentimentality, Sir Wright said, folding his hands behind his back and stepping closer until he was less than an arm's length from her. Kitty looked away, taking in the dusty books on the shelves. It had been months since anyone had set foot in here, with the intention of dusting, and the stale smell of book mould hung in the air. She turned back to Sir Wright, meeting his pale eyes unflinchingly. I want security for my parents, Kitty said suddenly, clearly taking him off guard. Do you indeed? he asked, smiling but with an icy irritation just below the surface. I am not a fool. I know that I have very little to bargain with. But if you truly wish me to be your wife, then I shall need assurances for my parents, Kitty continued, lifting her chin. I should think that a small price to pay for my acceptance. And what of the Viscount's land, hmm? Sir Wright said, pulling back a little. That too, Kitty said, glancing away for the first time. Sir Wright did not answer immediately. The sounds of a raucous party made their way through the walls of the library, muffled by the shelves of books. Somewhere in the house, a glass broke, followed by shrieks of laughter. I wonder, he said, his voice low and dark. If you were pressed, would you choose the land for the young Viscount, or your parents' rescue from destitution? Kitty met his eyes, hardening her own gaze. Slowly, she leaned forward until she was nearly nose to nose with Sir Wright. Speaking clearly, enunciating crisply, she pronounced, Isn't it a fortunate thing that I do not have to make that choice? Sir Wright stared at her for a moment, anger and admiration at war on his face. Removed, Kitty idly figured that chances were equally good that he might kiss or strangle her. Finally, he straightened, and Kitty slowly exhaled a breath through her nose that she did not know she had been holding. This is how it will be, her mind whispered. This is your life with him. It will be a battle of wills, a constant struggle between you two. This will not be a partnership. You will become hard and formidable, and know nothing of softness ever again. It's a small price to pay, her heart answered. Who am I in all of this? Just one silly romantic girl. Very well, Sir Wright said, looking down his sharp nose at Kitty. I agree to your terms. Then I accept, Kitty said without hesitation. She did not wait to see if he would attempt to follow up this pronunciation with a token of affection. The chances of that seemed improbably small, and swept past him, leaving him alone in a dark, dusty library. With slow, measured steps, Kitty ascended the stairs to her rooms. It was folly to believe that she had come down those same steps only hours before, floating on a cloud of hope and possibility. An apt metaphor, she murmured to herself as she climbed. Those feelings had only been as substantial as a wisp of cloud in a sad night sky, with nothing to support them. Now, she left the golden light and sound of the party below, every step as long as a mile for all the distance it put between herself and Seth. Ahead, the dark, unlit hallway loomed. Chapter 30 It was with a pounding head that Seth snapped to wakefulness. Through the crack in the dark blue velvet drapes in his room, sunlight filtered in, hitting him directly in the face and making him wince. Blindly, he lifted one large hand, trying to block the light in the otherwise blissfully dark room. Groggily, he came more fully awake, realising that he had slept in his shirt and breeches, having kicked off his shoes somewhere near the door, and wrestled his jacket off and flung it to parts unknown. He lay diagonally across his bed, with his feet stuffed under a pile of pillows, and his head down at the foot of the bed. With a groan, he rubbed at his head, he had not partaken of anything stronger than lemonade, but 
The combination of the noise and crowd of the party had all conspired to make him feel as if he'd swum in a barrel of whiskey. All in all, he was groggy, grumpy, and generally in a foul humour. This was compounded when his bedroom door opened, and a strange man was standing there, holding a tray. The man was dressed well and was doing his level best to ignore the generally dishevelled state of Seth. Good morning, my lord, the man said, expertly balancing the tray and depositing it on the nightstand. Without comment, or acting as if it were in any way strange, he bent and began quickly picking up the discarded clothing. Seth sat up slowly, one hand still pressed to his head. Who... A thousand pardons, my lord, the man said, pausing and bowing in Seth's direction. I'm Turnbull, your lordship's valet. My valet, Seth repeated, feeling as if he had missed an entire day somehow. I did not. No, my lord, it was her ladyship who hired me, the valet finished, having whisked all the offending clothing away and placed the shoes in Seth's dressing room. She wanted to make sure that your transition to acting Viscount was as smooth as possible. I... That is very well and good, but I... Seth paused, the smell from the tray hitting his nose. Coffee, fragrant and rich, steaming hot. He shifted closer to it, sniffing appreciatively, despite himself. Before he could reach for it, the valet was there, handing him a warm cup that Seth gratefully wrapped his fingers around. I would suggest a hearty breakfast today, my lord, the valet said, busying himself in Seth's closets, his voice muffled among the shirts and jackets. Your diary appears to be rather full. It does? With what? Seth asked, wondering if he had woken up in the wrong house entirely. Well, things are rather abuzz this morning generally, with new staff being taken on, and others departing, Turnbull said, his well-pomaded head reappearing from the dressing room, bearing a dark red jacket and breeches. This jacket will suit your lordship quite well, and I imagine the lady will appreciate it. Lady? Seth asked, still staring. What lady? He sipped the coffee again, something prickling at the back of his mind. Wait, who is leaving the household? Why? Miss Catherine is preparing to depart this very moment, Turnbull said, putting the jacket on a stand so that he might brush it. Miss Catherine? Miss Catherine is leaving? Seth asked carefully the world slowing to a crawl around him. From out in the hall there was indeed the muffled sound of feet going back and forth. Oh, yes, my lord, Turnbull replied nonchalantly, pausing in his brushing for a moment with an inscrutable expression on his face. It's not every day that a lady's companion makes such a good match. Why, I imagine that she has her ladyship to thank for Seth never heard what it was that Turnbull believed Miss Catherine, Kitty, had to thank Lady Veronica for, because he was up in a trice, dropping his cup of coffee in his haste. The poor valet let out a sound of alarm, but Seth was too preoccupied to care about the coffee staining his rug. In a whirlwind of flailing arms and legs, he propelled himself toward the door, grasping furtively at the latch. Oh, but my lord, you are not properly dressed, Turnbull cried, clearly distressed, for the Viscount to be seen in any state of dishevelment was a reflection on his valet, and Turnbull was most assuredly aware of this. Seth did not have time to worry about his valet's finer feelings, however, and he proceeded to yank the door open so suddenly that it caused a poor maid in the hall to squeak and drop a small packing case. Shoes spilled out, tumbling across the floor, in a calamity of silk and leather. Your lordship, the maid gasped. Please forgive me, I did not see you there, and eep! She had caught sight of Seth in all of his bare-ankled, cravatless glory. It was too much for the young maid, who blushed furiously and looked down at the cluttered floor, refusing to look up again. These are Kip Miss Catherine's things? Seth asked. The maid nodded, only the tip of her nose and her patek cheeks visible from beneath her ruffled cotton cap. Yes, my lord, it was her wish to depart directly. I doubt that very much, 
Seth muttered darkly to himself. With an awkward hop and stretch of his legs, he was clear of the pile of shoes and resumed his march down the hall. The door to Kitty's rooms was standing quite open, and Lady Veronica's maid was helping to carefully fold clothing and coil ribbons into a trunk. Is something the matter, my lord? O'Toole said, looking up with alarm at Seth. Upon reflection, he was certain that he looked like a madman, scarcely dressed, hair loose, one hand clutching the doorframe so hard it creaked a little in protest. Where is Miss Catherine? he demanded, his eyes searching the room wildly. She has already gone downstairs, my lord, O'Toole answered warily, scanning him from top to bottom. The carriage awaits her. With an irritated grunt, Seth pushed off from the doorway and was striding down the hall in a manner that could best be described as harried. He did not pause at the maid who was still picking up shoes, merely springing over the mess, which caused the maid to squeak in distress yet again. Though the hour was early, there was already a veritable legion of servants at work around the house, quietly removing all evidence of the ball last night. They worked in teams, some collecting hundreds of scattered glasses, while another balanced a tray, others removing the wilted flowers and used up candles. All over, melted wax frozen into great drips that would never fall, hung from every surface and candlestick. Therefore, Seth's haste was greatly curtailed by the necessity of dodging all of this work to erase the disorder of the night before. Darting from room to room, he would poke his head in only long enough to ascertain that Kitty was not within, then move on to the next. He was at the point of despairing of the enterprise entirely when a door behind him opened, the sound drawing him up short. Slowly he turned back around, his heart thudding around in his ribs like a bird trying to get loose. It was Kitty, emerging from the servants' area downstairs. She had not spotted Seth yet, concentrating on closing the door as softly as possible so as not to disturb anyone. Clearly, she was completely ignorant of the chaos that had transpired upstairs. She was already dressed for travel, a long dark grey pelisse and an equally gloomy bonnet on her head. With gloved hands, she reached up and pressed the backs of her fingers to her eyes for a moment, as if willing tears not to fall. Suddenly, her head whipped round, catching Seth watching her. He was inclined to blush as if he had intruded on a private moment. My lord? She asked, a quizzical look on her face. What are you doing? I... you are... leaving, he said, feeling foolish for stating such a patently obvious fact. Kitty huffed out a watery laugh. That is what I am doing, my lord, she replied, stepping a little closer. Why? he asked simply, plaintively. Because I cannot stay, she answered equally simply. A sad wistfulness passed over her features. We both have a role to play, just, just not the one that we hoped for. At least, I hoped for it. And, truthfully, I have intruded on your life long enough. Want you to stay, Seth managed at last, daring to shift closer to her, so close that he might easily have reached out and touched her. Oh, Seth, she sighed, her shoulders falling a little. What we want is not what we need was all that she replied. There was so much in that space between them that they may as well have been on different continents, an ocean separating them again. Her eyes, still wet with sentiment, roved all over his face, as if trying desperately to memorise it. She nodded, as if to herself, and then stepped back once, twice. She turned her back to him, squared her shoulders a little, and with a slow regality began to walk away down the hall to the front door. Dumbly, Seth watched her go, wishing that she would stop, but not knowing how to make her stay. For an instant, she paused, and he thought that perhaps she had heard his silent wish. She turned part way back around, just enough so that he could catch sight of her face past the wings of her bonnet. There was a familiar expression on it, one of sly mischief and good humour. Thank you for dressing up for the occasion of seeing me off, she said with a last glance down to Seth's bare feet significantly. An uncontrollable bark of laughter escaped Seth before he could stifle the impulse. 
Kitty, looking satisfied, turned back around, walking toward a future that neither of them wanted. A strange feeling came over Seth. It was the same feeling that he had experienced standing on the deck of a ship, watching the English coastline vanish into the distance behind him. It was the same feeling as he had felt when that same ship had deposited him on a foreign shore and then pulled away slowly, vanishing into the grey fog until it may as well have never existed. It was not simply isolation or loneliness or even homesickness. Not entirely. It was as if the very concept of home had never existed. This time, there was no task for him to throw himself into, no forest to cut back or wagons to push up a hill. The stark new reality was inescapable and it settled into a cold stone in his stomach. The front door opened and closed a wave of cold air rushing along the floor and curling around his ankles. The sensation made him shiver, breaking his immobility. With a face like thunder, all of his ire at the situation seemed to coalesce onto one person, the only person who could possibly bear the blame for any of this. Seth's bare feet sounded comically unintimidating as he ran across the bare wooden floors, the rug still rolled up from the party. With one hand, he caught the bottom post of the banister on the main stairs, using it to anchor himself as he swung up onto the stairway. It creaked from the weight and force, the flowers and ribbons still wrapped around it quaking a little. He didn't care. He had his destination in mind. And that was all. He paid no heed to the pair of footmen, precariously balancing a trunk between them down the stairs, or their pained expressions as he barreled right past them. Turnbull, from somewhere down the hall in the direction of Seth's room, made another distressed sound, which Seth also roundly ignored. There was no deterring him until he reached his mother's room. He did not even bother knocking, simply burst through, breathing fiercely through his nose. His anger was only stoked by the incongruously calm manner in which his mother greeted him. And a very good morning to you too, she said, sat up in her bed among about a dozen pillows of various shapes and sizes. A shawl was draped around her shoulders, a breakfast tray over her lap. Delicate porcelain and crystal dishes adorned it, full of tea, sugar, jellies, a pair of boiled eggs and a selection of little buns. Lady Veronica was the picture of dignified, feminine elegance. She did not react to Seth's sudden entrance beyond this mundane greeting. Mother, he replied somehow making that single word sound like an accusation. I am glad to see you have risen early, she commented blithely, completely ignoring his distress. She lifted a letter, reading it as she raised a steaming teacup to her lips. I believe our ball was a success, though you might have been more attentive to your guests. They weren't my guests, he retorted. I couldn't care a jot for the whole lot of them. Really, Seth? Lady Veronica sighed. Lord Byron might be able to get away with his whole disaffected noble routine, but it can be quite tiresome to... Kitty has gone, Seth interrupted, watching her face closely. Who? Miss Catherine, Seth ground out. You know bloody well who I mean. Has she? Good then. I hope the new housekeeper settled whatever was owing on her. Lady Veronica said between sips of tea. Why has she gone? Seth demanded, taking a step closer. Because it was time for her to do so, silly boy. Lady Veronica said slowly, as if it were the most obvious thing in the world. Because you decided. Seth countered. Lady Veronica looked up from her letter, sighed, and made a great show of setting it aside. If you would like to know the truth, then yes. I did decide, she said, staring levelly at Seth. But I was not alone in this decision. What possible complaint could you have about her? She is the reason this house kept running during those lean months, Seth asked incredulously. He took another step forward, his voice rising in anger. You treated her as a servant when you had no right to do so. She came to you to be a companion, not a maid of all work. I'm aware of that, Lady Veronica replied, lifting her letter again. 
and she was compensated generously for her efforts. Compensated, Seth repeated flatly. That is not what I meant. Frankly, I do not know what you mean most of the time since you returned, Seth, Lady Veronica shot back, her own voice rising a little. From the foot of her bed, a ball of fluff stood up, turning beady, black eyes on Seth and favouring him with a most uninspiring growl of displeasure. Your predilection for chopping wood and sleeping on floors could be overlooked, but I could not excuse your over-familiarity with my companion. It was unseemly. You made a spectacle of yourself with her. You should be grateful that Miss Alcor is the understanding sort. I don't care what sort she is, Seth retorted, for I am not going to be marrying her. Aren't you? Lady Veronica asked bemusedly, which only flamed Seth's temper more. And who might you be marrying instead? Miss Catherine. If she will have me, I'd marry her this afternoon. Seth answered without hesitation. I doubt that very much, seeing as she is already betrothed. Lady Veronica fixed him with another coolly detached stare. You lie, Seth said, his nostrils flaring. It was all arranged last night, Lady Veronica continued, lifting a little spoon and tapping one of her eggs to crack the shell. She had her dance with you and then accepted Sir Wright that very hour. She wouldn't, Seth protested again, a little weaker this time. Of course she would, Lady Veronica replied, lifting the salt dish and sprinkling a little on her egg. Whatever you may think of her, Miss Catherine was clever and mercenary behind that pretty face. She did what was best for everyone. I shouldn't be surprised if she didn't use your dance together to her own advantage, she continued. What better way to inflame a little jealousy among a suitor than to dance with a handsome young nobleman? Seth's hands clenched into fists, his nails digging into his palms. He did not know how to respond, not because he believed her, but because he didn't think he could speak without saying something truly egregious in that moment. Taking his silence for acceptance, Lady Veronica favoured him with a patronising smile. Miss Catherine is a thoroughly sensible girl. She believed, and I agreed, that it was only appropriate that she be married from her father's house, and not from this one. Now, Lady Veronica said, changing tack as easily, as if she was selecting a pair of gloves, let us focus on your own courtship. Mother, Seth asked, lifting the still disgruntled Quincy with one hand and settling on the foot of his mother's bed. Why are you so keen on Miss Alcott? I have no desire to marry her, and I believe she feels the same. Lady Veronica's face grew pinched, and she glanced away, then back at Seth with a resolute cast to her mouth. Perhaps it is time that you become acquainted with some hard facts. Chapter 31 Kitty was not entirely sure what to expect as the carriage rolled onward toward her parents' new home. Previously, they had been comfortably settled at a very tiny address on Park Lane, in a bright and spacious townhouse covered in white London stucco, with gilded window frames and a wide front door. Now, the carriage wound through London streets, which were becoming noisier and more crowded as they went on. It was easier for her to focus on what she would be going to instead of what she was leaving. If she dwelt too long on that, she would simply break down into tears and possibly never stop. It would do her no good to linger on what she had lost. With a fierce optimism, she was determined to only consider what she had accomplished. In spite of her circumstances, she had made a good match in terms of security and position. Her parents would have a guaranteed place to live. Most importantly, she had secured Seth's future. The carriage finally pulled to a stop in front of a moderately sized red brick home. It was nothing compared to the home that she had grown up in, nor the Cluette's Grand Town home, but it was not the disintegrating cracker box that she had feared. As she stepped out of the carriage, one hand braced by a footman for balance, she could not help but note that at least one of the upper windows was freshly bricked up. She winced a little, as this was only done by those who could not afford the window tax, 
and needed to reduce the amount of windows in their home in a hurry. Though Cheapside was a moderately respectable neighbourhood, it still had the unfavourable whiff of commerce about it. It didn't matter how well situated the home, nor the wealth of those who lived there. It was simply impossible to rid oneself of the taint of trade once settled there. Certainly some streets and lanes of Cheapside were more favourable than others. But the Johnsons were not so lucky. With a glance up and down the street, Kitty could see that they were hemmed in by shops, doctors' offices, and solicitors with their names and practices announced with brass plaques on doors. The sharp calls of shopkeepers and grocers echoed up and down all of Cheapside, punctuated by the shouts of those who sold their goods from carts and wagons. It was more than a little overwhelming for poor Kitty, who had grown used to the relative silence of the Cluett house, sequestered both within and without itself. But then, her mother was opening the front door, and that was all the invitation that Kitty needed to fly up the short front steps and into her mother's arms. Kitty, are you quite all right? Mrs Johnson asked, pulling back enough to catch sight of Kitty's face. I'm just so glad to see you, Kitty said, forcing herself to smile. This was all the reassurance that Mrs Johnson needed. Keeping one arm about Kitty, she took her other hand and drew her into their new home. The interior was humble, with a lived-in, shabby elegance that spoke to at one time being aspirational for a previous owner. The wall coverings were faded and dingy in the corners, but still showed beautiful patterns of flowers, stripes, even damask. The furniture, too, was faded but not threadbare. The biggest change was in Mrs Johnson's face. The stress and worry of the past year showed itself plainly in the lines about the corners of eyes and the grooves that had deepened next to her mouth. The dreamy serenity that she wore like a dusting of face powder was gone, along with most of her fine jewellery. Kitty knew better than to comment on it, as she knew that she wore a similar raiment now. Still, Mrs Johnson welcomed Kitty home with a gentle, familiar warmth that was both strange and welcome. Mrs Johnson had never been a particularly effusive mother. It was not the done thing for mothers of a certain class to be too fond of their children. And this had only been exacerbated by the loss of Kitty's brother, Stephen. Mrs Johnson had not been cold, not precisely, but she had always been sort of distant. It was as if she were viewing the world from the safety of a portrait. Occasionally, she would rouse herself enough to take an interest in Kitty's education or nudge her along regarding society. Now, however, she petted and hovered about Kitty the whole way through the house and up to her humble room. There was only the one, no more private sitting room or dressing room, forming a whole suite of apartments. However, Mrs Johnson insisted on keeping Kitty company through the whole thing, gently helping her to unpack and hang her dresses. Don't bother unpacking all of them, mother, Kitty said as Mrs Johnson was standing before the cedar closet. They will not fit, and it's not as if I will be here for long. The moment that Kitty said those words, she regretted them. Mrs Johnson turned and gave Kitty a stricken look of such pain that Kitty threw down the silk stockings she had been folding neatly together and rushed to her mother. I'm sorry, I did not mean to upset you, mother. It's just... Well, I returned home to be married, Kitty explained, taking one of her mother's cold hands in her own. I know that, darling, Mrs Johnson said, and then a familiar misty expression came into her eyes. It's just... It seems so final, so sudden. You were gone for so long and... Mrs Johnson made a strange little hiccuffing sound, and her eyes cleared a little. They were still glassy with unshed tears. I just missed you so, she said with plaintive honesty. Kitty's heart sank. You missed me? she asked, feeling a little foolish. Oh, Kitty, Mrs Johnson said with a choked laugh. She patted about her skirt, searching for a pocket. Once located, she withdrew a handkerchief. You must think me rather callous to be so surprised. No, not you mother, Kitty replied hastily. It's simply that, well, I wasn't sure if you and father ever noticed me before. 
Maybe we didn't, Mrs. Johnson agreed, placing her other hand over Kitty's. But it wasn't a week you were gone that I found myself waiting to hear you coming down the stairs, always skipping that last one. Without you here, there was no bright spot in our lives. Kitty smiled back at Mrs. Johnson, happy on some level that she had been missed so. This little bit of sentiment was all that it took for the gates to Kitty's heart to open up. She had been managing thus far, keeping a tight rein on her finer feelings, but all of her careful work keeping it contained was undone by her mother's simple kindness. Suddenly she found her own eyes burning with tears, and all of the anguish she had felt for the past year and three months came bursting out all at once. Without warning, she had thrown her arms about her mother's neck again, nearly overbalancing the pair of them. Mrs. Johnson's hands made vague but concerned fluttering motions behind Kitty's back, unsure how to respond to this latest outburst. Whatever is the matter, Kitty? I'm going to be married, Kitty said around a sob. This was not new information to Mrs. Johnson. It was the very reason that Kitty was returning home after all but she immediately understood that there was more behind Kitty's words. Kitty knew that she may not have known the specifics. At any rate, it was evident that Mrs. Johnson understood that there was some distress. Not knowing the full story, Mrs. Johnson instead settled on patting Kitty's back in a manner that she hoped was soothing and repeated a number of platitudes about all young brides being nervous. It was a perfectly natural state of being. Or so, Mrs. Johnson said repeatedly. Kitty only cried harder. It was agreed upon by all parties that the sooner the marriage contracts were signed, the better for all involved. Sir Wright was eager to be married. Mr Johnson was champing at the proverbial bit to not pay rent any longer. Mrs Johnson was convinced that a husband was all that Kitty needed to feel settled. Kitty wanted to hurry along all the preparations, so that she would not have time to listen to her nerves and back out. Therefore, Kitty was hardly settled back in her parents' house before it was announced that Sir Wright's solicitor would be calling upon them to draw up marriage contracts. This news was met with a listless sort of nod from Kitty, but then her father did not particularly expect her to participate. Kitty had done her part for the family marrying well and helping to sort out the family's financial woes. What was expected from Kitty was that she would assist her mother in attempting to make their residence look as presentable as possible. Thankfully, Kitty had become a dab hand at all manner of domestic chores, and she was grateful to throw herself back into the role. It was good to have her hands busy, as this helped prevent her from thinking too much. It was a Wednesday when the lawyer came to call, a shockingly mundane day to mark the end of Kitty's youthful freedom. January was sliding into February and bringing with it grey days of freezing rain and slushy snow in the gutters. There was no fanfare to announce the arrival, no great proclamation. There was only a plain carriage pulled by a plain brown horse, from which alighted a plain man carrying a nondescript folio beneath his arm. They'd hired a footman for the afternoon who was standing at attention by the door. He had exactly one job to do today, and that was to announce the arrival, and then to attend them, as they spoke for about an hour. The young man, a tall gangly specimen with a flop of brown hair on top of his head, had been given very clear instructions, and Kitty had seen him standing before the hall mirror, mouthing the name of the solicitor over and over again. Kitty stood next to her mother, her hands folded at her waist, waiting to receive the solicitor. It was hoped that by introducing a little feminine charm and hospitality before the negotiations, that they might soften him up a little. Mr Johnson thought that with a little clever wording, he might even be able to insert a clause about a little cash settlement upon himself as well. From the moment that Kitty laid eyes upon the lawyer, however, she knew that this was a folly. He was dressed plainly in a brown wool overcoat and a grey jacket beneath it, his cravat tied neatly but simply. He wore a tricorn hat in defiance of the current fashion, which revealed a bald head that was trying desperately to cover its shame. 
with a few locks of brown hair brushed over. This unassuming appearance could not disguise his downturned mouth, fixed in a perpetual scowl, bringing his brow along for the ride. Mr. Alcott, the footman announced at a volume more suited for a Mayfair ballroom. Kitty glanced sideways at her mother, who was busy closing her eyes for a moment, likely praying that Mr. Alcott would not notice. Kitty, however, was engaged in a frown of her own soon enough. The name of the lawyer jarred something in her, as if his name were something important that she should remember. She was considering if she had met him before in Lady Veronica's service when he stepped aside, gesturing to someone behind him. He had not come alone. I have brought my daughter, he said in a thin, reedy voice. She was most eager to meet Miss Johnson and pay her compliments. The young lady stepped forward, pushing back the hood of a calash, revealing a face alive with intelligence. Kitty took an involuntary step backward, staring openly at her. May I present Miss Magdalena Alcott, the solicitor continued dully. Miss Alcott, Kitty cried inwardly, the very same who seemed intent on marrying Seth. The two young ladies stared at each other, frozen in some sort of silent battle of wills. Kitty, her duties as a kind and gracious hostess, completely forgotten, was only dimly aware as her mother swept forward to greet the new arrivals. Of course, you are both most welcome, Mrs Johnson said sweetly, punctuating her words with a gentle smile. How kind of you to bring along Miss Olcott, she continued. I am sure that Kitty would be most grateful for the company. Would you care to follow me to the drawing room, Mr Olcott? We have tea already laid for you. The solicitor made a disgruntled sound. I am not here to socialise, Mrs Johnson, merely to ascertain particular facts as relate to the contracts in question. Mrs Johnson's smile did not falter, merely becoming more placating and genteel. Oh, of course not. I would never suggest otherwise, she said, gesturing for Mr Alcott to follow her. It's simply so cold and damp out there today. I would hate for you to be uncomfortable while you work. Their voices faded as Mrs Johnson led Mr Alcott deeper within the house, leaving Kitty and Miss Alcott alone in the foyer. They merely continued to stare appraisingly at one another, neither one speaking. At last Kitty lifted her chin proudly. Well, she said, refusing to be cowed by the other young lady. Have you come to gloat? Chapter 32 Have you come to gloat? Kitty's words hung in the air of the foyer like a challenge. Disconcertingly, Miss Alcott did not respond immediately. Instead, she tilted her head to one side as if Kitty were a new species to be studied. Kitty was not so easily cowed, however, and refused to flinch. At last, a small smile stretched across Miss Alcott's remarkably symmetrical mouth. I have not, she said at last. Quite the opposite, in fact. A maid appeared, wiping her hands nervously on her apron, and stepped forward to help remove Miss Alcott's calash. Once her damp outer garment had been dispensed with, she turned her surprisingly calm, green-brown eyes upon Kitty again. Is there somewhere we might speak privately? It is imperative that we not be disturbed, and better if they think we are nothing more than two simple girls discussing nothing more than girlish pursuits. Kitty stared for a moment, not sure how to respond to such a request. We might retire to my room if the notion does not offend you, she allowed at last. Not in the least, Miss Alcott replied approvingly. In fact, that is perfect. I am relieved to find that you are not a dullard, Miss Johnson, she continued as Kitty led her up the narrow stairs. I... Thank you, Kitty responded, feeling a little perturbed. The upstairs was defined by narrow halls and rooms, all jammed together. Kitty's room was in the northwest corner, with the advantage of two windows for better light. Unfortunately, this also meant that she had the disadvantage of a persistent little draught which kept her room fairly chill. I am sorry I can't offer more hospitable accommodations, she apologised. Miss Alcott waved off her concern, moving instead to peek out the windows, 
her eyes darting over the neighbouring rooftops and alleys. Kitty took up the fireplace poker and stirred the embers about, then hooked a small log and laid it carefully over the remains of the morning's fire. She had been admonished severely about the importance of not wasting fuel, but she could not imagine that her parents would begrudge her use now. They could hardly wish the lawyer's daughter to freeze. When she turned back around, she found Miss Alcott staring at her again in a most curious fashion. It was unsettling, and made Kitty a little peevish. "'Why do you stare at me so?' she demanded. "'Because I wish to understand you,' Miss Alcott answered immediately. "'I live my life according to facts that I can easily observe and then understand. "'I have not been long in your company, though I have heard much about you. "'These testimonials were hardly unbiased, however, "'and I wish to ascertain your character for myself as quickly as possible.' Testimonials? Kitty echoed, shifting the poker nervously from hand to hand. Who do you mean? Miss Alcott gave another of her small smiles. Whom do you suppose would be eager to discuss you? You cannot mean Seth, Kitty said flatly, refusing to believe it. I agree, it is a little strange for a man to discuss his former paramour with the woman it appears as if he will marry, Miss Alcott agreed. "'May I sit?' she asked, gesturing to the small chair before the fire. Kitty nodded, and Miss Alcott settled herself daintily. "'I'm not sure that I would describe myself as his paramour,' Kitty said, unsure if she should be insulted. "'The semantics of it aren't important,' Miss Alcott said, gesturing for Kitty to sit as well. Kitty obliged, perching herself on the corner of her bed, one hand on the thick wooden post. "'I must tell you, Miss Alcott,' that this visit is all highly irregular. That is true, Miss Alcott agreed. In fact, this whole business seems highly irregular, does it not? When Kitty frowned, Miss Alcott held up a calming hand. Before I go on, I needed to determine the depth of your attachment to Seth. And no, do not bother denying it, for I am quite aware of it, and I admire the depths that you seem willing to go to for him. But... Kitty prompted. But, Miss Alcott continued, if you had given in completely to this scheme and were resigned to your fate, then I should not bother attempting to shed light on the strangeness of it all. Do not mistake me. I have no great amount of feeling for our erstwhile Viscount, but I also have no great objection to marrying him. He is kind and amiable enough, and one could very well do worse. True enough, Kitty grudgingly agreed. But you were immediately prickly toward me, which is a very good sign indeed, Miss Alcott concluded. It is, Kitty asked, her head spinning a little from the strange direction this conversation was taking. Oh, yes, Miss Alcott agreed, lacing her fingers together. It means that you are not entirely content with this scheme. Surely you can see that there is something odd afoot here? Kitty simply stared for a moment, blinking rapidly at this odd creature. It was all a little untoward, the way in which she had invited herself along and then demanded a private audience with Kitty. Still, there was something undeniably honest in her face, in the earnest way in which she spoke. Kitty had no reason to doubt her sincerity, particularly when what she said aligned with a deep-rooted suspicion within Kitty's own mind. Yes, Kitty said slowly, I do find that something is amiss, though I cannot name what it is. I have tried to convince myself that it is all down to nerves before my pending nuptials, but she trailed off, looking away. This is it, precisely. Now we are clever girls, Miss Alcott said, rising slightly to access the pocket in her skirt. There is no reason we shouldn't be able to solve this mystery. Us, Kitty asked, her eyebrows shooting up her forehead. How? For starters, by not underestimating ourselves, Miss Alcott replied with a significant look at Kitty. She fished about in her pocket for a moment, then withdrew a bundle of folded papers. I have been my father's daughter my whole life, she continued with an inexplicable logic that made Kitty's forehead itch. I have been surrounded by legal words and debates about law since before I was out of leading strings. 
I would wager that I know more about property law and parliamentary procedure than nearly any working solicitor. She turned her level gaze on to Kitty. I dare say that you have quite a head for business. What with your father's occupation? Me? Kitty nearly squeaked. What on earth would make you say that? Miss Alcott had stood and had moved to the other side of Kitty's bed and was in the process of carefully unfolding the papers she had smuggled up to Kitty's room. She glanced up and arched one sharp eyebrow at Kitty. Are you going to tell me that you've heard nothing at all in all of these years under your father's roof? Not a single thing you've learned when you're taking tea into the men? Kitty bit her lip, considering. Well, I suppose I might know something about credit and interest, but I've never... You are... Were... Considered one of the most fashionable young ladies in all of London. Miss Alcott continued, straightening a page here, soothing another there. Do you mean to tell me that you've no idea how to ascertain a good bargain? I refuse to believe that you'd set a single dainty boot into a draper's without knowing how to drive a hard bargain. She stood at last, levelling a glare at Kitty, that fairly dared her to be contradicted. Kitty shifted uncomfortably. It had never suited her to believe herself particularly clever, at least when it came to anything other than picking out shoes and dance partners. She had been raised with the certainty that men did n not want clever wives, and to attempt to apply that label to herself felt wrong, like biting into an overly ripe apple. I suppose you are right, Kitty allowed at last, but I haven't your skill at understanding all of that legal jargon. The only real talent I have is for looking at fashion plates and knowing which will be flattering. Contrarily, Miss Alcott's face lit up a little. You see shapes? She said something approaching a smile on her lips. You can remember how things look, yes? This is good. I have no head for things like that. Here, she said, beckoning Kitty closer, with a wave of her hand. Cast your eye over all of this and tell me what you see. Obligingly, Kitty leaned over, careful not to upset the careful arrangement. She tilted her head this way and that, trying to understand what she was looking at. A map in the centre caught her attention, and she stood up to come around the other side. What is it? Miss Alka asked eagerly, as if Kitty were a hound that had caught the scent of a fox. I'm not sure. Kitty said, pushing aside a page that was blocking part of the crude map. Is this significant? she asked, pointing at the map in question. I'm not sure, Miss Alcott admitted. It's a hasty tracing of a very old bit of paper father has had on his desk for weeks now. I must own that my skills with a pencil are somewhat lacking, but given its prominence, it seemed important. Kitty stared down at the page something tickling at the back of her mind, but she could not bring it into sharp focus. I've seen this shape before, she said slowly. I cannot tell you where, but something about it. Her brows knitted together in thought, and she automatically reached up with one finger to smooth the crease that appeared between them. I could swear I have seen this somewhere in father's office. That is good, Miss Alcott encouraged. We have something to work on. Let us see what we might discover as quickly as possible between the two of us. In the meantime, she said, beginning to fold some of the papers back up, let us do what we can to delay proceedings as much as possible. I suspect both of those things might be easier said than done, Kitty muttered darkly. Of course. Kitty was proved quite right about that ominous statement. No sooner had Mr. Alcott and his daughter departed than Kitty was summoned into the tiny alcove that served as a sitting room. Mr. Johnson, clearly feeling quite puffed up and smug, was standing before the fire, one hand inserted into his jacket as if he were posing for a portrait. Mrs. Johnson sat serenely on a sofa with scuffed legs and hideous yellow velvet coverings. When Kitty entered, Mr. Johnson addressed her directly, which was an odd enough occurrence that Kitty stared openly for a moment. 
You are to be congratulated, my dear, he said. You have managed to secure quite a match. I dare say that it won't be a fortnight before we are removed from these premises. Onward and upward, eh? A fortnight? Kitty repeated, her heart dropping. Surely you cannot mean that I should be married that quickly. Surely I do mean that, Mr Johnson replied, his plummy expression and tone falling just a little. You cannot mean for your mother and I to linger here in this dusty hovel any longer than strictly necessary. Of course not, but... Her voice faltered and she scrambled to find an excuse. But what, Mr Johnson demanded, you've managed to snare a husband of means and position, with enough in his coffers to buy you as many ruffled petticoats and ribbons as you could possibly desire. What else could you possibly want from a match? Stung, Kitty drew back a little, rocking on her heels. I am not so shallow as that, father. Kitty, you are not without your charms, but let us not pretend that you have ever wanted anything more than a closet of new frocks and a handsome carriage to ride out in, Mr Johnson said condescendingly. Kitty stared for a moment, her eyes darting back and forth between her parents. Mr Johnson, chin lifted, regarded her with a patronising indulgence, as if she were a little girl to be pacified by a trip to an ice shop. Mrs Johnson, however, watched Kitty silently, but with an interested flick of her eyes. "'What is it, Kitty?' Mrs Johnson asked gently, patting the space on the sofa next to her. "'It's just... it's just so fast,' Kitty answered honestly, accepting her mother's invitation with a flop. No one cared to mention that. As she did so, a puff of dust rose up from the sofa. "'Aren't you in the least worried about the look of the thing?' People might talk, she said, leaning in significantly, as if aforementioned people might be listening at keyholes. Oh, Mrs Johnson said, immediately understanding. She nodded slowly, the implication clear to her. She may have a point, Harold, Mrs Johnson said to her husband. Let them talk, Mr Johnson countered. They will have something new to gossip about before the month is out. But, my dear... Mrs Johnson said, her tone soft but pleading. Aren't you at all worried that Sir Wright will be put out by such gossip? He travels in such rarefied circles after all. I am not, Mr Johnson snapped, particularly when it was his own wish that they be settled as quickly as possible. He turned his attention to Kitty again, pinning her to the sofa with a stern look. You shall be wed in a fortnight and I will brook no histrionics, no absurd plots, or any other tomfoolery on the subject. With that, he marched from the room, his head held high as if he had just won a field of victory. Mrs Johnson gave a distressed little sigh. How will we ever manage to make this look respectable? There's barely time to put it into the papers, let alone have you complete your engagement visits. And the trousseau? Kitty added absently, her mind whirling. The true soul, Mrs Johnson gasped, her face going pale. I'm living under an axe that will fall in two weeks' time, Kitty thought to herself as her mother began fretting about handkerchiefs and linens and dresses. Can two young ladies solve a mystery with such a deadline? It felt like a preposterous proposal to Kitty. But then she was becoming rather used to those. Chapter 33 no matter Kitty's feigned concern at the hastiness of her engagement, Mr Johnson would not be swayed, nor would Sir Wright. Mrs Johnson kept her thoughts to herself, but Kitty had caught her watching her with poorly disguised concern in her eyes. Kitty wasn't even entirely sure what she was attempting to drag her heels about. There had been no further word from Miss Alcott, and she was half convinced that she had dreamed up the whole strange episode. To put her faith in a young lady whom she had no real knowledge of was asking quite a bit. Kitty was caught up in a current that she could not fight, swept along the river of wedding preparations. She had inured herself to all of it, which allowed the days to pass along in something of a mindless blur. Sir Wright had largely ignored her, except for on one occasion where he had presented her to the Prince Regent, who had also largely ignored her except to stare at her ankles. 
The only attempt at independence that Kitty made was to sneak into her father's office, smaller and more cramped than it used to be, spent a solid hour rifling through old receipts and stock orders. None of it made any sense to Kitty, and she was at the point of giving up when she spotted a worn trunk, covered with an old lace shawl. It was incongruous, this antique bit of femininity, in the middle of the masculine environment of her father's office. Drawn toward it, she slowly lifted off the lace covering, but her heart sank when she realised that it was locked. She was at the point of giving up when she gave the lock an experimental tug. It was new and shiny, unyielding, but the wood about the latch was old and soft and the latch nearly popped free. Casting a glance about herself to ascertain that she was alone, Kitty put both hands to the latch and gave a solid pull. It came loose in her hand and she stared down at it for a moment. Quickly casting it aside, she lifted the lid, unsure of what she would find, but hopeful that it would reveal something, anything that would shed some light on the situation. Within, there weren't any stacks of papers with helpful labels like how to remove oneself from an unwanted engagement or secret plots and how to commence them. Instead, it seemed to be piled high with all manner of bric-a-brac that had cluttered the walls of Mr. Johnson's office when he had enjoyed larger accommodations. Kitty groaned inwardly as she tried to sift through it, nearly losing her nerve when she came across the head of a taxidermized creature that Stephen had sent home, something like a rabbit with antlers. He had sworn up and down that it was a real specimen, telling Kitty wild stories about them, which she had listened to with rapt attention. There were a number of years between them, but he had always been kind to her, complying with her demands for tales of his far-off ports of call or a new ribbon for her hair. Her heart hurt, for she missed him, and wondered what he would have thought of her current predicament. Boldness, little sister, she could almost hear him saying behind her. If bravery fails, boldness will triumph. Shaking her head free of the memories, she pushed aside the disturbingly furry head on a plaque rummaging about more. She wasn't even sure what she was looking for, or even why she was bothering searching through this particular trunk. It's not as if I have that many options, Kitty grudgingly admitted to herself, stifling a sneeze. She was at the point of giving up when a small frame caught her eye. The frame was relatively simple, the gilt flaking off. The glass over what was within was darkened with dust, grimy to the touch. Frowning, Kitty lifted it, tilting it this way and that in an attempt to see what it was. It appeared to be a bit of old parchment, the markings on it obscured by the filthy glass. Glancing about, she picked up the old shawl that had been covering the trunk. With a silent apology to what had surely once been a beautiful garment, Kitty took one corner and delicately tried to wipe some of the smuts free. It was not wholly effective, mostly moving the grime about in swirls. Enough was cleared, however, that when Kitty peered close, she saw that it was a small slice of map. Her eyes widened as she stared at it, her mind racing. The shape was instantly familiar. She had seen it hanging on the wall of her father's office, sandwiched between larger paintings from the moment she was old enough to take notice of such things. That was not the only reason it was familiar, however. Though Miss Alcott's rendering had been crude, it was clearly the same outline that she had shown to Kitty. She lifted the framed bit of map, possibilities racing through her mind. A sound from the hallway broke the spell that she was under, startling her into almost dropping it. Working quickly, she put everything back into the trunk, closed it up and replaced the latch from the hole it had popped from. It was only precariously sitting there and would surely fall out of the trunk were in the least jostled. Kitty crossed her fingers and hoped that it would hold long enough for her to solve this mystery. Delicately, she replaced the shawl back on top of the trunk and nodded to herself, pleased by her cleverness and duplicity. Clutching the little picture to her chest, Kitty scurried out of the office and back up the stairs as silently as she could. 
There was no reason for her to be skulking about at this hour, and, if caught, she would have to speak quickly to answer any questions. Luckily, she made it to her room, her feet flying through the small upstairs hall as lightly as possible. Gently, she closed her door, latching it behind her. The fire in her room was banked, the floors and her narrow bed bathed in shadows. She crawled into her bed, kicking her shoes off, but refusing to let go of the strange little map in the frame. She stared at it until her eyes grew heavy, and at last, she slept. It was a wholly unwelcome surprise to be awakened early the next morning by her bedroom curtains being thrown open, letting the sunlight hit her directly in the face. Kitty groaned and squeezed her eyes closed tighter, reaching up to fold her pillow over her face. She wished herself fervently back asleep, but the sounds of people entering her room made it impossible. "'Come now, Kitty!' Mrs Johnson said, breezing into Kitty's room, as if it weren't an ungodly hour. "'The modiste has come to finish your fitting.' "'Fitting?' Kitty asked blearily, cracking one of her eyes open a bit. "'What fitting?' "'Oh, Kitty, really?' Mrs Johnson chided, standing over the maid as she mended to Kitty's fire. For your wedding dress, of course. Kitty groaned and rolled over, pulling her blanket up over her head. This was in vain, however, for Mrs Johnson merely snatched the blanket away, the shock of the cold morning air making Kitty squeal and bolt upright. Mother, she gasped, her teeth immediately chattering, this is really unnecessary. Why can't I simply wear something in my closet from my last season? Even as she said the words, she knew that they were absurd. Mrs Johnson agreed, turning slowly to stare at Kitty, as if she had sprouted a second head. That might do well enough for a tradesman's daughter, but you are going to marry a peer of the realm, a close, personal friend of the Prince of Wales. What can you be thinking of? When Kitty didn't answer, Mrs Johnson came closer, peering into her daughter's face. Kitty avoided her gaze, sullen. When have you ever turned down a fitting for a new dress? Are you quite well? You're not feverish, are you? She pressed the inside of her wrist to Kitty's forehead, who sighed. I'm not ill, mother, she said, pulling her knees up to her chest, wrapping her arms about them. It just doesn't feel real. Mrs Johnson patted her on the knee. I understand. I felt as if I were moving through a dream before my wedding too. Some breakfast will help to set you right, she continued, waving off the maid back downstairs. In the meantime, let's get you prepared for the modiste. With another groan, Kitty allowed herself to be pulled from the bed. She was quickly put into her chemise and stays, her hair pinned up out of the way, then left to shiver for a few moments alone. She wrapped her arms about herself, standing as close to the fire as she dared. The sound of the front door opening and closing echoed through the house, setting the old-fashioned leaded windows to shaking in their loose frames. Steps soon followed, creaking their way up the stairs. Mrs Johnson's voice floated upward as well, chatting quietly with their guest. Each step that they made sounded to Kitty like the hammer of an undertaker on the nails of a coffin. Her arms clutched about herself tighter and tighter, as if she could physically hold herself together. The door to her bedroom pushed open a bit and a voice called through the margin, Kitty? Kitty stared at the door, certain that she could not possibly be hearing what she thought she was. Her heart thudding loudly in her ears, lifted by hope. Kitty watched as the door opened wider, admitting the guests more fully into the room. But this was no modiste. A stylish brunette head poked into the room, accompanied by the loveliest face that nature had surely ever seen fit to bestow on a lady. Immediately, tears of joy sprang to Kitty's eyes, and her throat nearly closed over with sentiment. After only a moment's hesitation, Kitty threw herself at the interloper, arms outstretched, crying her name. The force of her embrace nearly knocked both of them over, right into Mrs Johnson. Eva! Chapter 34 
Lady Ava Galpin, nee Stanton, did not object to being nearly bowled over by Kitty. This was apparently not wholly unexpected, for she only huffed out a surprised laugh, but gleefully wrapped Kitty up in a warm embrace. Am I to understand that I have been missed then? Ava asked dryly. You've no idea, Kitty cried, releasing Eva only long enough to draw her further into the room. I can't tell you what a relief it is to see you here. Well, I could scarcely miss my most darling, dearest Kitty's wedding now, could I? Eva replied smoothly, her velvety voice a balm on Kitty's bruised heart. Nonchalantly, she took Kitty's hand in both of hers, in a simple gesture of friendship that no one would have suspected. Quickly, however, she used her thumb to mark a little X on Kitty's hand just above the thumb. Kitty looked into Eva's face, who, with only the smallest quirk of her eyebrows, indicated that Kitty had not been mistaken. It had long been the signal they would give to each other when, in the company of one or the other's parents, that they had something important to say, but only in private. Kitty understood at once and glanced over Eva's shoulder. Mother, might you find some tea for Eva? Her poor hands are nearly frozen solid, Kitty asked sweetly, reaching deep for one of her dimpled winning smiles. Mrs Johnson hesitated, her lips pursing a little. Oh, very well, she relented when Kitty gave her a beseeching look. The modiste will likely wish for refreshments as well. The moment that Mrs Johnson had departed, Kitty slowly closed her door, not wishing to raise any alarms. She waited for a moment, listening at the door to ensure that Mrs Johnson really had gone down the stairs. Satisfied, she turned back around to Eva, who had not removed her dark blue travelling cloak yet. If Mother returns, we are discussing your recent tour. Nothing more, Kitty said hurriedly, her voice low. Is everything all right? W what is it? I might ask you the same thing, Ava replied, reaching into the folds of her cloak and withdrawing a folio that was tied shut with a burgundy ribbon. Some strange girl hounded on my door before the servants were even awake scaring Josiah and I nearly half to death, and demanded that I place this into your hands as soon as possible. Eva did just that, thrusting the folio in Kitty's direction. Kitty took it automatically, frowning a little in confusion. A strange girl? Who was it? Someone I've never laid eyes on before, at least to my knowledge, Eva continued, drawing her hands from her gloves, then releasing the tie on her cloak. A Miss Alcott. Miss Halcott? Kitty asked, her eyes growing wide. Immediately she sat on her bed and began unknotting the ribbon holding the folio closed. Entirely possible, Eva said, stretching her hands out in the direction of the low fire. She was speaking so fast it was nearly impossible to understand her. A small card was slipped into the folio, resting on the top of a sheaf of papers some yellowed with age. On the card was written a brief note, the letters so precise that they looked nearly printed by a press. Miss Johnson, I believe this is the key to the mystery at the heart of this whole affair. The land that Sir Wright has claimed is not his at all, but was seized through an enclosure act. He has no right to this, nor to use it as a bargaining chip. Do not let him get away with it. Miss Alcott had signed it roughly, her anger showing in the harshness of her signature, Beneath was all the evidence she had acquired, showing that the patch of land in question was indeed the property of someone last named Tarau. It had been used as a common green for so long that all knowledge of ownership had passed out of memory. Thus, Sir Wright had been able to instigate an enclosure act in Parliament, evicting all those who made use of it. Kitty stared down, her fingers moving faster and faster over the pages, she did not understand all of it, but it was clear that Sir Wright and Mr Alcott had done some swift manoeuvring to secure this. What is it? Kitty, you've gone white as a sheet, Ava said, sitting next to Kitty and putting an arm about her. It's Sir Wright, Kitty breathed, distracted by her reading. What of him? Your fiancé, yes? Ava asked. Yes, Kitty said, still reading. It would seem that he and his solicitor have done something quite underhanded indeed. The poor Tyrells, whoever they may be, 
have been completely cheated of their property. Of all the low things to do... Kitty! Mrs Johnson barked, standing in the doorway and holding a tray. Kitty had been so absorbed by her reading that she had not heard her approach. That is no way to speak of the man that you will marry. She stepped closer, putting the tray down with a clatter on a side table. What on earth even is all that? Mrs Johnson demanded, snatching up the folio before Kitty could stop her. Please, mother, you must listen, Kitty cried, reaching for it. What is Kitty? What are you doing with a map of Pittman's Green? Mrs Johnson continued, pulling out a piece of paper from the folio. I had completely forgotten about it. What does all of this mean? Pittman's Green, Kitty echoed, her eyes narrowing. I've heard that name before. I should wonder if you hadn't, Mrs Johnson continued, huffing a little. It's been in my family for centuries. Of course, these days, most people call it Pittman's Common, which is not correct, naturally. Pittman's Common, Kitty repeated. Without warning, she pounced on the folio that Mrs Johnson was still holding. Mrs Johnson made sounds of protest, but Kitty ignored her, rifling through the pages. How does the name Tyrrell fit into all of this? My family were descended from Tyrrells, Mrs Johnson answered, as if it should be common knowledge. Honestly, Kitty, you are worrying me with all... Kitty ignored her, rounding instead to her bed. The picture she had taken from the trunk was not there, and she bent over nearly double as she attempted to see if it had fallen during the night. It had, cracking the glass. Still, Kitty let out a yell of triumph and lifted it as if it were a mighty trophy. Unceremoniously, she thrust it at Mrs Johnson. This is the land you were speaking of, yes? This is Pittman's Common, which is really Pittman's Green, Kitty demanded, holding the picture a scant couple inches from Mrs Johnson's nose. Oh, for heaven's sake, Kitty, that is filthy, Mrs Johnson protested, but Kitty would not relent. Yes, that is it, Mrs Johnson clarified at last, trying to draw back from the pile of dust and grime. Why does Sir Wright claim to own it now? Kitty asked the room at large, which only caused Mrs Johnson to look at her blankly. Would the Tyrells have sold it? Ava suggested. Perhaps I know they ran into difficulties in the 1720s with the credit bubble, Mrs Johnson agreed. Kitty, however, was ignoring them. She was peering at the map in the frame, turning it this way and that, now that she could see it in daylight. It seemed that there was a fold along one edge, the map too fat to simply be a single sheet of paper. Eva, help me get this out of the frame, Kitty commanded. Together, they flipped the picture over, Ava's fingers scrabbling against the little latches on the back. It's rusted shut, Ava grunted, trying her best to wrench the latches free. Kitty's eyes darted about, looking for something to use to prise them loose. Her gaze landed on the corner of the hearth, and she flipped the picture over to see the glass front. Without warning, she snatched it from Eva's hands, lifted it over her head, and brought it down with a smash on the corner of the hearth. Glass splintered and cracked, falling out across the floor. Kitty, Mrs Johnson gasped, her mouth a neat O oh, of surprise. What is the meaning of all of these dramatics? Not now, Kitty said absently, delicately reaching into the frame and withdrawing the map. As she suspected, it was indeed folded over, several times, in fact. Gingerly, mindful of the aged parchment, she laid it carefully out across her bed. With each unfolding of the document, more and more became apparent. It was a beautifully rendered map, with Pittman's green clearly laid out in a bold outline. Along the margins, faded but still legible penmanship was scrawled, stamped here and there with important-looking seals and ribbons. Kitty's eyes roved over the writing, her mouth moving as she read it. She did not understand a lot of it, but there were some phrases that were patently obvious. Mother, Kitty breathed. Sir Wright doesn't own Pittman's Green. You do. Excitedly, Kitty waved Mrs Johnson over, her obliged grudgingly. Look here, 
It says that this piece of land is willed along the female line of your family. It was never sold, just forgotten. It was to be used as a dowry in case there were no other means. But... But Sir Wright said... Mrs Johnson protested weakly. Mother, he meant to stick you and father into a nasty little house along a turnpike and force you to use your daughter to pay for the privilege and expected you to be grateful about it. On your own land, Kitty cried, outraged. Oh, that is... That's... Mrs. Johnson floundered, her normally placid face showing concerned creases. And what's more, Kitty said, straightening, her arms flapping about a little in her agitation. He meant to use this stolen land to blackmail Seth, Viscount Cluet, into giving him a piece of the proverbial pie when the land was developed. Ava stared at Kitty, and Mrs. Johnson, still holding the folio, looked from the map on the bed to the folio in her hands. Kitty marched over, snatching it from her mother's hands. This is why he was so eager to arrange the marriage between his solicitor's daughter and the oh-so-eligible Viscount Cluet, she said, closing the folio with a snap and shaking it in Mrs. Johnson's direction. It was all a part of this scheme. Oh, this is too much. Mrs. Johnson now joined Eva in staring at Kitty. She was silent for a moment more, then blurted, The scoundrel! Now it was Kitty, and Eva's turn to stare at Mrs. Johnson. Mother, Kitty breathed, for it was the harshest thing she had ever heard her mother say about anyone, ever. That brings me to the other half of the message Miss Alcott left me with, Eva interjected. She said that she would stall for as long as she could, but she and her father were going to the Cluettes to sign marriage contracts at ten o'clock this morning. She said, and I quote, Please tell the frilly miss to make up her mind quick and her feet quicker. The hall clock downstairs chose that particular moment to chime nine times, marking the hour. Kitty could feel the blood drain from her face. I have to get across London and quick. Eva, might I borrow your carriage? Ava shook her head. No such luck, I'm afraid, she said ruefully. I had to hire one. Feeling a little wild, Kitty began to pace, considering the options. There was no way there was time for someone to run down to the stables and hire one out and then get across London during the morning crush. It was folly to even consider. How much money have you to hand, mother? Kitty asked suddenly, her eyes fixing on Mrs Johnson. Well, I was supposed to pay the butcher today, but... Fetch it, quickly, Kitty said. Darting to her wardrobe, she threw open the closet, rummaging through it. I have a riding habit somewhere in here. I am sure of it. Mrs Johnson paused, part way out of Kitty's room. We had to put much into storage. Your wardrobe wasn't big enough to accommodate everything. Kitty stared again, feeling everything slip away from her. Out of habit, she locked eyes with Eva, who bit her lip, troubled. There was no way that Kitty could go riding off across London without a proper skirt, and there was no other option. Everything would be so much easier if I were simply a man, she thought without real conviction. And that was the precise moment that an idea so audacious dawned in her head that she knew if she dared to utter it out loud, not only would her mother denounce it there and then, but Kitty would likely lose her nerve too. With much greater calm than she actually felt, Kitty crossed the room to her window and threw it open, leaning out on her hands. Her eyes searched the little alley below until she caught sight of a grubby boy. You, yes, you little fellow, would you care to earn some silver? She called down, waving a little to get his attention. Yes, miss, he called back up without hesitation. His face was thin and he wore only rags about his feet, likely one of hundreds of little scrappers from one of the rookeries coming to rummage for something to eat. Go and find me a horse, any horse. Bring it to the front door of this house quick as you can, Kitty shouted down. The boy tipped his hat at her, and Kitty withdrew back into her room, slamming the window shut. Ava, come with me, Kitty instructed, breezing right past Mrs Johnson. 
I will need your help to dress. Quick, we have to go to the attic. The attic? Mrs Johnson and Eva asked in unison. Yes, Kitty said without slowing. That is where Stephen's trunk is. Why, what are you, Kitty? You cannot, Mrs Johnson stammered, protesting, her voice rising with each piece of a sentence. Eva, however, was silent and followed Kitty obediently. Together, they forced open the swollen door of the attic, a waft of cold air greeting them. Kitty glanced back over her shoulder, finding that Mrs Johnson was frozen in place. The money, mother, Kitty cried, her tone growing desperate. With a strange look on her face, Mrs Johnson turned away and hurried to her own room, hopefully to retrieve the required funds and not Mr Johnson. Within a quarter of an hour, Kitty had shimmied into one of Stephen's musty shirts, creased from years of being folded into a trunk. Both Kitty and Ava hadn't the slightest clue what to do with the cravat, so the neck was left open. Thankfully, Kitty had left her chemise and stays on underneath, so she wasn't totally exposed by the long slit at the neck. After some hesitation, Kitty had managed to get her legs into the breeches, but then simply stared down at the buttons and full front without a clue as to how they worked. Oh, for... Eva huffed, stepping forward and expertly buttoning them about Kitty's waist. Kitty said nothing but gave Eva an arch look, which only made her blush a little and wave Kitty off. With the addition of one of Stephen's red coats and her feet stuffed into riding boots that were sizes too big, Kitty looked the part, or nearly, until Eva jammed a hat on her head. With a nod and a quick swat of her behind, Eva sent her on her way, Kitty galumphing down the hall in a manner so gangly that it simply defied description. Madame Dobry, real name Bertha Dunbar, had seen more than a few things in her time as a modiste, particularly when it came time to fit wedding dresses. She'd had to discreetly let out seams, ignore tears, and pretend not to hear all manner of tawdry utterance. Sats is about the intended groom. She'd also had a number of reservations about paying a call on Mrs Johnson on behalf of her daughter, soon to be married, at an address in Cheapside, but had been persuaded by the promise of sufficient compensation. She had arrived in style, trailing an assistant and alighting from a carriage. With one gloved hand, she was prepared to knock on the door, grimacing a little at the lack of a dignified bow to pull, when the door was yanked open violently from the inside. A young soldier burst forth, pushing past Madame Dobry so abruptly that it upset not only her own sizable person, but that of her assistant as well. The two of them went tumbling backward, crying out in alarm. The soldier did not pause, his hair wild and cheeks flushed as he sprinted to a waiting horse, held at the mouth by some unfortunate boy. The modiste managed to get her feet under her, just as she watched the young man scramble awkwardly onto the horse who looked to be harnessed for a cart and not riding. It had the heavy bones of a workhorse too, but the young man dug his heels into its sides, and they were off down the street. The urchin left behind waved merrily after them as they departed, seemingly unconcerned by the shouts from down the street and the chaos at the door of the house. Well, there's an ill omen for a wedding, Madame Dobry sniffed to herself. Always bad tidings when a young man is chased from the bride's home before she marries another. Chapter 35 Things were most definitely, quite assuredly, and without question, not going well at the Cluett house. For starters, Mr Alcott and his reticent daughter had arrived late, which had put Lady Veronica into a foul humour from the very beginning, as if this were not bad enough. Then... Mr Alcott appeared to have misplaced a codicil to the marriage contract, which was only located after a solid ten minutes of searching the pockets of his leather satchel. Finally, quill pens somehow seemed to keep going missing, which mystified everyone standing about the desk in the library. That is, everyone except Seth. He saw precisely where they were going, but kept his own counsel. It seemed that not only was Miss Alcott blessed with a quick mind, but quick hands as well. The moment that there was the slightest distraction, her hand would dart forward and another pen would vanish. 
Mr. Alcott would look at the desk in confusion and then withdraw another quill, quickly cutting a nib. This process continued until at least five pens had vanished. Seth had no clue as to what game was afoot, but he was inclined to follow Miss Alcott's lead. She had made some vague statements accompanied with significant looks, and he obligingly stayed out of her way. If she had some reason to delay proceedings, he was not about to object. Finally, everything was laid out in front of them, with Lady Veronica keeping hold of the quill so that it could not vanish again. Mr. Alcott unstoppered a bottle of ink and was prepared to begin signing when Miss Alcott laid a gentle hand on his arm. Wait, father, she murmured. Where are your spectacles? You know that you cannot read without them and you always say to never sign anything that you have not read. What does that matter? Lady Veronica demanded, clearly exasperated. It is the same contract that was agreed upon last week. No, no, Mr Alcott agreed, patting about his person for said spectacles. My daughter is quite right. Oh dear father, Miss Alcott tutted all concern. Have you lost your spectacles again? Oh goodness, she said hands behind her back. She turned slightly so that Seth could glimpse something shiny in her grip. Subtly he shifted closer to her passing his hand behind her back and lifting them from her hands. He bent low under the pretext of looking for the spectacles under the desk, instead dropping them at the edge. He straightened and with a cough, scooted them out of sight. When this was completed, Miss Alcott met Seth's eyes and nearly smiled. Well, fortunately for us all, I have brought a spare pair, Mr Alcott announced, fishing out a checked new pair from the inner pocket of his jacket. Seth and Miss Alcott exchanged glances, both of them looking a little despairing. Now, I shall sign, just here, Mr Alcott continued, doing as he said. If you would be so kind as to sign here, my lord, he instructed, pointing with one stubby finger at a line at the bottom of the contract. Mr Alcott passed the quill to Seth, who hesitated but accepted it. He glanced about the faces assembled around the desk. Mr. Alcott, who watched him closely, eagerly, his mother, Lady Veronica, who was clearly a bundle of nerves, and Miss Alcott, who sent him silent, pleading looks. He felt caught, cornered like a bear in a net. With a halting hand, he dipped the pen in the bottle of ink and tapped it on the side with a last look at Miss Alcott, and then tapped too hard, knocking it clean over. Immediately, Everyone around the table leapt into action, whisking the contract away before it could be ruined, dabbing with handkerchiefs to blot the puddle of ink. Miss Alcott made little sympathetic noises, giving him a small smile. Poor dear, she cooed, tilting her head. He's so eager his hands tremble. Seth nodded absently, which seemed to satisfy Mr Alcott. Lady Veronica, however, was not so easily fobbed off, and she turned shrewd eyes onto him. Resolutely, Seth ignored her, but he knew now that they would have to be very, very careful. Any other shenanigans would surely have her pouncing on them. Slowly, with fingers that trembled without pretext this time, Seth took up the quill again. There was nothing for it, no other way to delay the inevitable. Some distant part of his mind was already trying to reconcile what it would be like being married to someone that he did not particularly love. There are many types of marriages, he thought, a little frantic. Surely I might learn to be happy, even without Kitty. And yet, even as he thought it, he knew that to be a lie. He would not be happy without her, not ever, not for the briefest instance. But there was no stopping this. He knew what he had to do to save his family's legacy and security. Dipping the pen again, Seth took a deep breath, letting the nib hang over the line he was meant to sign on. He had just pressed the quill to the page when two things happened in quick succession. First, Miss Alcott let out a breathy sigh, pressed a hand to forehead and crumpled to the floor in a dead faint. Magdalena! Mr Alcott exclaimed, quickly kneeling by her side. What on earth has come over you? Oh, good Lord, 
Lady Veronica swore mildly. Can't you see what's happening here? They're clearly in... And that is precisely when the second thing happened, which was the unmistakable sound of the front door banging open abruptly. This was followed by a cacophony of yelling and scrambling feet, some sort of crashing noise, and something that sounded a bit like a scuffle. Lady Veronica and Mr Alcott both immediately turned to see what this new disturbance was, shifting toward the library door. They did not have to wait long to see what it was, for the door to the library burst inward with no less than three footmen trying to manhandle what appeared to be a scrawny soldier in an ill-fitting red coat. The soldier's tricorn hat was shoved down over his face, and he was swinging wildly, the footman ducking flying fists as they tried to wrangle him back out the door. This was somewhat curtailed, however, by their instinct to bow to Lady Veronica and Cumber, as well as the sheer determination of the little lad. What is the meaning of all this? Lady Veronica cried, her voice rising in both tone and volume. Apologies, your ladyship, one of the footmen grunted, but this fellow demanded an audience with you straight away and then pushed his way in. Huff. He was cut off by an errant elbow from the soldier directly into his stomach, all the breath whooshing out of him. Seth, captivated and a little amused by the spectacle, casually waded into the fray, plucked up the determined little fellow by the arms and set him down a few steps away. Still holding onto one of the soldier's arms, he lifted the hat away from their face, revealing a pert little nose and bright green eyes that he would have known anywhere. Kitty, he breathed, certain that he must be dreaming. His eyes roved wildly over her, from her hair breaking free of the pins mooring it down to the two large boots on her feet. Miss Johnson? Lady Veronica gasped somewhere between outrage and d disbelief. What on earth are you doing here? Miss Alcott, somewhat forgotten on the floor in her swoon, suddenly sat bolt upright, nearly catching her father by the forehead as she did so. Miss Johnson, you say? Oh, thank God, she muttered, pushing herself to her feet and dusting off her dress as if it were the most natural thing in the world. I wasn't sure how much longer I could keep that up. Keep what up? Who is... Someone had better tell me what is happening this very instant, Lady Veronica demanded, her face florid. Kitty, blushing fiercely but determined, wrangled a small leather satchel from over her shoulder. Please, Lady Veronica, Lord Cluet, everything is here, it will all be explained. You've been deceived, all of you. Without further preamble, she stepped forward and, without a care for the contract on the desk, dumped out the contents of the satchel. What is all this? Lady Veronica demanded. Seth put a calming arm on his mother's arm, angling himself a little between her and Kitty. Hear her out, mother, he said firmly. Surely you owe her that much. It is proof that you were about to be greatly swindled, with me paying the price for it and your son as well, Kitty announced, her eyes narrowing on Mr Alcott. Seth, meanwhile, leaned over the desk, his hands gingerly moving the papers aside, his eyes quickly scanning them. In short, Lady Veronica, Miss Alcott continued, picking up the thread, my father and Sir Wright have conspired to do a very, very bad thing. Magdalena, what have you done? Mr Alcott demanded his face reddening all the way down to his neck. I've told the truth, father, Miss Alcott responded simply, and I shall tell you another truth. I'll not be marrying Lord Cluett. What? But who? I say, Miss Johnson, are you wearing breeches? Lady Veronica demanded. It was clear that she could not take in everything else that was happening, and had instead focused on the one thing that was the most obvious. Seth, without shame, but with quite a bit of delight, let his eyes rove over Kitty again. Slowly, a laugh began to rumble in his wide chest, which built into full-on laughter. It was not at Kitty's expense, though she was the cause of it. It was pure joy and gratitude for her. Without a care for who saw or was there, Seth darted forward and swept Kitty up, who squeaked, 
but wrapped her own arms around Seth's neck. You marvellous, splendid girl! He breathed into the wild black curls on her head. It was all for you, she whispered back, clinging to him tightly, as her feet were quite some way off the floor. All of it. Always for you. He did not need to ask what she meant. He knew already, much as he knew that he would never be able to find a more solid proof of love in his life. She had sacrificed and was willing to sacrifice more of herself than he could ever know, simply for him. Such was their happiness in each other that they did not notice the quiet, efficient way that Miss Alcott herded everyone else from the library, leaving Seth and Kitty as they had always longed to be, together. Epilogue It was a little startling how easily Kitty had gotten used to married life. She found that she and Seth, having been such good friends, were naturally good and amiable companions as well. For all the strife of their unusual courtship, their marriage was as quiet and devoted as though they had been naturally made for one another. Of course, this is what the Tun thought, for it was all that they saw. What they did not see, what Kitty would never let them know, was that behind closed doors it was full of passion and laughter. Her delight in her husband matched only by his delight in her. The only real qualm that either of them really had was a vague sort of restlessness that took root in Seth. Kitty could feel it in the way that his eyes would go distant and soft as he looked out of a window. She could see it in the way that he would rise sometimes before dawn, pacing quietly but steadily through the house. If she were being honest, she, too, had a peculiar sort of itching in her bones that would not give her rest. It was well and fine to be a lady of society again, with a closet full of beautiful dresses. But it was somehow not enough. Seth, she asked him one night as they lay in bed together, her head pillowed on his chest. She felt, rather than heard him respond, a sleepy, affirmative rumble. If I asked you for something, you would give it to me? Of course, he murmured, pulling her a little tighter against himself. I should like it very much if we might go and visit the Americas together. I'm not sure that either of us are content here anymore. Kitty said hesitantly, thinking the words as she spoke them. In the dark room, Seth sat up, letting Kitty slip from her spot curled up against him. She pouted a little at the loss of his warmth, which he naturally could not see. He leaned over, rummaging about in the nightstand for something. Naturally curious... Kitty attempted to peer around him, which he playfully thwarted. He returned at last, holding a small box in his large hands. When I was alone there, it was you that guided me back. You were the star that brought me home. Slowly he opened the box, revealing a silver pendant in the shape of a many-pointed star. In the centre, a diamond winked and sparkled in the cool moonlight that filtered in through the window. Wanted to ask you to go with me myself, he added, a little sheepishly. Shouldn't be surprised you got there before me again. You've saved me so many times already. Kitty, a naturally happy creature, was so overcome with pure delight in her husband, her life, and, yes, it must be said with beautiful, sparkling things, that she found the only acceptable response was to throw herself at her husband. She covered his face with a thousand kisses leaving them both breathless with laughter and love. Kitty and Seth managed to overcome each and every obstacle standing in their way and let their love triumph. But just at that very moment, another love story, full of intrigue, secrets and scandals, is about to bloom. Can you guess who is the next to fall in love? Beatrice is available on our website. Read... Or listen it now. Bonus scene. It was a decided struggle for Seth, Viscount Cluet, to keep a bemused grin from his face as he watched his new bride, Kitty, now Viscountess Cluet, pack her large trunk. A maid assisted her, holding up dresses for inspection, which Kitty would then look at with pursed lips. 
They were bound for North America within two days' time, but Kitty was still struggling to decide on what to bring with her. She was clad in her jumps, chemise and petticoat so that she might try on clothing as needed, so the scenery was quite to Seth's taste. Catching Seth looking at her with indulgent affection, Kitty arched an eyebrow at him. Don't mistake me, I'm under no illusions as to our destination, she said nodding in approval at a pink silk evening gown. I know that we are going to live in some backwater wilderness. No, it is precisely what I want. Do not look at me so. But I should still like to be the most stylish one there. Seth absorbed all of that for a minute, sitting back in the Lewis-style chair pressed against one wall of Kitty's dressing room. He was there ostensibly to offer his opinion when it was solicited, which so far meant only nodding in agreement with Kitty. We'll be taking a house in Halifax, not living in a cabin in the forest, Seth reminded her gently. And you'll be the light of society anywhere you go, even dressed in a flower sack. Kitty gave him a saucy look, as if she were accepting a challenge of some sort. Carelessly, she laid aside the day dress she had been contemplating, her eyes fixed on Seth. With a grin curling the corners of her mouth, she stalked across the dressing room on bare feet. Without hesitation, she curled up on Seth's lap, and his large arms went around her automatically. I am very much looking forward to taking up residence, in a home that is ours, Kitty sighed, laying her head on his shoulder. That is, I know that technically this is our house, but... She trailed off, the weight of unsaid words anchoring the silence. Seth knew precisely what she meant. His mother, Lady Veronica, now the Dowager Viscountess, had not objected to his marrying Kitty. But there was a sort of tension between the three of them that he doubted would ever be fully resolved. At best, it could be said that a sort of parity had prevailed in the Cluet house, but there were simply too many vying for the proverbial crown to be a peaceful environment. Despite her abundant enthusiasm for this transition in their lives, Seth was still under no illusions that it would be a huge shift for Kitty. She had changed much over the past year and a half, but he knew her well enough to know that there were some London amusements that she would miss. Hence, they were to have an evening at the theatre, their last for some time. Reminding Kitty of this fact was the original reason that Seth had sought her out in her dressing room before he had been recruited to provide a second opinion on sartorial choices. You may want to select a gown for this evening, wife, he reminded her gently. Seth could feel her grumble beneath the hand he had pressed to her back. Are you sure you don't want to stay in? she asked, burrowing her face against his neck. I would not wish to deny you a last night out on London, Seth chuckled, pressing a kiss to her dark curls. I am fond of the theatre, Kitty agreed, wrapping her arms about her husband's neck and planting a kiss against his handsome cheek. I am not fond of this theatre, Kitty grumbled, feeling a little petulant. As a general rule, she did her very best to never pull a sour face in public. However, it was hard not to as their carriage pulled up in front of the Lyceum. It had fallen to Seth to gently shepherd her through the doors, across the foyer, and to their box seats. It wasn't so much that Kitty objected to the Lyceum in and of itself, but rather the performers therein. Or, to be more specific, one particular performer. The principal dancer these days was one Beatrice Hart, long of limb and daringly short of hair. There was a coolness about her at all times, as if she were a cat sunning herself, waiting to swipe at passers-by with her sharp little claws. I really am sorry, Seth said, all contrition, as he helped Kitty to arrange the little stool for her feet. It was the only showing I could get tickets for at such short notice. Kitty sighed, resignedly settling back into her seat. There were other acts to see, and she was determined to enjoy them at least. The great and good of London were out in force too, and their diamonds and silks twinkled and shone in the soft glow from the stage lights. For Kitty, this was every bit as enjoyable as whatever performer was strutting across the stage. In fact, she had nearly forgotten herself by the time that Beatrice took to the stage. Kitty was not entirely sure it was even her at first, 
for she wore a red wig piled high atop her head in the style of the last century. There was no mistaking the way that she glided and prowled across the stage, however. Kitty would have known that anywhere. It was a short performance, but the truncated time did not detract from its power. It told the story of a nymph who fell in love with a shepherd boy and was broken-hearted when he died. Beatrice's sadness shone through in a particular kind of heaviness in her limbs. By the end, even Kitty was moved to pity, and she could not help but wonder how much of this was acting. When the performance was done, there was a beat of silence as the audience simply absorbed what they had seen. When the spell was broken, a wave of applause swept through the theatre like a tide. Kitty joined in enthusiastically, forgetting that she had been intent on holding a grudge, just a little one, against Beatrice for all time. Does this mean that you have forgiven Miss Hart then? Seth leaned in and murmured to Kitty over the applause, his lips brushing her ear. Certainly not, Kitty replied, lifting her chin proudly. One does not simply forgive the interfering baggage that nearly ruined the happiness of a dearest, most loved friend. Ava seems to have mostly forgiven her, Seth commented blithely. Kitty paused, considering, her hands slowing in their clapping. Well, I suppose when one is so happily married to the man of their dreams that it is easier to be magnanimous in a happy ending. She punctuated this statement by turning a radiant smile on her husband, which made the Viscount laugh, which never failed to make Kitty laugh. The audience was beginning to settle, and Beatrice took one last bow with a flash of her graceful arm. Kitty tilted her head thoughtful. I wonder if Beatrice will ever get her own happy ending. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.